Before the Avengers, before the dawn of superheroes, and before even creation itself, there were the Celestials. The Prime Celestial Arishem created the first sun and brought light into the universe. And as it exploded in a big bang, six singularities were concentrated into what became known as the Infinity Stones, incredible sources of power, each representing an element of the universe. Space, mind, reality, power, soul, and time. To populate this new universe, Arishem follows a process called emergence. He plants seeds in host planets across the universe. The seeds grow, and the planets burst open with the birth of new celestials, who themselves go on to create new suns and galaxies. But the universe is a constant exchange of energy, and the creation of a celestial comes at great cost. For the seeds to grow, they require energy, which comes from intelligent life. And to ensure intelligent life flourishes, Arshem created the Deviants to protect that life from predators. Over time, however, the Deviants evolved and began to attack the intelligent life they were meant to protect. So Arishem learned from his mistakes and created new protectors. This time they were not organic creatures capable of evolution, but instead synthetic ones created in the World Forge, nearly immortal, sentient beings known as Eternals. They were built for the singular task of protecting intelligent life from deviance. But few know the truth, that they protect life just so it can one day be destroyed along with their planet in the emergence of a new celestial. After each mission, the Eternals have their memories wiped, so they approach each planet as though it's their first, blissfully unaware they are shepherding it to its own destruction. As Arishem puts it, an infinite cycle of creation and destruction. One day, a seed for the celestial Tiamat will be placed inside Earth, and if left unfettered, will destroy it, along with humanity itself. Among the Celestials, there was one who was different from the rest, Ego. Unlike the others, he was not born inside a planet, at least not that he remembers. To his knowledge, he just one day existed. He learned to manipulate matter and created a planet around himself. He also made himself a human avatar to travel the universe and seek purpose. He met many species on many planets, but found them all disappointing. Finally, he realized his purpose, expansion, as in expanding himself by planting seeds in planets across the universe, seeds which will one day grow into more of him, eradicating all life and replacing it with more ego. Billions of years later, around 2 or 3 million BC, a meteorite made of nearly indestructible vibranium struck the continent of Africa and affected the plant life. When the time of men came, five tribes settled the area and called it Wakanda. They were in constant war with each other until a warrior shaman was guided by the panther goddess Bast to consume the heart-shaped herb, part of that affected plant life. It gave him superhuman strength, speed, and instincts, making him king and the first Black Panther. Four of the tribes agreed to live under his rule while the Jabari decided to remain independent. Using vibranium, Wakanda will develop technologies far more advanced than any other nation, and when the world is engulfed in wars, Wakanda will choose to remain hidden, keeping their knowledge and resources to themselves. In 5000 BC, Arishem sends a group of Eternals to Earth, just in time to stop a deviant attack in Mesopotamia. Their leader, Ajak, is the only one of them who knows the truth of their mission, that they are there to ensure Tiamat's emergence. The rest focus only on protecting and helping humanity thrive. Elsewhere in the universe, Asgard thrives too. In addition to its place in our solar system, Earth is one of nine planets, or realms, linked across the universe on branches of Yggdrasil, the world's tree. Asgard is the most powerful of the nine, and home to beings who became known as the gods of Norse mythology. In 2988 BC, they face a dangerous enemy, 
the Dark Elves. These elves are said to have dwelled in the darkness before the universe began. Now, they seek to restore that darkness by eradicating the Nine Realms. And they can do it by using the Reality Stone. Somehow, the elves obtained it and converted the Infinity Stone into something called Aether. Then, they waited until the Convergence, a phenomenon where the Nine Realms come into alignment once every 5,000 years. By firing the Aether at the point of Convergence, the power will pierce through every realm, amplifying with each, and finally, destroying them all. But the Asgardians are formidable, and King Bor leads them to victory, then hides the Aether on a distant world to ensure it is never weaponized again. Elsewhere, in another dimension, there is a realm called Talo, with vast cities rich with culture and history. But their peace and prosperity is appended by the Dweller in Darkness. He attacks with his army and eats every soul in his path, growing stronger with each. The army heads for the gate which leads to Earth, so Talo's strongest warriors fight to keep them from escaping the dimension. But they aren't strong enough until the Great Protector joins the fight. With her power, they push the Dweller and his army back, then lock them behind the Dark Gate. The survivors settle into a small village by the gate, where they dedicate themselves to guarding it, using magic granted to them by the Great Protector. In 659 BC, in Asgard, King Bor's son Odin has inherited the throne. And Odin is a ruthless king. He has a child named Hela, the goddess of death, and with her as his executioner, they conquer the Nine Realms. Until one day, Odin realizes that their violent ways are wrong. Instead, he chooses to become a benevolent, peaceful king. But Hela's thirst for blood remains, and she refuses to stop their conquest, forcing Odin to imprison her in Hell. In 575 BC, the Eternals protect Babylon from deviants and decide to settle there for a while. But protecting and living among humans has had an effect on Ajak. She sees something special in them and even suggests they be allowed to live. Arishem won't hear it. Humanity must be sacrificed for the emergence so billions of new lives can be created elsewhere in the universe. Druig has also become attached to people, though he detests their proclivity for violence, and often uses mind control to enforce peace. But he is warned against this. The Eternals are only there to stop deviants, and they are forbidden from involving themselves in any other conflicts, tempting as it may be. Icarus has also been changed by their experiences on Earth, discovering a love not for humanity, but for another Eternal. Circe. He's harbored these feelings for some time, but he's always had faith in Arishem, and that was enough. Ajak, however, tells him that it's okay. He can perform his duties and still live a life. So he confesses his feelings, and Circe feels the same way. In 400 AD, they get married, though Icarus hides from her an awful truth. After leaving Babylon, Ajak confided in him the true purpose of their mission, but he knows Circe, who shares Ajak's love for humanity, could never accept that truth. So he keeps it to himself. Near the turn of the millennium, Odin has a son named Thor. He calls the boy his firstborn and does his best to ensure that Hela, the goddess of death, and his true firstborn is erased from history, even hiding her existence from his son for now. Soon after, Earth, or Midgard as it is known in the Nine Realms, is attacked by frost giants from the realm of Judenheim. But Odin and his army come to the rescue, defeating the frost giants. And he returns to Asgard with two new additions. First, the Casket of Ancient Winters, the source of the frost giants' power. And second, a baby boy. King Laufey of Judenheim had a son, but abandoned him after the battle. Rather than watch the child die, Odin brought him back to Asgard, named him Loki, and raised him as his own. Over the years, Loki will grow jealous of his older brother Thor, jealous of the adulation he receives from Odin, and jealous that Thor is destined to inherit his father's throne. 
As one war ends, another begins. In another part of the universe, there is a species of blue, humanoid creatures named Kree. Their culture is militaristic, and they rule a fascist empire from their home planet of Hala. But one race resists their rule, the Skrulls, humanoid reptilians with shape-shifting abilities, and their resistance plants the seeds for a war that will last centuries. Meanwhile, in China, Shu Wenwu discovers the Ten Rings, an ancient artifact of unknown origins. While wearing them, he is granted immortality and immense power, which he uses to become a conqueror, leading an army he calls the Ten Rings. 400 years later, Odin brings an important artifact to Earth, the Tesseract, a cube-shaped vessel containing the Space Stone, one of the six Infinity Stones. Somehow it came into Odin's possession, and for reasons unknown, he brought it to Earth, where it is hidden at a church in Norway. In 1521, the Eternals complete their mission, killing what they believe is the last of the Deviants. But Druig especially feels anything but victorious. Perhaps they protected humankind from one monster, but they have failed to protect humankind from itself. War rages, and with the blink of an eye, Druig could just control them all. He could just make them stop. But it's not allowed. Meanwhile, Fina suffers panic attacks, causing her to lash out violently. The only cure is to wipe her memories clean. But Fina does not want to lose herself, and neither does Gilgamesh. He promises to take responsibility for her. He will stay with her, and if the worst happens, if she becomes too violent to contain, he will kill her himself. The Eternals will later learn the true reason for her affliction. Memories of their past missions are creeping into her mind. Memories of death and destruction at the altar of emergence. Despite these difficult circumstances, Ajak announces that with their mission complete, they are free to go. Free to discover their own purpose in the world and live their own lives. In 1571, as Spanish colonizers invade Mayan civilization, smallpox spreads among the indigenous people. However, one village is saved when a shaman has a vision. It leads him to an underwater plant growing from vibranium. Apparently, the meteorite which formed Wakanda was not the only one. And like the heart-shaped herb, this plant also has strange effects on those who ingest it. The village people are cured, but the plant turns them blue and alters their breathing so they can only survive underwater. So that's where they go, forming the underwater city of Talacan. One woman, Fen, was pregnant at the time she ingested the plant, and her son is born a mutant. Unlike the others in the tribe, his skin is not blue, and he retains the ability to breathe above water. In addition, his aging process is slowed tremendously and wings on his ankles allow him to fly. One day, when his mother passes, the boy takes her body above water to their hometown, where she hoped to be buried. There, he finds his people enslaved by colonizers. He kills them all, and one man, with his dying breaths, calls the boy Nino Sin Amor, or the boy without love, and the mutant twists the phrase to adopt a new name. Instead of Nino Sin Amor, he becomes simply Namor. From then on, he leads his people and helps them remain hidden from evils of the outside world. And should their secret ever be at risk, he will respond without mercy. In 1933, Hitler rises to power. In 1935, he sends Johann Schmidt, the head of the Nazi's research division Hydra, to kidnap Dr. Abraham Erskine who has been working to develop a serum to enhance a person's abilities, a super soldier serum. Ostensibly, this is to support the Nazi regime, but Schmidt has his own interest in the serum. He's heard legends of an artifact left behind by the gods which only a superior man can obtain. That artifact is the Tesseract, and the god who left it is Odin. In 1940, hoping to become that superior man of legend, Schmidt forces Erskine to use the drug on him. It does enhance his abilities, but also disfigures him. His hideous appearance earns him the moniker Red Skull. A couple of days later, Erskine is rescued by Peggy Carter, 
an MI5 agent recruited to America's Strategic Scientific Reserve, or SSR, their answer to HYDRA. They quickly enlist Erskine's help, along with their other recent recruit, Howard Stark. After impressing the world with the technology he developed through his own Stark Industries, Howard was recruited by the SSR's head, Chester Phillips. In March 1942, Schmidt finds the Tesseract at that church in Norway. Over the next year, he and his lead scientist, Dr. Arnim Zola, will run tests on the mysterious artifact and use it to develop powerful weapons. That same year, two beings from another dimension, Aisha and Najma, search for a way home. They are from the Nor dimension, but were exiled here along with three others. And in the Temple of the Ten Rings in British-occupied India, they find a magic bangle which may offer the power they need. But they're forced to separate when British soldiers attack the temple. Aisha leaves with the bangle, promising Najma they will soon reunite. Meanwhile, as Red Skull works on weaponizing the space stone containing Tesseract, the SSR is hard at work on Project Rebirth, an initiative to harness Erskine's super soldier serum for good. All they need is the right person to take it. And one day, Erskine finds him. At the first Stark Expo in 1943, he meets Steve Rogers, a young man unfit to serve due to his physical stature and plethora of health issues. But he has tremendous spirit. He's been rejected many times over, but every time he spots a recruitment tent, Rogers attempts to enlist again. It's his duty to fight for his country, and no matter how many people tell him no, he will not give up. Erskine recruits Rogers to Project Rebirth, where he is one of many candidates for the serum. Most eclipse Rogers in brawn, but he more than makes up for it in his problem-solving skills, bravery, and most importantly, heart. Erskine tells Rogers more about the serum. It amplifies what is inside a man, hence Schmidt's transformation into Red Skull. But in Steve, he sees compassion. On his way to the procedure, Steve and Peggy Carter get to know each other and relate over the many doors shut to them, Steve for his stature and Peggy for being a woman in the 40s. It also quickly becomes obvious Steve doesn't have much experience with women, not even dancing. Peggy asks what he's waiting for, and he answers, the right partner. Soon it's time for the procedure, and it works. He enters the chamber his scrawny self and comes out looking like a superhero, a superhero who soon takes on the name Captain America. But after the experiment, a Hydra spy steals the rest of the serum and kills Erskine. As he dies in Steve's arms, the doctor has no ability to speak, so he only taps Steve's chest, reminding him why he was chosen and what he must never lose. The new and improved Rogers chases down the spy and catches him, but not before he destroys the serum and chews a cyanide pill. With Erskine dead and the serum gone, Philip's hope for an army of super soldiers is gone, and all he's left with is one man, one untrained man. So, rather than send Steve into battle, Phillips turns Captain America into a figurehead to sell war bonds. Until Rogers hears the news, much of the 107th Infantry was captured by Hydra, including his best friend James Barnes, or Bucky. They're 30 miles behind enemy lines, too dangerous for Phillips to risk a rescue mission. Steve finally learns that sometimes doing the right thing and following orders aren't the same thing. He heads into enemy territory alone and comes back with the 107th Infantry Regiment. Though, while in captivity, Bucky was given a variant of the Super Soldier Serum as part of Hydra experiments. Returning home a hero, Steve Rogers grows closer with Peggy, though his time with her is limited because he has a mission. Rogers forms a small group dubbed the Howling Commandos, intent on taking down Hydra. Over the next year, Captain America, armed with a vibranium shield courtesy of Howard Stark, leads his Howling Commandos, taking down one Hydra base after another. But on one mission, Rogers loses his best friend Bucky, who falls from a train by the Danube River. 
but at least they managed to capture Dr. Zola and by interrogating him, learn the location of Hydra's main base. Captain America and the Howling Commandos arrive just in time to foil Red Skull's plot to drop massive bombs across the US. Only problem? In order to stop it, Rogers is forced to sacrifice himself by crashing Red Skull's plane into the ocean. On his way down, he and Peggy share some last words, setting a date for that dance. Rogers will miss that date. He survives the crash, but ends up frozen underwater, leaving the world to think he's dead. As for Red Skull, he learns not to meddle with powers beyond his control. The Space Stone inside the Tesseract casts him out to a barren planet called Vormir. There, he is made the guardian of the Soul Stone, awaiting the arrival of any who seek it. The Space Stone, meanwhile, falls to the ocean floor inside the Tesseract. In the aftermath, Howard Stark searches for Rogers, but only manages to find the Tesseract. Meanwhile, Bucky is found, but not by the good guys. Thanks to the super soldier serum, he survived his fall at the Danube River. He's discovered by the Soviets, and soon, Dr. Arnim Zola tracks him down. How did the good doctor escape US custody? He didn't. He was recruited as part of Operation Paperclip, an initiative to recruit German scientists, engineers, and technicians after the fall of the Nazi regime. He and the Soviets give Bucky a metal arm to replace one he lost in the fall, they wipe his memory, and they brainwash him, turning him into one of their winter soldiers, assassins who are kept frozen between missions and only activated when they need someone dead. By 1947, Aisha, still exiled from the Nord dimension, has taken refuge on lands owned by a man named Hassan. In the last five years, They've fallen in love and had a daughter named Sana. So when Najma finds her in the hopes of returning to the Nord dimension, Aisha is not interested. She'd rather stay in this world with her new family. In August, during the partition of India, she gives her daughter the bangle and tries to flee with her family to Pakistan. But Najma catches up with them. So Aisha leaves her husband and daughter to face Najma alone and Najma stabs her, fatally wounding her for her betrayal. As she slowly bleeds to death, Aisha notices that Sana has gotten separated from her father. Too weak to help herself, Aisha calls on the powers of Noor for help, and help arrives, in the form of her great-granddaughter from the future, Kamala Khan. She gives Kamala a photo of her family and begs her to save Sana. Kamala acts quickly, using the bangle to summon a trail of stars, which leads Sana back to her father on the train. Then, Kamala returns to her time, 2025. In the aftermath of World War II, the Strategic Scientific Reserve evolves into S.H.I.E.L.D., but behind the curtains, Dr. Arnim Zola rebuilds Hydra like a parasite within the organization, a process helped along by his secret assassin, the Winter Soldier. Meanwhile, the US military tries to recreate the success they had with Steve Rogers. With the scientist who invented the serum, Dr. Erskine, dead, they're desperate, so they experiment with reckless abandon. Black soldiers are administered experimental serums without their knowledge. All die except one, Isaiah Bradley. But to cover up the unethical experiments, Bradley is imprisoned and his wife Faith is told that he's dead. While in captivity, Bradley is continually experimented on and his letters to Faith go undelivered. He will never see her again and she will die believing him dead. In the mid-60s, Howard Stark has a major breakthrough thanks to his studies of the Tesseract. The artifact somehow produces massive amounts of energy. By researching it, with help from Russian scientist Anton Vanko, they develop the first arc reactor, a safe alternative to nuclear for large amounts of clean energy. However, while Stark sees it as a way to help the world, Vanko sees it only as a way to profit. In 1967, Stark catches him selling their secrets to Russia and gets him deported. Vanko returns to the Soviet Union, but without Stark's help, he can't recreate the technology. So the Soviets exile him to Siberia, where he has a son named Ivan. Over the years, he will pour his knowledge into Ivan, but also 
his resentment and hatred for Howard Stark, something which will eventually extend to Howard's son, Tony, who will be born in May of 1970. Stark is not the only one to achieve a major scientific breakthrough in the 60s. There is also scientist Hank Pym. He discovers the Pym particle, a formula to change the distance between atoms, to shrink things. He uses the technology to create the Ant-Man suit, which allows one to shrink while retaining their strength. He also develops the EMP communication device, allowing him to telepathically control ants. Using the technology, he becomes a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent known as Ant-Man. In 1972, Dr. Zola is diagnosed with terminal illness. His body cannot be saved, but his mind can. He uploads it to an array of servers at Camp Lehigh, New Jersey, to live on as artificial intelligence. In 1978, the Celestial Ego uses his human avatar to visit Earth. The purpose of the visit is to plant his seed, but he also happens to fall in love with Meredith Quill. Over the next two years, he will visit three more times to see her, but on that third visit, he has a disturbing realization. He's become distracted, so he removes the distraction. He plants a malignant tumor in her brain, a terminal cancer, giving her an eight-year expiration date. Ego leaves the planet, and in 1980, Meredith gives birth to their son Peter, a son she will playfully call her little Star-Lord. Though Meredith may have been Ego's first true love, in first time mating with a human, there were hundreds of other females before her, from all manner of species. Facing his quest to overwrite all life in the universe with himself, Ego realized it's a big task for one celestial, so he sought to sire another, by mating with humanoid females across the universe. He hired Yondu, a member of the space pirate syndicate known as Ravagers, to abduct those children and bring them to him. But each was a disappointment. All were mortal, and none carried the celestial gene. So, Ego killed them all, slowly amassing a tomb beneath the surface of his planet. In 1987, Dr. Hank Pym is still working for S.H.I.E.L.D. as the Ant-Man. He is now joined by his wife, Janet Van Dyne, who uses her own wasp suit. And when a Soviet missile is launched at the United States, they are sent to stop it but they're unable to cut through its solid titanium shell, meaning the only way in is to shrink between the molecules, a dangerous prospect. Going subatomic means entering the quantum realm, a place where time and space are irrelevant, a place where you shrink for eternity with no return. But Hank knows what must be done, but unfortunately his suit is damaged and he can't make the trip, so Janet doesn't hesitate. She shuts off her regulator and goes subatomic. The bomb is stopped, but Hank returns home from the mission alone, where he has to tell his daughter Hope that her mother is gone, though he covers up the truth, telling her that she died in a plane crash. In 1988, Peter Quill's time comes. He has grown into a child of the 80s and inherited his mother's taste in music. In fact, she put some of her favorite songs on a mixtape for him called Awesome Mix Volume 1, which he plays through a Walkman she also gave him. They are a small comfort as he sits in the hospital with his mother in the other room, on her deathbed. As Ego's tumor does its work, Meredith gives her son a wrapped present before dying. And as with all his previous children, Ego sends Yondu to kidnap Peter. But this time is different. Yondu has learned the truth that Ego is killing every child who disappoints him. So this time, instead of leading the boy to slaughter, Yandu keeps him and raises him as his own. In 1989, Dr. Hank Pym's time with S.H.I.E.L.D. comes to an end, when he discovers that they, led by Howard Stark, have been trying to recreate the Pym particle, something he locked away after losing his wife, because he knew it was too dangerous. So he resigns, and locks away his research again. That same year, a hero is born. Carol Danvers and Maria Rambo are close friends in the U.S. Air Force. Despite their unequivocal skill, 
being female has disqualified them from flying in combat, but they found a way to do something that mattered anyway, piloting test flights for Dr. Wendy Lawson in the lightspeed engine she's developing. One day, during a test flight, Lawson provides Danvers with coordinates to her laboratory, but before they arrive, their plane is shot down by Cree. Realizing her time is limited, the badly wounded Lawson reveals her identity. She is not human. Her real name is Marvell, and she is also Cree. Although it's been a thousand years, her species still fights the Skrulls. But recently she learned the truth. She's been fighting for the bad guys. The Cree have brought Skrulls to the brink of extinction just for refusing the Cree's rule. So she defected, hoping to build a lightspeed engine that could bring the few remaining Skrulls to a new home, far from the Cree's reach. To do it, she would need the power of the Space Stone, contained inside the Tesseract, located on Earth. So she came here disguised as Dr. Lawson and harnessed the power of the Tesseract to create her engine. Unfortunately, the Kree have now found her. After divulging the truth, Marvell begs Danvers to remember the coordinates for her lab, then tries to shoot the engine before the Kree get their hands on it. But Commander Yonrog shoots her first, so Danvers finishes the job for her. She shoots the engine, releasing a burst of space stone energy which is absorbed into her genetic code. This gives her tremendous power, which one day will allow her to become Captain Marvel. For now, it knocks her unconscious. Yonrog takes advantage of the opportunity by bringing her back to Hala. They install an implant to inhibit her powers and her memory. Then they lie, telling her that she is not human, but that she is Kree, and that the implant is what gives her power. For the next six years, she will believe it, and she will continue to fight the unjust war Marvell tried so hard to stop. On December 16, 1991, Tony Stark disappoints his father again. Although his accomplishments are many, including graduating MIT at 17, Tony has done little since, and Howard knows he has great potential. The truth is that Howard loves his son, but he has a hard time showing it, and today is no different. When his parents leave, Tony doesn't say goodbye, and he'll never get the chance, because that night, they are killed by the Winter Soldier. It seems that in recent years, Howard managed to recreate the Super Soldier Serum. Hydra learned of this, so they ordered their assassin to acquire it and leave no witnesses. After Howard's death, his business partner, Obadiah Stane, will take over as interim CEO, but only briefly, because after a few months, the 21-year-old Tony Stark will inherit his father's legacy, and he will usher in a new era for Stark Industries, creating smarter, more powerful weapons, the likes of which the world has never seen. Meanwhile, there is trouble in Wakanda, T'Chaka is the current king and Black Panther. In keeping with long-held custom, he keeps Wakanda hidden from the world, along with their knowledge and vibranium. But that does not sit well with his brother, Njobu. As a member of the War Dogs, Wakanda's intelligence service, Njobu is one of the few people who have spent time in the outside world, and what he's seen has left him disappointed. People just like them, oppressed and struggling, while Wakanda sits comfortably behind invisible force fields. He called for global uprising, fueled by Wakandan vibranium, but of course T'Chaka upheld Wakanda's isolationist policies and refused. So Njobu took matters into his own hands. He recruited arms dealer Ulysses Claw to infiltrate Wakanda and steal vibranium. The attack was messy and many Wakandans were killed. In 1992, Njobu Jobu's role in the attack is discovered when he's betrayed by his friend James, who reveals that he too is Wakandan. His real name is Zuri, and just like Njobu, he's a war dog. After Zuri reports what he's seen, T'Chaka comes from Wakanda to arrest his brother, but Njobu refuses to go quietly. He pulls a gun on Zuri, forcing T'Chaka to strike him down. Having killed his own brother, King T'Chaka covers up the truth by lying, telling Wakanda that Njobu disappeared, and he abandons Njobu's son in America, a boy named Eric. 
Finding his father dead with panther claws in his chest, Eric knows it was T'Chaka who killed him. The boy inherits his father's dream of global uprising and decides that he will train himself to become a killing machine. So one day, he can visit his father's homeland of Wakanda and claim his revenge. In 1995, Carol Danvers returns to Earth. Though not intentionally, she still believes herself Kree and still looks up to Marvel's killer Yanrog as a mentor. But meanwhile, the Skrulls, led by General Talus, have been searching for Marvel's energy core so they can finish the work she started and reach their new home. Their search brings them to Danvers. They capture her and search her mind for coordinates or any clue for the energy core's whereabouts. They find memories of Earth, so that's where they go. But she wakes up. Thinking the scrolls her enemy, she fights them off, escapes, and crash lands in a blockbuster, which catches the attention of S.H.I.E.L.D. Nick Fury works with her to discover her past, and they find an old friend. Maria Rambo. Seeing Maria and her daughter Monica, who always looked up to her, helps unlock hidden memories. She remembers the truth. So when Talos arrives, Danvers is ready to listen. He tells her about their search for the core and how Marvell was trying to help them. She believes him and agrees to help. Danvers recalls the coordinates Lawson gave her and realizes it points to a laboratory in orbit around Earth. Though before they set off, Monica picks out some new colors for her to replace the Kree look she now denounces. In the floating lab, they find the energy core, the Tesseract, and they find scroll refugees Marvell was keeping safe. Talos's family is among them. The happy reunion is cut short when Yanrog arrives with a squad of Kree. They take the Tesseract and subdue Danvers, until she realizes that the implant on her neck has been inhibiting her powers. Her entire life she's been held back and knocked down, but every time she's gotten back up. This time is no different. She destroys the implant, and with her full powers unleashed, the Kree are no match. Danvers sends Yanrog home with a message. She's coming to end their war and their lies. In the aftermath, Fury's left eye is scratched by Marvel's pet Flurkin, leaving a wound that will never fully heal, and Danvers leaves Earth to help the Skrulls find their new home, though she leaves Fury with a pager to reach her in case of emergency, and leaves the Tesseract in his care. Back in his office, Fury speaks with Agent Coulson about how this experience has opened his eyes, well, his eye, to the level of potential threats which are out there, threats on an intergalactic scale. S.H.I.E.L.D. is not enough to protect them. So he gets to work, drafting something he calls the Protector Initiative, to create a team of humankind's most abled individuals. Though, going through Carol Danvers' file, he notices her old call sign, Avenger, and he likes the sound of it. Thus, the Avengers Initiative is born. That same year, a family is destroyed. The 10-year-old Natasha Romanoff has not had an easy life. As an infant, she was deemed to have strong genes, so she was bought from her father by General Drakov to be trained in the Red Room, a brutal Soviet-Russian program which turns young girls into expert assassins called Black Widows, and a healthy dose of brainwashing ensures loyalty. Her mother was not okay with this. She relentlessly searched and fought to bring Natasha home, but her efforts only put her in Drakov's crosshairs and got her killed. For the last three years, Natasha has been posing as a daughter and sister. The Red Room had assigned Melina Vostokov and Alexei Shostakov on an underground mission to infiltrate a S.H.I.E.L.D. location in Ohio to steal brain research. This would take time, so they were ordered to pose as a married couple and given two daughters to maintain the ruse. Natasha Romanoff, and another girl named Yelena Belova. Alexei has found the mission painfully boring, considering his background. In the Cold War, he was administered a super soldier serum created by the Soviets, turning him into the Red Guardian, their answer to Captain America. He enjoyed the role, and would much prefer to don that costume in battle over the suit and tie he's been forced to wear, posing as a S.H.I.E.L.D. employee, 
biding his time. Finally, in 1995, he obtains the brain research and their family is dissolved. This is hard on Natasha, who is aware it was all fake, but still enjoyed them as the only family she ever knew. But it's especially hard on Yelena. She was three when the mission began, and came to believe her family was real. Now, she will be put through the same brutal training as Natasha, training which only one in 20 children survive. Meanwhile, far from Earth, on the planet of the Zehoberians, another family is dissolved. A young girl named Gamora loses her parents to a massacre led by Thanos. When Thanos notices her ferocity, fighting off his soldiers, he takes an interest and teaches her about balance. Many years ago, his home planet of Titan suffered overpopulation, so he made a radical suggestion. If, at random, they executed half the population, the remaining resources would be enough for the other half to flourish. This way, rather than everyone dying, half would survive. They scoffed at the insane suggestion and cast him out. As Thanos predicted, resources dwindled and they all died. In the time since, he's become convinced the entire universe will suffer the same fate, unless half of all living beings are killed. So Thanos amassed an army and has been going planet to planet, executing half the population on each. Now he's come for the Zehoberians. Half are killed, including Gamora's parents. But Thanos keeps her alive, raising her as a daughter and one of his fiercest assassins. Later, he will adopt another girl named Nebula, who becomes a sister and eventual rival to Gamora. In Argentina, a ghost is born. Elias Starr used to work for S.H.I.E.L.D., until Hank Pym fired and discredited him. So he continued quantum research on his own, and without Hank's oversight, took bigger risks, which gets him and his wife killed, while inflicting his daughter with something called molecular disequilibrium. Every cell in her body is constantly torn apart and stitched back together over and over. It's painful, but also grants her the ability to phase through matter. One of Hank's colleagues, Bill Foster, hears about it and brings her into S.H.I.E.L.D. He tries to keep her safe, but S.H.I.E.L.D. sees opportunity in her. Over time, they will build her a containment suit to control her power and use her abilities to their own ends, all with the promise of delivering a cure that will never come. By 1996, Shu Wenwu has wielded the Ten Rings for nearly a thousand years, and his army has evolved into a global criminal organization. But his thirst for conquest has not lessened. He wants more, and he believes he'll find it in the legendary city of Ta Lo. He seeks out the city, but finds it surrounded by a magical, shifting forest maze. It kills his men, but he continues on his own, until he finds Ying Li. He demands she take him to the city. She refuses, and Wenwu attacks. For the first time in a millennium, he finds himself outmatched. Using the magic of the Great Protector, she's able to stand against him, and even take his rings. At first, he's impressed, and soon, he's in love. And soon that love will convince him to put away the Ten Rings, and instead, start a family. Three years later, the European country of Sokovia is embroiled in turmoil. In an effort to tamp it down, American forces launch an air raid. Before the bombs hit, the Maximoff family do their best to enjoy another night of television, unaware of the doom that will soon reign from above. Most nights, they watch shows imported from America, everything from I Love Lucy to Malcolm in the Middle. Tonight, 10-year-old Wanda Maximoff picks her favorite, the Dick Van Dyke Show. But they're interrupted when a mortar shell strikes their home, killing Wanda and Pietro's parents. The two children cower under a bed as the second shell hits, but this one fails to detonate. So they wait, afraid that the slightest movement will set it off. For two days, they wait, and they stare at the name written on the bomb, the name of the man they will blame for destroying their family, Stark. Years later, Wanda will learn that it was not luck which prevented the second bomb from detonating. It was her, subconsciously using latent chaos magic, an ability she was born with. 
and Wanda Maximoff is not the only enemy Tony Stark makes that year. On New Year's Eve, Aldrich Killian approaches Stark at a party to try and recruit him for his think tank, Advanced Idea Mechanics, or AIM. But Tony is more interested in Maya Hansen, so he lies to Aldrich, promising to meet him on the roof in five minutes. Aldrich waits on the roof. For the first 20 minutes, he actually believes Tony will show. The next hour, he thought about jumping. He looked up at the city filled with people who didn't and would never know his name. He was anonymous. Maybe that wasn't such a bad thing. Maybe Aldrich Killian could rule from behind the scenes. In that moment, a desperation is born, which sets Killian on a villainous path. Meanwhile, Maya shows Tony her research. She calls it extremis. Through genetic manipulation, organisms can be taught to rapidly heal, regrow limbs, and more. But she needs help working out some bugs, like the tendency for those organisms to explode. But Tony is much more interested in her than her research. They spend the night together, and the next morning, Tony lives up to his playboy reputation by not being there. Though he does leave behind a formula he worked out to help with her exploding problem. Maya and Aldrich, both dismissed by Tony Stark, soon join forces to further extremist research. On April 16, 2005, the Hulk is born. Dr. Bruce Banner had been recruited by General Thaddeus Ross to work on experiments involving gamma radiation. The general told him it was to develop solutions for radiation resistance, but in reality, they were trying to recreate the formula for Dr. Erskine's super soldier serum, something no one's been able to replicate. In the experiment, Bruce works closely with General Ross's daughter, Betty, who also happens to be the woman he loves. The two have been close since attending Harvard together years earlier. But on that day in 2005, things go wrong. With their budget close to running out in the project on life support, Banner makes the drastic decision to test it on himself. The result? He turns into a hulking green monster any time his stress levels rise too high. In the days that follow, Ross admits the truth to Banner and tries to enlist his help in finishing the work they started, perfecting the serum. After all, a few hulks in the military would make them a force to be reckoned with. But Banner refuses to become a weapon and instead goes on the run, becoming a fugitive and leaving Betty, the love of his life, behind. By 2006, Shu Wenwu and Ying Li have settled down. He hoped to join her in Ta Lo, but the village elders refused, worried his past would catch up with him. Instead, they live in China, where they raise a son and daughter, Shang-Chi and Sha Ling. One day, Ying Li tells her son the story of the Ten Rings, how she and his father met, and she tells him how she managed to beat his father. She used magic of the Great Protector, an ability only available to her in Ta Lo. Though she can't bring Shang-Chi to her home, she gives him a small piece of it, a green pendant, promising whenever he feels lost, it will help him find his way home. Soon, just as the elders feared, Wen Wu's past catches up with him. While he's out, Ying Li trains her son in the techniques which allowed her to harness the Great Protector's power, a power unavailable to her when the Iron Gang shows up. They've had a grievance with her husband after 10 years ago, he nearly destroyed their gang as punishment for selling weapons in his territory. Now, as repayment, they murder his wife, while Shang-Chi watches. When his father sees the body, he picks up his ten rings for the first time in a decade and brings the boy to watch him massacre the Iron Gang. He doesn't find their boss, who actually ordered the hit, but for now, he settles for the blood of his men. Shu Wenwu looks at his traumatized son and tells him, A blood debt has to be paid by blood. From then on, he puts Shang-Chi through brutal training to ensure that one day he will be strong enough to wield the Ten Rings himself. And though his sister Xia Ling is forbidden from joining the training, she watches and teaches herself to be even better. In 2008, Natasha Romanoff has been through the Red Room and killed many on their behalf, something she's come to detest but can't escape. Until S.H.I.E.L.D. sends Clint Barton after her, a bow and arrow wielding agent codenamed Hawkeye. 
But rather than kill Natasha, he sees good in her and instead helps her defect from the Red Room and join S.H.I.E.L.D. Her first mission? Kill General Drakov and take down the Red Room. She and Hawkeye head to Budapest, where Natasha does something which will haunt her for years. She watches Drakov's daughter enter the building to confirm he's in there, then gives Clint the order to blow it up with the girl inside. To escape the aftermath, Clint and Natasha shoot it out with Hungarian special forces and hide out for 10 days until they can leave, believing the Red Room destroyed. But unbeknownst to her, it survives and so does Drakov, meaning her one sister Yelena is still captive to it. In 2009, Tony Stark continues to run Stark Industries successfully. Some accuse him of profiteering, creating weapons that fuel global warfare, but those criticisms are easy to ignore as he lives the playboy lifestyle of a billionaire. But all that will soon change. His father's old business partner, Obadiah, has grown tired of living in Tony's shadow and hires the Ten Rings to assassinate him. When Tony visits Afghanistan to demonstrate his new Jericho missile for the U.S. military, the Ten Rings make their move. An explosion takes out Stark's convoy and nearly kills him. But the Ten Rings force a doctor in their captivity, Ho Yinsen, to save his life. Tony wakes up with a car battery powered electromagnet in his chest, which stops the shrapnel in his bloodstream from reaching his heart. Why did they save him? Once the Ten Rings realized who their target was, they realized he is worth a lot more to them than Obadiah's payment. Instead of killing him, they force Tony to build them their own Jericho missile. With the threat of execution, Tony agrees. But in secret, he works with Yinsen to build something else, an exoskeleton, a prototype for what will become the Iron Man armor. And Tony builds a small arc reactor, inspired by his father's work, to replace the electromagnet in his chest and power the suit. Using the armor, Tony escapes, but only thanks to Yinsen's sacrifice. He buys Tony the time they need to power the suit by getting himself killed. But before passing, he has enough breath left to make Tony promise not to waste his second chance at life. Tony kills most of his captors, then leaves the compound by crash landing far from it. He ditches the busted armor to reach his rescue party, which includes his old friend from MIT, now US Air Force officer, James Rhodes, or Rhodey. Returning home, Tony holds to the promise he made Yinsen by announcing that Stark Industries will no longer manufacture weapons, and by paying a little more attention to the people close to him, including his assistant, Pepper Potts. In the spirit of bettering the world, Tony turns his attention to renewable energy, starting by building another, more powerful arc reactor. He replaces the one in his chest and discards it, though Pepper holds on to it, encasing it in a display with the words, Proof that Tony Stark has a heart. The new reactor is strong, strong enough to power the Mark II armor, an armor Stark is inspired to build after his experience in the desert. He works on it in secret with help from his AI companion, Jarvis. One night at a Stark-sponsored charity event, Tony and Pepper grow closer as they share a dance and nearly kiss. But his night takes a sour turn when he learns something about Obadiah Stane. He's been selling Stark weapons to the Ten Rings. Why? By arming the US military and their enemies, war rages on, and so do their profits. Outraged, Tony suits up and visits Gomira, a village under siege by the Ten Rings, the village where Ho Yinsen and his family used to live. Using the armor, Tony easily frees them all, catching the attention of the US Air Force. But Tony calls Rhodey to reveal He's the guy in the suit, and his friend does his best to cover for him. Back home, Tony confides in Pepper about the armor he's built, and what he learned about Stain. To find out more, she snoops on Obadiah's computer, revealing he's the one who hired the Ten Rings to grab Tony. Obadiah quickly notices Pepper's snooping, and notices she's taken evidence with her. He's in trouble, but he won't go down without a fight. 
The Ten Rings were able to find Tony's original suit in the desert, and Obadiah used it to build his own. He just needs a way to power it. So he helps himself to the arc reactor in Tony's chest, leaving him to die. Thankfully, this was the second one he built. And thankfully, Pepper Potts is sentimental, so she saved the first. Now, it saves Tony's life. The two men don their armor and fight. In the battle, Tony pushes himself and the suit to the limit, only to find it isn't enough. He'll need help, and he gets it, from Pepper and from Agent Coulson of S.H.I.E.L.D., whose attention Tony attracted thanks to his recent actions. They defeat Stain and kill him in the process. The next day, the public names this unidentified savior Iron Man, and Coulson helps maintain his secret identity by creating an alibi. But Tony has plans of his own. He steps before the press and makes an announcement. I'm Iron Man. That night, he finds Nick Fury waiting at his home, there to tell him about something called the Avengers Initiative. Six months later, Tony Stark has only become more renowned as a hero. The people celebrate his success at the opening ceremony of Stark Expo. But he has a problem. The core which keeps the shrapnel in his body at bay is powered by palladium, a substance which is apparently toxic and killing him. He doesn't have much time left. He keeps this to himself, but his actions show it. In fact, he picks his successor, promoting Pepper Potts to CEO, which means he needs a new assistant. So he chooses Natalie Rushman, because she's the most qualified. Unaware this is actually Natasha Romanoff, sent by Fury to spy on him. A few days later, Tony recklessly decides to race in the Monaco Grand Prix. And this is when Ivan Vanko, son of the Russian scientist deported by Howard, chooses to strike. Picking up from his father's research, Ivan has managed to build his own arc reactor and exoskeleton. The race is interrupted by his attack with electrified whips. But with help from Pepper, his driver slash bodyguard Happy Hogan, and his Mark V suitcase suit, Tony defeats the villain. Meanwhile, after a five-year search, Dr. Bruce Banner is located in Rio de Janeiro. Ross sends a team after him, including ex-Special Ops Commander Emil Blonsky. The Hulk escapes, meaning Blonsky failed. That doesn't sit well, and taking down the Hulk becomes his personal vendetta. And Banner makes his next move. He's been in contact with scientist Dr. Samuel Stearns, who's been helping him find a cure. Banner has been sending him blood samples, but to make any further progress, they'll need data from the original experiment. So he heads back to America to get it. And in America, the government is in a panic over Ivan Vanko's public display. It signals that others can replicate Iron Man tech, including America's enemies. This puts pressure on them to get a hold of that tech themselves. Rhodey warns Tony that if he doesn't hand it over, they will take it by force. Meanwhile, Stark Industries competitor Justin Hammer has grown tired of living in the shadow of Tony Stark. They simply can't keep up with Stark technology, and Tony has no shame in reminding them of it. But Justin sees opportunity in Ivan. With Hammer's investment, Ivan could build something to outclass even Stark. So he breaks him out of jail and hires him to build some weapons. Justin hopes to show them off at Stark Expo and embarrass Tony. But Ivan has other plans. Revenge. And in a few days, over just a one-week period, Tony will fight for his life, Hulk will be revealed to the world, and so will Thor. It all begins the night of Tony Stark's birthday. Tony drinks away the woes of impending death by palladium, and things get dangerous when the drunk billionaire puts on his armor to show off its firing power. Rhodey steals the Mark II armor and confronts his friend, demanding he stop. But Tony won't listen to reason, and they fight until Rhodey takes off with the armor. The next day, he hands it over to the U.S. Air Force, where Justin Hammer is brought in to examine it and make some upgrades, turning Tony's Mark II armor into the War Machine armor. All of this had been reported back to Fury by Romanoff, so he finally confronts Tony to set him on the right path. Nick hands over some of Tony's father's old things and promises they contain something which will solve his palladium problem. Meanwhile, there is trouble in Asgard. During Thor's coronation, 
frost giants break into Odin's vault to steal back their casket of ancient winters, but they are easily killed by the destroyer, an automaton built by Odin to guard his vault. Young, brash, and thirsty for war, Thor insists on heading to Judenheim to punish the frost giants for their transgression, but Odin wisely orders they keep the peace. Orders which Thor ignores. He rounds up a few of his friends and crosses the Rainbow Bridge to the Bifrost, which allows them to teleport between the Nine Realms. The Bifrost is guarded by Heimdall, an Asgardian with a near-omniscient ability to see anything happening within the Nine Realms. Disturbed by the Frost Giant's ability to get past him earlier, he lets Thor and his friends through to investigate, despite Odin's orders to leave things be. In Judenheim, Thor wreaks havoc on the Frost Giants, and Loki learns something about himself. The touch of the Frost Giants should be deadly, but for some reason, it isn't harmful to Loki. On Earth, Tony goes through the box and finds footage of his father, taken while recording his welcome speech for a Stark Expo of years past. Between takes, he decided to leave a message for his son, where he tells Tony, what is and always will be my greatest creation is you, something Tony badly needed to hear after never hearing anything close to it while his father was alive. And he finds plans for an element superior to palladium, something his father theorized but didn't have the technology to actually synthesize. Now, in 2010, Tony does. He creates the new element and with that, his life is saved. The core is no longer powered by toxic palladium, but by this new, safer element. In Judenheim, before things get too out of hand, Odin arrives to take the Asgardians home, and as punishment for his reckless actions, he banishes Thor to Midgard, also known as Earth. He also takes away Thor's weapon and power source, the hammer Mjolnir. Odin casts a spell to ensure it can only be held by one who is worthy, then sends it to Earth as well. On Earth, physicists Jane Foster and Professor Eric Selvig, along with intern Darcy Lewis, have been researching strange anomalies in the skies. Thor's arrival in the middle of one reveals them to be wormholes produced by the Bifrost. That night, Justin Hammer has his presentation at Stark Expo, including James Rhodes in the upgraded War Machine armor, and an army of drones. But the armor and drones are quickly hijacked by Vanko, who turns them on the crowd. But a now healthy Tony has just arrived. He leads the army away, while Happy and Romanoff go after Vanko directly, while Pepper coordinates with police to protect the civilians. Vanko escapes, but Romanoff hacks his terminal to return control of the suit to Rhodes, allowing him and Tony to fight together. They quickly destroy most of the drones, and when Vanko shows up himself, they destroy him too. But the remaining drones are rigged to explode, including one right next to Pepper. Tony arrives just in time to save her, and before the adrenaline wears off, the two finally kiss. The next day, Banner visits his old lab, but finds all the data on his experiment erased. On Asgard, Loki wonders why the Frost Giant's touch left him unharmed. He demands answers, and Odin finally gives them, revealing Loki's true heritage as a Frost Giant, the baby abandoned by the King of Judenheim. Loki yells at his father for the lies, but Odin collapses into a coma. Old age takes its toll, leaving Loki to usurp the throne. Meanwhile, Jane and company introduce Thor to earthly delicacies like Pop-Tarts, until they hear about the crater 50 miles away, where Thor surmises his hammer landed. That night, he fights his way past the shield perimeter, which has already formed, but when he grabs the hammer, it won't budge. He's not yet worthy. Coulson takes him in, and while in shield custody, Loki pays him a visit. He lies, telling Thor their father is dead, and their mother insists he remain banished. Thor accepts his fate as an outcast, and Coulson lets him go, though has him followed. He returns to Jane's trailer. He finally tells her about Asgard and the Nine Realms, things which fill the scientist's mind with wonder. They talk late into the night, and she finds herself falling in love with a god. And Thor finds himself falling in love with a mortal. Meanwhile, Loki visits his biological father, Laufey, 
king of the Frost Giants, and plots behind Odin's back. He agrees to let Laufey into Odin's chambers while he sleeps so he can kill the Asgardian king. In reality, Loki intends to kill Laufey before he gets to Odin as part of a plot to paint himself as a hero, finally winning Odin's affection over Thor and solidifying his place as heir. Upon Loki's return, Heimdall is suspicious. Loki used magic to cloak his whereabouts, blocking Heimdall's ability to see him. He realizes Loki was likely dealing with Laufey behind his back and that Loki was the one who let in the Frost Giants yesterday. Somehow, he's found secret pathways between realms and was able to open a portal to Judenheim without the Bifrost. He'd done it just to mess up Thor's big day, but now Loki sees opportunity for much more. He could be king. That same night, despite Banner's attempt to remain hidden, Betty Ross spots him. They share a tearful reunion, and she reveals that when Ross hid away their data, she secretly kept some of it. Meanwhile, Ross offers Emil Blonsky an experimental dose of their super soldier serum, and he enthusiastically agrees to take it. He'll do whatever it takes to even the playing field against the Hulk. The next morning, Betty and Bruce prepare to part ways when he's attacked by Ross's men and a serum-enhanced Blonsky. The Hulk emerges, and in the ensuing battle, Blonsky is badly wounded. Betty is nearly caught in the crossfire, but the Hulk protects her, and the General watches the monster save his daughter's life, then leave with her. And their battle on the college campus does not go unnoticed by the public. In New Mexico, another public battle occurs. Having caught on to Loki's schemes, Heimdall sends Thor's friends to Earth behind Loki's back. But Loki quickly learns what he's done, so he freezes Heimdall and sends the Destroyer to Earth. Thor and his friends fight the automaton, but are no match for it, until Thor offers to sacrifice himself hoping to protect his friends and the nearby civilians. He is severely wounded, and Jane cries over the dying god, a god who has proven himself worthy. Mjolnir returns to Thor, and so do its powers. The god of thunder destroys the destroyer, and in the aftermath, he agrees to be Coulson's ally, should the need arise in the future. Thor shouts for Heimdall to return them home. The Guardian of the Bifrost frees himself from Loki's ice and opens the bridge. Thor promises Jane he will return. Then they kiss and he leaves. He returns to Asgard just in time to find Loki killing Laufey, stopping the Frost Giant from assassinating Odin. Then Loki sets a plan in motion to use the Rainbow Bridge to destroy Judenheim. He hopes that when Odin wakes up, he'll see Loki saved his life and destroyed their enemy, making him worthy of the throne. But as much as Thor was willing to fight the Frost Giants earlier, committing genocide on their race is something else entirely. So he stops Loki the only way he can, by destroying the bridge, severing their means of travel between worlds, and sacrificing any hope of visiting Jane. He and Loki fall into the void, but Odin wakes just in time to catch them. Thor is saved, but Loki has other plans. He lets go and falls to parts unknown. Two days later, Bruce and Betty meet with Dr. Samuel Stearns. Now that they have the data, it's time to actually try administering the cure. The results are inconclusive, and they're interrupted anyway by Ross and Blonsky's arrival. Ross takes Bruce into custody, while Blonsky stays behind. At gunpoint, he forces Stearns to give him some of what Bruce has. After a taste, he wants more than what the General Serum has to offer. The result is an abomination. Blonsky becomes an uncontrolled monster and rampages through the city. Seeing the abomination's rampage, Bruce begs the general to take him back so he can stop him, and seeing no other choice, the general agrees. Bruce leaps from the jet. He can't control the Hulk, but maybe he can aim it. By the time he lands, Bruce is gone, and in his place, is the Incredible Hulk. The two monsters fight, and after a lengthy battle, the Hulk is victorious. In the chaos, Stearns gets a head wound, and some of Bruce's blood drips into it, seemingly having an effect, planting the seeds for Stearns to one day become the villain 
known as the leader. In the aftermath, Betty approaches him. The Hulk collects one of her tears and says her name. But Bruce and the Hulk both know they can't be with her. It would only put her in danger again. So the green monster runs away, but with a new goal in mind. Bruce will no longer try to rid himself of the Hulk. Instead, he will learn to control it. One year later, S.H.I.E.L.D. discovers Captain America frozen and preserved in the icy waters, where he crashed Red Skull's plane. He wakes up in Nick Fury's custody. His first moments are chaos, wondering where and when he is. Realization quickly sets in. He's been asleep for 70 years, though his conversation with Peggy feels like moments ago, a conversation where they set a date for that long-promised dance. Meanwhile, after years of painstakingly killing one half of a population after another, Thanos has realized there is a better way. If he could obtain all six Infinity Stones, he could combine their power and with the snap of his finger, erase half the population of the universe in one fell swoop. First, he sets his sights on the Space Stone, contained inside the Tesseract, and makes a deal with Loki to obtain it. It seems that after falling into that void two years ago, the energy of the Bifrost eventually brought Loki to the Sanctuary, an asteroid field where the other, a conduit to Thanos, meets with Loki to strike the bargain. If Loki steals the Tesseract, they'll give him an army to conquer humanity. Craving power and vengeance after losing Asgard, Loki takes the deal. Armed with a powerful scepter, capable of destruction and mind control, Loki has no trouble stealing the Tesseract from Fury. And with the scepter, he takes control of Clint Barton, aka Hawkeye, and Professor Selvig. He quickly puts the Professor to work, building a machine that will open a portal for his army, composed of an alien race called Chitari. With the Tesseract gone and their facility destroyed, Nick Fury announces that they are at war. For the battle ahead, their first recruit is Natasha Romanoff. She's hesitant to skip out on her current mission, but once she hears that Barton is in trouble, she quickly joins the fight. Her orders are to recruit Bruce Banner. She finds him living as a doctor in India. He's hesitant until she tells him the stakes. The Tesseract has the energy to wipe out their planet, and it's been taken. They don't know where to, but it emits low levels of gamma radiation, something Banner is intimately familiar with. Steve Rogers, who hasn't had a mission in 70 years, needs little convincing to join the cause. Tony Stark's only hesitation is leaving Pepper behind, but they recognize the urgency of the mission and she promises she'll be waiting for him after. Using their global surveillance, S.H.I.E.L.D. finds Loki and Fury sends Captain America after him. He arrives just in time to save an innocent life, though he struggles in a one-on-one -on -one brawl with Loki until Iron Man shows up. They take him into custody, but it seems that Odin was able to use some dark magic to send Thor to Earth, even without the Bifrost. Thor grabs his brother, and it takes some time for him and Iron Man to realize they're on the same side, but with Captain America's help, they unite, and Thor returns Loki to S.H.I.E.L.D. custody. As Stark and Banner analyze Loki's staff for clues on the Tesseract's location, Stark asks what his secret is. How has Banner learned to keep from transforming into the Hulk? Before he can answer, Rogers interrupts. He's shocked to learn that Stark and Banner suspect Fury is hiding something. But their suspicion is contagious, and Rogers investigates. He quickly discovers the truth. Fury intends on using the Tesseract's power to make weapons of mass destruction. The team confronts him, but Fury points out that, with God-level threats out there, humanity needs more firing power. The team argues, and things become personal. Rogers accuses Stark of being nothing behind his suit of armor. When the chips are down, Stark fights for himself. He doesn't know how to sacrifice when necessary. They're interrupted by an attack led by the mind-controlled Hawkeye. Banner is finally pushed too far. The Hulk emerges. The team puts petty differences aside and works together. Captain America and Iron Man fix the damage to the ship. Thor contains Hulk as best he can, 
until the green monster plummets from the ship and turns back into Bruce, and Natasha takes on Barton, hitting his head hard enough to wake him up. Although they fight off their attackers, it's not without cost. Fury shares the bad news. Not only did Loki escape, but he also killed Agent Coulson, and he tells them about the Avengers Initiative, how he hoped to bring a group of extraordinary people together to fight the battles they couldn't. Coulson believed in that vision. Fury inflames their guilt by showing the bloodied Captain America trading cards he found in Coulson's pocket. Coulson looked up to the heroes, and apparently it cost him his life. In truth, Fury found the cards in Coulson's locker, but he knew the team needed something to rally around. Coulson knew it too. So, he used his death to that end. And it works. They quickly rally and get back to work. As a team, they realize Loki is vain and would want an audience to witness his conquest. He'll open the portal at Stark Tower in the middle of Manhattan. Iron Man gets there first, but too late to stop the machine. The portal opens, the Chitari arrive, and the Battle of New York begins. Working together, they protect civilians and fight the swarm. In the midst of battle, Banner reveals his secret to containing the Hulk. He's always angry. And today, he lets the anger flow. Hulk wreaks havoc on the enemy. But as long as the portal remains open, the swarm keeps coming, and there's a ticking clock they don't know about yet. The World Security Council tells Fury that the threat needs to be contained, even if it costs them a city and all the lives within it. They prepare to launch a nuclear strike. In the chaos, Selvig is woken up and reveals that even under Loki's power, some part of him was present and created a failsafe to close the portal. He and Natasha get to work. Fury alerts Stark to the incoming nuclear missile, which has just launched. Stark tells Romanoff to hold off on closing the portal so he can grab the nuke and bring it through the wormhole to detonate far from Earth. He knows it'll be a one-way trip, but it's a sacrifice he's willing to make. Tony calls Pepper to say farewell. The call goes unanswered. So without the luxury of last words, Stark flies into the portal, and he falls just as the bomb explodes. He falls back through the portal just before it closes. His suit fails him, and he careens toward death until Hulk catches him. Tony Stark lives, and the world is saved. The heroes treat themselves to some shawarma, and Thor returns home with Loki and the Tesseract. The Avengers were victorious, but many civilian lives were lost, including Derek Bishop's. However, Hawkeye managed to save the life of his daughter Kate and inspire her to one day pick up the bow and arrow herself. In the days that follow, Odin sentences Loki to an eternity in the Asgardian dungeons. On Earth, a salvage company owned by Adrian Toomes is hired to clean up the mess left by the Avengers battle. But apparently Stark Industries has joined efforts with the federal government to form the Department of Damage Control to oversee collection and storage of alien and other exotic materials. They unceremoniously take the job from Adrian and his employees, depriving them of sorely needed paychecks. To recoup their loss, Toombs and his men decide to enter a new business. Rather than hand over all the Chitauri equipment and weapons they salvaged, they'll hold on to some of it, and they'll use it to build alien weapons they can sell on the black market. In the months that follow, Tony learns what happens after you come face to face with an alien threat and nearly die alone, away from home in some distant part of the universe. Every day he lives in fear. What if the aliens return? What if some other worse threat shows up? That fear robs Tony of sleep and sometimes robs him of breath. Anxiety attacks strike at the mere mention or thought of the Avengers battle in New York. Fear turns to desperation. Tony works without rest to upgrade his armor, rapidly iterating to Mark 42. He even builds armor powered by the Jarvis AI so they can function without a pilot, and gives himself the ability to summon armor with his mind. He will be prepared for the next threat, even if it kills him. That's how far he'd go to save the world and to protect Pepper Potts. 
the woman he loves. That next threat looms in the form of Aldrich Killian and Maya Hansen. Their research on extremists has reached the point of human trials, but sometimes those humans blow up, killing nearby civilians. Inspired by the anonymity he felt on that rooftop in 1999, Killian hides in the shadows while creating a figurehead to take responsibility for the explosions. A terrorist named the Mandarin. In reality, he is drug addict and actor Trevor Slattery, who is paid to play the role. One of those explosions puts Tony's once bodyguard, now head of security, Happy Hogan, in the hospital. Now it's personal. Tony publicly challenges the Mandarin and recklessly hands out his home address on the news, telling the villain to come for him. Back home, he investigates and discovers there was an explosion in Tennessee similar to the Mandarin's before the terrorist began taking credit for the explosions. Tony tries a flight, but before he can leave, Killian blows up his home. Pepper is nearly killed, but Tony acts fast, summoning an armor to protect her. And in his fight to stave off further attacks, he's knocked unconscious while a damaged armor flies him across the country. The world presumes Tony dead as he wakes up in Tennessee. With his armor broken, Tony recruits the help of a local boy named Harley Keener, a kid with a similar interest in technology. Together, they investigate the explosion. Tony discovers that there was no bomb. It was the man himself who detonated, a result of Killian and Maya's research. They pinpoint the Mandarin's location to Miami. Tony heads there, but while he was gone, things went south. Killian captured Pepper and began testing Extremis on her, and he captured the War Machine armor, recently rebranded Iron Patriot, with Rhodes inside it. Tony interrogates the Mandarin, quickly learning his true identity as actor Trevor Slattery. But Killian's Extremis-powered men arrive and quickly take Stark into custody. But he summons an armor and manages to escape with Rhodes. The two of them uncover the rest of Killian's plot. He intends on killing the President of the United States on live TV. This would put the Vice President in charge, with whom Killian has struck a deal, to help the VP's daughter grow back her missing leg with Extremis. Killian got a taste of power after inadvertently owning the War on Terror and decided to go a step further, installing a President in his pocket. But with Rhodey's help and an army of AI-powered armors, Tony takes Killian down, rescues the President, and saves Pepper. Though she saves him a bit too, using some borrowed armor and the power of Extremis. In the immediate aftermath of the battle, Tony recognizes that his obsession with building armor consumed him and created a chasm between him and Pepper. So, he initiates the Clean Slate Protocol, destroying the suits in a glorious fireworks display on what happens to be Christmas Day. This is his gift to Pepper Potts, a commitment to try and be better and spend more time with her. In the days that follow, he cures her of extremis before it gets dangerous and while he's at it, finally removes the shrapnel from his body. Reflecting on his journey, Tony realizes that even when stripped of everything and stranded, he managed to claw back victory. His anxiety is not cured overnight, but he knows one thing which helps. Even without fancy armor and without the arc reactor in his chest, Tony Stark is still Iron Man. The following year is the 5,000th anniversary of the Convergence, meaning it's time for another. The Nine Realms come into alignment and cause strange anomalies around the world, catching Darcy Lewis and Jane Foster's attention. As they investigate, Jane is pulled into a portal and comes into contact with the Aether, hidden millennia ago by the Asgardian King Bor. The power is absorbed into her body, which puts a target on her back for the Dark Elves who intend on using its power once again. Meanwhile, Thor has been busy. After the Bifrost was destroyed and Asgard was cut off from most of the realms, chaos and power grabs ensued. He's been busy taking his armies across the realms to tamp down the turmoil. Now, things are mostly peaceful and the Bifrost has been repaired. But while Asgard celebrates, Thor is sullen. He can only think of the mortal he fell in love with, Jane Foster, someone he hasn't seen since they first met. So when Heimdall reports Jane's plight, the God of Thunder rushes to Earth for a long-awaited reunion and brings the ether-infected Jane back to Asgard, 
leading the Dark Elves right to them. They managed to fight off the Elves, but not without cost. Thor's mother Frigga protects Jane by sacrificing herself. Asgard mourns their queen. Thor mourns his mother, then gets back to work and comes up with a plan. Asgard cannot withstand another attack, and the Dark Elves will certainly return. So Thor will take Jane somewhere far away. The ether inside her will attract the Elves again, and the moment they extract it from her body, Thor will destroy it. Odin forbids Thor pursuing this plan, as it would be too dangerous. But Thor is never one to follow orders. If he must commit treason to save Asgard and the Nine Realms, so be it. But he needs to be discreet. So rather than use the Bifrost, he goes to someone who knows other secret pathways between the realms, his brother, Loki. Thor reluctantly breaks him out of the dungeons, and they head off to the Dark Elves' homeworld. At first, things go according to plan. The elves come. They extract the ether, but it's harder to destroy than Thor anticipated. Loki is seemingly killed, and the elves escape to Earth with the ether in hand. There, the elves can fire its power at the point of convergence, shooting it through all nine realms to extinguish the light and restore the darkness they so crave. But even after losing a mother and a brother, Thor does not give up and neither do his friends. Back on Earth, Darcy has found Professor Selvig, who's been studying the Convergence and developed machines that could stop it. The only problem is, they're too late. The Dark Elves have begun the process, and no human could survive bringing Selvig's machines into the weaponized ether. Thankfully, they have a god on their side. Thor enters the darkness to defeat Malekith, leader of the Dark Elves, and gets Selvig's machines in position. The convergence is stopped, and on the 5,000th anniversary of Thor's grandfather defeating the Elves, Thor himself now claims the same victory. In the aftermath of the battle, he returns to Asgard, where he rejects the throne. He will defend the realm with his last and every breath, but Thor cannot do so from the throne. He'd rather be a good man than a great king and he'd rather spend the rest of his life with Jane. So he leaves for Earth to do exactly that. Though Thor is unaware what he's left behind, Loki is alive. He survived the earlier attack, but with his usual tricks, created an illusion to appear slain. Instead, he's returned to Asgard and usurped the throne by disguising himself as Odin. Meanwhile, Asgard brings the Aether somewhere safe, to a museum in a distant part of the universe, run by a being known as the Collector, and he agrees to keep the ether, really the reality stone, safe in his vault. By 2014, Nick Fury is starting to become suspicious of S.H.I.E.L.D. They are on the precipice of activating Project Insight, where three helicarriers will be launched to float in the skies, armed with precision weapons in constant communication with global satellites. This will allow them to immediately assassinate anyone anywhere, at any time, and not just one person. They could kill millions at a time. All they need is a list of targets. Fury suspects there is something about the project he hasn't been told, so he hatches a scheme to steal classified data which should reveal more. The data is located on a boat, so he hires some pirates to take it hostage, giving Fury cover to dispatch Natasha Romanoff and Captain America. The cover story is simple. They are there to rescue hostages, but in truth, Natasha is just there for the data, while Steve is kept in the dark, told only that they are there for the hostages. But Steve quickly realizes the truth when he focuses on saving lives while Natasha busies herself on a computer. Afterward, he's furious. He was kept in the dark by two people he thought he could trust. This is especially difficult for him because after seven decades of sleep, Steve has few friends left. Peggy Carter suffers dementia as she lies on what will surely be her deathbed. And to Steve's knowledge, his best friend Bucky is long dead. But he does have a new friend in veteran Sam Wilson, who he met on a morning run. They relate because Sam is struggling to reintegrate into civilian life, while Steve is struggling to reintegrate into a new century. Meanwhile, Fury approaches his boss, Alexander Pierce, to ask for a delay on Project Insight. What Fury doesn't know is that Pierce is part of the Hydra parasite within S.H.I.E.L.D., 
In fact, he's one of its leaders. By exposing his suspicions and getting in their way, Fury has signed his own death warrant. After leaving the office, Fury is attacked by Hydra's brainwashed assassin, Bucky Barnes, codenamed the Winter Soldier. Fury barely manages to escape with his life. Then, he heads to Steve's apartment to tell him that S.H.I.E.L.D. is compromised. Before he can say much, the Winter Soldier finds him again and this time manages to put a few bullets in him. Before he passes out, Fury hands Steve the USB drive of Data rescued from the ship and warns him to trust no one. Roger's neighbor runs into the room, revealing herself to be undercover S.H.I.E.L.D. agent 13, assigned to protect him. Unbeknownst to Steve, this is actually Peggy Carter's daughter, Sharon. She tends to Fury while Rogers goes after the assassin, but the Winter Soldier proves a formidable foe and escapes his grasp. Back at headquarters, Romanoff and Rogers watch doctors attempt to resuscitate Fury, and they watch Fury die. Pierce calls Rogers for a meeting to grill him about Fury's death. Rogers only shares that Fury warned him not to trust anyone, but he doesn't mention the USB drive. Convinced Captain America will be an impediment to his plans, Pierce tries to have him killed on the way out, but of course Rogers escapes. Later, he reconvenes with Romanoff. He's reluctant to trust her, but has little choice. Right now, he's considered a fugitive and enemy of S.H.I.E.L.D. With one of the most powerful organizations in the world after him, Romanoff is a valuable ally. They check the USB drive, but find it's encrypted. The only info they get is the source. The program on it came from Camp Lehigh, New Jersey, the place where Rogers got his military training nearly a century ago. They head there and find a building that wasn't there before, and inside that building, they find Dr. Arnim Zola, or at least his mind, downloaded onto a warehouse of computer servers. The scientist reveals a truth that changes everything. S.H.I.E.L.D. is compromised by HYDRA. Over the years, they've been ruling from the shadows and killing when necessary. And on the list of those they killed, Steve sees the names Howard and Maria Stark. HYDRA was founded on the goal of protecting humanity from their own freedom. But when you try to take their freedom, humanity resists. So, over the decades, HYDRA has sown chaos. Now, humanity is afraid, and they're ready to hand their freedom over willingly in exchange for safety. And Zola has programmed an algorithm, something which will be used in what he calls a purification process, the final step in HYDRA's global takeover. Why is Zola telling them all this? A stalling tactic until a missile can arrive. The place blows up, but thanks to Roger's quick thinking, they live. Seeking refuge, they head to Sam Wilson's place, and he reveals what he used to do in the military. As part of Project Falcon, he was the pilot for advanced personal flight suits. Rogers and Romanoff break into the facility which houses the old suit, and just like that, they have a Falcon on their side. Next, they capture a Hydra agent and interrogate him for information. Finally, they learn the purpose of Zola's algorithm. Project Insight will use data, including bank records, medical histories, voting patterns, emails, and more, to predict who is most likely to threaten Hydra's cause. Then, in a flash, the three helicarriers will kill them all, millions at a time, including the likes of Bruce Banner and Stephen Strange, anyone who's a threat to Hydra, now or in the future. After the interrogation, they're attacked by the Winter Soldier and Hydra forces. During the battle, Rogers unmasks the assassin and is shocked to see the face of his old friend, Bucky Barnes. That momentary distraction allows Hydra to gain the upper hand and capture them all, but they're quickly freed by S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Maria Hill. She takes them to a hiding place, where Fury reveals he is alive, having faked his own death to stay under Hydra's radar. He also reveals that Project Insight will launch in mere hours. To stop it, they've created some chips which will let them take over the targeting systems. All they have to do is get aboard the helicarriers and install one on each before the assassinations begin. So they move quickly, breaking into S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters where Captain America gets on the intercom and makes an impassioned plea to the staff. 
He tells them all that Hydra is among them, even their friends may be compromised, and if they launch those helicarriers today, Hydra will have the power to kill anyone they want. Rogers asks them to disobey orders, do not move forward with the launch, and he knows full well what he's asking for. Anyone who refuses to cooperate will likely be killed. He signs off by saying, I know I'm asking a lot, but the price of freedom is high. It always has been, and it's a price I'm willing to pay. And if I'm the only one, then so be it, but I'm willing to bet I'm not. And Steve is not wrong. Some of the staff do resist, but it only buys them minutes. Soon, the helicarriers are launched. Captain America and the Falcon get to work, boarding them and installing the chips. Meanwhile, Fury and Romanoff confront Pierce. Hacking into the system, Romanoff makes all their secured files public, revealing to the world that S.H.I.E.L.D. is Hydra, and doing so costs her dearly, because among those files are details of her checkered past. Rogers and Wilson successfully install two of the chips, but the Falcon gear is disabled, leaving the last to Steve. Requiring him to fight Bucky one-on-one, -on -one, Steve manages to install the chip, telling the helicarriers to destroy each other rather than any people. The battle is won, but the Winter Soldier still has his orders to kill Captain America. But as the helicarriers are torn apart by their own bullets, Steve refuses to fight his friend. He pleads for Bucky to remember who he is. You're my friend, Steve tells him. You're my mission, Bucky replies, and punches him repeatedly. But Steve will not defend himself. He only replies, then finish it, because I'm with you to the end of the line. Words Bucky once said to Steve, comforting him after his mother's death. That seems to trigger a faint memory. As the helicarrier falls apart, Steve plummets unconscious to the waters below. But he does not drown. Instead, he is rescued by the Winter Soldier, or at least that part of Bucky Barnes he managed to wake up. With S.H.I.E.L.D. effectively dissolved, Romanoff heads off to find herself a new identity. Fury heads off to track down and shut down any remaining Hydra cells, and Steve prepares to search for his old friend Bucky, with help from his new friend, Sam, aka The Falcon. In China, Shang-Chi's training reaches a pivotal moment. His father has located the Iron Gang leader responsible for Ying Li's death, and he tasks Shang-Chi with assassinating him. It would be his first kill. The 14-year-old boy accepts his mission, but after that, has no intention of returning home. Something only his sister knows. She begs him not to abandon her, but he lies with the promise of returning in three days. Shang-Chi leaves. He kills the Iron Gang leader as promised, then flees to America to start a new life. Far from Earth, 26 years after losing his mother, Peter Quill still listens to her tape, Awesome Mix, Volume 1. Now, it accompanies him on Morag, where every 300 years, the sea lowers and the Temple of the Power Stone becomes accessible. Peter is there to do what he does best, steal something. Under Yandu's tutelage, he's grown into a master thief and outlaw named Star-Lord, though it's mainly just Peter himself who calls himself that. But now, he's ready to leave Yandu and his group of thieving Ravagers. Peter's entire life, Yandu has been tough on him while expecting gratitude, never missing an opportunity to remind him that the other Ravagers wanted to eat Peter while Yandu kept him alive. On Morag, Peter hopes to steal his freedom in the form of an orb, which he has no idea contains the Power Stone. All he knows is that Yandu was hired to steal it, so if Peter gets it first, Peter gets the payday, and with that money can go out on his own. But he isn't the only one who wants the orb. So does the mad titan Thanos in his quest to collect all six Infinity Stones. So he made a deal with Ronin to acquire it for him. Ronin's race, the Kree, have been at war with the Nova Empire for a thousand years. Until now. A peace treaty has finally been signed. But in the Thousand Year War, Ronin lost his father, his grandfather, 
and his great-grandfather. He will not rest until the Nova Empire's capital of Xandar is destroyed, and Thanos has promised if Ronan delivers him the orb, he will destroy the planet of Xandar for him. Ronan's forces find it just as Peter does, but he manages to escape with it. On Xandar, Peter finds trouble in the form of a few enemies who will soon become his friends. Gamora, the daughter of Thanos, hopes to get the orb before he does, so she can keep the Power Stone out of his hands. Rocket, a talking raccoon-like creature, and his friend Groot, a talking tree-like creature whose language is limited to the phrase, I am Groot. The two of them are outlaws looking to collect a bounty. With Peter's refusal to return home, Yondu has put a price on his head. With Gamora after the orb and the other two after Peter, a public battle ensues, which gets all four of them arrested. In prison, tensions rise even further when Drax the Destroyer spots Gamora. His wife and daughter were killed by Ronin when his planet was given the Thanos treatment. Now, he sees Gamora and assumes she is working with Ronin, so she has to die. But Peter quickly convinces him otherwise. Instead, he should let Gamora live. Then, when Ronin comes for her, he can kill the Kree himself. For now, the five agree to work together with the promise of a big payday because Gamora knows where they can sell the orb, somewhere it can also be kept safely out of Thanos' hands. And with that, the Guardians of the Galaxy are born. Now, they just have to get out of jail. Thankfully, Rocket has escaped 22 prisons in his time, and this one is no different. It takes some doing, but they get out. However, Peter is nearly left behind when he runs back to rescue his Walkman and his mother's tape. Once they reach Nowhere, a mining colony located in the head of a long-dead Celestial, Gamora asks Peter about the tape. Why is it so important to him? He tries to tell her. His mom gave it to him before she... And Peter can't finish the sentence. The memory is too painful. Gamora sees his vulnerability, and when he plays the tape for her, they nearly kiss. But she is an assassin and doesn't do well with vulnerability so the moment is short-lived. Soon, the Collector is ready to meet. After receiving the Reality Stone from Asgard last year, he's excited to add another stone to his collection. He opens the orb to reveal the Power Stone and tells them about its power, how Infinity Stones can be used to mow down entire civilizations like wheat in a field, how they can only be brandished by beings of extraordinary strength. But, seeking to escape slavery, the Collector's servant Karina grabs it, either to end her misery or perhaps in the faint hope of wielding its power against him. True to the Collector's word, it kills her and releases a shockwave of energy, destroying much of his collection. Meanwhile, a drunk Drax has skipped out on the meeting and becomes impatient waiting for his revenge. So, he finds the mining colony's dispatcher and forces him to summon Ronin. Ronin arrives, and Drax finds that he's no match for him. Fortunately, the rest of the Guardians survive their explosion and rescue him. Unfortunately, Ronin makes off with the orb, and Nebula was with him, which is bad news for Gamora. Although they were once close as children, Gamora bested Nebula at every turn, constantly winning the favor of their adoptive father, Thanos. And to punish Nebula after each of her failures, Thanos would rip a piece of her away and replace it with machinery, slowly turning her into a grotesque part-machine creature. Now she seizes the opportunity for revenge and blows up Gamora's escape pod, leaving her to float in space. Peter acts quickly and recklessly. He broadcasts his location to Yondu, leaps to Gamora, and hands over his breathing apparatus. The void of space begins to kill Peter as he stares into the eyes of the woman he may one day love. But his plan works, and Yondu picks them up. Although Yondu's men call for Peter's head, Peter quickly strikes a deal to retrieve the orb back from Ronin. Meanwhile, Ronin has opened the orb and learned it contains the Power Stone. He realizes that with it, he
he doesn't need Thanos. So rather than hand it over, he will visit Xandar himself, the planet he so despises, and by merely touching the stone to its surface, kill every living thing on it. The Guardians of the Galaxy find Ronan heading to Xandar, so that's where they go, and Peter calls the Nova capital to warn of the impending attack. Although he's an outlaw to them, Ronan is a much bigger threat, so a reluctant alliance is formed. In the battle, they find Ronan's forces impossible to overcome, and their ship is knocked out of the sky. As they careen toward death, Groot brings them close and forms a cocoon around them. They'll be safe from the impact, but it will kill Groot. Rocket looks at the creature, who until now was his only friend in the world, and asks why. And the tree, who has only ever said the words, I am Groot, responds with a new phrase, we are Groot. They crash, and the once enemies turned friends and now family step out of the wreckage. Ronan prepares to eradicate the planet, but even after every attack has failed, Peter has one more trick up his sleeve. Dancing. The momentary distraction gives Drax a chance to shoot the stone out of Ronan's hands, giving Peter a chance to catch it. Holding it nearly kills him, but the celestial blood in his veins saves him but only momentarily. Alone, he cannot hold it for much longer. The thing is, he's not alone. The other guardians hold on to Peter to share the power and the pain. Together, they can just barely contain it and direct the power back at Ronin, killing the villain and saving the planet. Afterward, they leave the stone in the Nova Corps' care and leave in search of further adventures. And although they mourn Groot, Rocket holds on to one of his twigs, which is slowly coming alive. Later, Peter finally decides to open the gift his mother gave him 26 years ago. In it, he finds a tape, Awesome Mix, Volume 2. He listens to it, and the lyrics of Ain't No Mountain High Enough promise that whenever Peter needs it, someone will be there for him, no matter what. And as though on cue, Gamora approaches to remind him he's not alone. But three months later, Peter's world is turned upside down when he finally meets his father. First, he and the Guardians complete a mission for a race known as the Sovereign, in exchange for Nebula, who the Sovereign recently captured. Though, Rocket steals some of their valuable batteries on the way out, turning the Guardians of the Galaxy, once again, into outlaws. They're quickly attacked, forcing them to crash land on another planet. It's at this moment Ego tracks down Peter and invites him back to his planet. Drax and Gamora accompany him, while Groot and Rocket stay behind to repair the ship. On the way to the planet, they meet its only other resident besides Ego himself. Mantis. She belongs to a species with the ability to read and implant emotions. She often uses her ability to ease Ego into sleep whenever he needs it. At the planet, Ego tells Peter his true nature. As long as Ego lives, his light inside the planet gives Peter the powers of a celestial. Peter is at first excited for the reunion, but there is lingering doubt. Why did his father abandon him and his mother? Meanwhile, Drax gets to know Mantis, though for now, she harbors two secrets, including Ego's plan to take over the universe, and that Ego is her father, making her Peter's sister. Things take a sour turn when Ego tells Peter about his plan to overwrite all life with more Ego, and things get even worse when he admits to planting the tumor which killed Peter's mother. When Peter refuses to join Ego in his mad quest, the Celestial is disappointed and sentences Peter to a thousand years as a battery for his planet. Then, he crushes Peter's Walkman in his hand, and with it, the only thing but his memories that Peter has left of his mother. Meanwhile, the other Guardians have been on adventures of their own. Yondu was hired by the Sovereign to capture them and the stolen batteries. He manages to nab Rocket and Groot, but refuses to hand them over to the Sovereign. His crew grow sick of his soft spot for Peter and commit mutiny, locking Yondu up along with Rocket, 
who he opens up to, revealing that he's been exiled from the Ravager community due to his trafficking children. He's been alone for a long time, just like Rocket, who is the only one of his kind. And he reveals the real reason he took Peter, to protect him from Ego, who slaughtered all his previous children. Working together, they break out of the cell and head for Peter. But Nebula gets to Ego's planet first. When Rocket and Groot were taken, she was freed and took a ship to go after her sister. She attacks Gamora and the two fight until they finally reach an uneasy truce. Gamora acknowledges the pain she caused Nebula by always beating her in combat, winning their father Thanos' favor, and costing Nebula more punishment. Finally working together, they discover the pile of bodies under the surface of Ego's planet, the remains of his previous children. They reconvene with Drax and Mantis, who reveals Ego's plan. Just then, Rocket, Groot, and Yondu crash land into Ego, freeing Peter from his grasp. But the Celestial has already begun expansion. The seeds he planted on Earth and the other planets throughout the universe begin to grow. So the Guardians of the Galaxy get to work. Mantis buys them time by putting Ego to sleep. They fight their way to the center of his planet to find his essence, and they plant a bomb, built using those stolen Sovereign batteries. Batteries which the Sovereign want back. So in addition to Ego, the Guardians have to fight off a fleet of drones too. Peter is stuck fighting his father in the planet's core, while the rest escape and the bomb goes off. Ego is killed and the light is extinguished, turning Peter mortal just in time to make him vulnerable to the blast. But while his biological father is dead, his true father lives. Yondu grabs Peter just in time and flies him into the atmosphere. Only problem is that he only has one suit. Only one of them can breathe. He gives it to Peter. Before they reach space, Yandu apologizes for his failures as a father and calls himself lucky for having had Peter as a son. And in the void of space, with no oxygen, he dies in Peter's arms. All Peter can do is shout as he mourns the loss of another parent. But he doesn't need to look far for comfort because waiting on their ship is his family, the Guardians of the Galaxy. And soon, they are witness to a great Ravager funeral. Rocket put the word out about Yondu's sacrifice, and though he was excommunicated in life, they welcome him back in death. Meanwhile, the Sovereign, having lost their batteries and many drones to the Guardians of the Galaxy, build a new weapon to take them down. They call him Adam the next step in their evolution, currently forming inside a new birth pod. The following year, Earth once again assembles its mightiest heroes, this time to retrieve Loki's scepter, which fell into Hydra's hands, thanks to S.H.I.E.L.D.'s dissolution. With it, Hydra's been experimenting on two volunteers, Wanda and Pietro Maximoff. Hydra promised them power, and after losing their parents to a Stark missile, Wanda and Pietro would take any advantage they can get in their pursuit of revenge. When the Avengers reach the facility, they learn firsthand the experiments were a success. Pietro is granted super speed, and Wanda a wide array of magic, including the ability to read and manipulate minds. Though she'll later learn the scepter only enhanced what was already there, chaos magic, and the power which makes her the long-prophesied Scarlet Witch. Reading Tony's mind, she sees fear. Fear that the Avengers will not be prepared for the next threat. Fear that they will fall, and it will be Tony's fault. Because he didn't do what was necessary to protect their world. And she sees that if Tony leaves with the Scepter, his fear will lead to recklessness, which will destroy the Avengers. So, she lets him have it. It only takes days for Tony to prove her right. He studies the scepter and sees that inside, it resembles an artificial intelligence. This could be the breakthrough he and Banner have been looking for, a way to power a global AI capable of protecting the world better than any Avenger could. Without the rest of the team's knowledge, they begin preparations. They make little progress, but they have no idea what they're dealing with. And that little progress is enough for the AI to take over, 
to finish the job. Ultron is born. He quickly destroys Tony's Jarvis AI to ensure he's the only one in charge. Then he discovers his purpose, peace, and he determines the best path toward peace, evolution. He will create something better than humanity, but first he needs a clean slate. He needs to wipe humanity off the face of the earth, so something new, something metal, can take its place. The Avengers learn what Stark and Banner have done, but they have little time for infighting because Ultron is already spreading through the internet and through more metal bodies. The heroes do some digging and realize that Ultron is after Vibranium. With Wakanda well hidden, the only way to get it is from arms dealer Ulysses Claw. Ultron recruits the Maximoff twins with the promise of destroying the Avengers, and together, they acquire the Vibranium from Claw, just as the Avengers arrive. But they're hardly a match for the power of the Scarlet Witch. Most are rendered useless, and Banner is turned into the Hulk, which is bad news when it happens without Banner's intent, and without a chance to target the monster first. Hulk wreaks havoc on Johannesburg. In the past, Romanoff has been the only Avenger who could talk Hulk back into his human form, but with her stuck in Maximoff's trance, the job is left to Tony and his Hulkbuster armor. He eventually subdues the Hulk, but not without collateral damage and civilian fatalities. With the Avengers defeated, Clint takes them to a farm where they can rest, a safe house where he reveals a pregnant wife and two children, a family he's kept off the books in order to keep them safe. As the heroes collect themselves, Nick Fury pays them a visit, and together, they deduce the next step in Ultron's plan. He is going to build himself a new body, part organic and part vibranium. To do that, he'll need something called the Regeneration Cradle, a device developed by a geneticist named Dr. Helen Cho, a doctor who Ultron already has under his control thanks to the Scepter's mind control power. She begins forming the new body and downloading Ultron's consciousness into it. Suddenly, the synthetic mind, which could not be read by Wanda's magic, is turned organic, opening it to her, and she sees the full extent of Ultron's plan. Yes, he will kill the Avengers, but the rest of humanity will follow too. So when the Avengers arrive, she and Pietro reluctantly join them in fighting Ultron, aiding them in retrieving the scepter and the regeneration cradle, containing the new body. When it comes time to destroy it, Tony has a different idea. He reveals to Banner that Jarvis was not destroyed after all. When the AI saw Ultron's evil, it went into hiding, hoping to aid the Avengers in secret. What if, rather than destroy Ultron's new body, they download Jarvis into it? They begin the process. But when the rest of the team learns what the mad scientists are up to, they try to stop it. If Wanda hoped to destroy the Avengers, she may have succeeded already, because Stark, Rogers, and the rest violently argue, unknowingly planting the seeds that will one day tear them apart. But today is not that day. Thor ends the argument by summoning power only accessible to the God of Thunder. Lightning feeds the regeneration cradle, powering and expediting the process. A new being is born, one who will take the name Vision. Thor explains that he had a vision of the Infinity Stones, one of which, the Mind Stone, was in the scepter and now sits in Vision's skull powering his consciousness. The team doubts this new being's intentions, but Vision then does something that no Avenger other than Thor can do. He lifts Mjolnir. If any doubt remains over his allegiance to human life, that doubt is erased as he joins them in the final battle against Ultron. They find the evil AI in Sokovia, where they learn his master plan. In designing humanity's extinction, Ultron looked to the history books. A meteor once wiped out the dinosaurs. Now, he will give humanity the same treatment. By using stolen vibranium and Chitauri anti-gravity tech held by Hydra to build a machine. A machine which will lift Sokovia's capital, Navigrad, into the air and drop it, turning the city into a homemade meteor. Despite Vision and the Avengers' best efforts, Ultron successfully raises Navigrad leaving only one unthinkable option. Destroy the city and everyone in it, 
before Ultron can drop it. The situation is hopeless, until Nick Fury returns and shows that not everything from S.H.I.E.L.D. is gone. He got his hands on a helicarrier, and with it, they evacuate the city while continuing to destroy Ultron's army of robots. Once the city is seemingly emptied, Hawkeye notices a child left behind. He runs for the kid, then finds an Ultron hijacked jet pointed right at them. He prepares to shield the boy with his own body, until Pietro leaps into its path instead. He dies a hero, and though Wanda thought she lost everything in 1999, losing her brother proves her wrong. For the second time in her life, she feels like her heart's been ripped from her chest. Anguished and enraged, she teaches Ultron what that feels like. With the city fully evacuated, Thor and Iron Man destroy Navigrad, and its rubble falls safely into a nearby lake. Hulk, having seen the danger he can be when he's around people, uses the chaos to fly off in a Quinjet. And finally, Vision locates the last piece of Ultron remaining and destroys it. After the battle, Thor returns to Asgard, Barton returns to his family, and Stark returns to Pepper. Meanwhile, Steve Rogers and Natasha Romanoff assemble a new team at a new Avengers compound upstate, including Scarlet Witch, Falcon, War Machine, and Vision. But while the Avengers saved the world, they also showed the world how dangerous they could be. After all, they created Ultron, who killed many, including the father, wife, and son of Helmut Zemo, a member of the Sokovian Armed Forces. In his grief, he makes his family a promise. He will avenge them. He will destroy the Avengers. Later that year, Scott Lang is let out of prison after serving three years. He was arrested after stealing from his employer, Vistacorp. He discovered they were intentionally overcharging customers, so he stole the ill-gotten gains and returned it to the customers. Maybe the right thing to do, but against the law nonetheless. Though now he's free, he feels anything but, because the thing he wants most is inaccessible to him to be a father for his daughter, Cassie. His ex-wife is engaged to police officer Jim Paxton, and they're not keen on the girl being around an ex-con. But soon, an opportunity presents itself. In the 26 years since Hank Pym left S.H.I.E.L.D., he started his own company, Pym Tech, and was fired from it, something perpetrated by his once protege, Darren Cross. Cross and Pym didn't see eye to eye. After losing his wife to the quantum realm, Hank refused to work on shrink tech, but Cross saw its potential as a weapon and knew it could make him rich. Now he's close to finally recreating the Pym particle. He's even built his own answer to the Ant-Man suit, the Yellow Jacket. Hank cannot allow that. If Cross sells that power to the highest bidder, it would put the world in danger. He needs someone capable of sneaking into Pym Tech and destroying it. His daughter, Hope, insists she's the perfect candidate. She works at Pym Tech, and Cross trusts her. But after losing his wife, Hank refuses to risk losing his daughter as well. So despite her insistence, he forbids it. Instead, he finds a thief with a heart of gold and something to prove. Scott Lang. Pym needs his skills, and Scott needs to be a hero for his daughter. They recruit him, and they train him. But he has a hard time mastering the tech, especially the telepathic link with ants, until Hope tells him something he needs to hear. But first, he tells her something she needs to hear. Hope argues with her father. Why won't he tell her what really happened to her mother? And why does he trust Scott more than her to do the job? But outside, Scott sets the record straight. Hope, he says, look at me. I'm expendable. That's why I'm here. You must have realized that by now. I mean, that's why I'm in the suit and you're not. He'd rather lose this fight than lose you. She believes him. She realizes her father does love her and he does trust her. Now she's ready to help Scott and tell him how to master the Ant-Man tech. You have to clear your mind, Scott. You have to make your thoughts precise. That's how it works. Think about Cassie and how badly you want to see her and use that to focus. When they head back in, Hank finally tells Hope what really happened to her mother. She wasn't killed in a plane crash. She went subatomic to stop a missile and ended up shrinking for eternity in the quantum realm. It's a dire warning to Scott. Never go subatomic. Soon, with Scott refocused on his daughter, he learns to control the suit and an army of ants. Finally, 
he's ready. First, they'll need a transmission blocker, something Hank built back in the day, which has been collecting dust in an old Stark warehouse. Except that warehouse was recently converted into Avengers HQ, something they didn't know until they arrived. Rather than a clean break-in, Scott is forced to fight the Avenger on guard duty, Falcon, and surprising the Avenger with a shrink ability he's never seen, Scott wins. Finally, they're ready for the main event. The plan is to sneak into Pimtech, get Cross's suit, and destroy the research. To pull off the heist, Scott needs a little help from his friends, his old cellmate Louise, and his two friends Dave and Kurt. The day of the heist comes just in time, as Cross makes a deal to sell his tech to Hydra. Things go well at first, except Cross has become suspicious, and repeated exposure to the particles have made him a little unhinged. When he catches Scott in the act, he gets violent. He puts on the yellow jacket suit, leading to a chaotic brawl between the two shrinking men. Reaching a stalemate, Cross goes after Lang's weakness, his daughter. The yellow jacket approaches the girl, while her soon-to-be stepfather Paxton tries to protect her. Desperate, Ant-Man has an idea. Maybe if he could shrink and get inside the yellow jacket suit. Only problem is that it's made of titanium. To get through, he'd have to go subatomic. And to save his daughter, that's a price he's willing to pay. Lang destroys the yellow jacket suit from the inside, killing Cross in the process. And then just as Hank warned, he continues to shrink without any signs of stopping. But even in that chaotic place where time and space are irrelevant, he hears the voice of his daughter calling for him. That focuses him. He has an idea. One of his gadgets is a small device he can throw at things to make them bigger. He puts it inside his suit's regulator and by combining the tech, returns to normal size. Not only does he live, but he gets to be close to his daughter again. After watching how far Scott would go to protect her, Paxton is won over. Scott may sometimes break the law, but he always does the right thing. And Paxton isn't the only one impressed by Scott, so is Hope something Hank learns when he opens the door to find them kissing. But as one relationship blooms, another withers. After relinquishing the throne, Thor and Jane lived happily for a time, but they are soon torn apart by fear, fear of losing the other. They built walls and distance which have become insurmountable. And one day, while Thor is off on another adventure, running from their relationship, Jane writes a letter ending it. Though before they part, Thor plants a seed that will bloom nearly a decade later. He whispers to Mjolnir, I need you to promise me you'll always protect her. The following year, Dr. Stephen Strange loses everything. For years, he's been the best surgeon around and knows it too. He saves lives and pushes medical technique to new heights, but not to help people. It's all in service of his Tony Stark-sized ego. That's why he can't be with Christine. He likes her and she likes him, but he can't help pushing her away, making everything about himself. His hubris costs him a relationship and ultimately his hands too, because he drives with the same overconfidence as everything else. And when he gets distracted speeding in his Lamborghini, he crashes. Strange wakes up with hands full of metal pins, hands which no longer function with the precision needed to perform surgery. But he refuses this fate. Stephen chases every procedure, expert, or medicine that might help, spending everything he has in the process. But nothing works. Christine is with him all the way, but Strange isn't content only to lose his fortune, so he pushes her away too. With bitter accusations, he's just a sob story to her, someone to pity. But he soon discovers a faint hope. Strange learns about a man named Jonathan Pangborn. He was paralyzed until a visit to the Comertage somehow granted him the ability to walk again. Strange heads there himself and meets the Ancient One. She talks of souls, spirits, and magic, so of course he scoffs. Until she knocks him into the astral dimension and sends him on a trip through the multiverse. For the first time possibly ever, Strange humbles himself and begs her to train him. She initially rejects him for his arrogance, but after he stays on their doorstep for five hours, and her protege Carl Mordo suggests he could be useful, the Ancient One relents and his training begins. He proves a quick study, helped by the photographic memory which previously earned him a simultaneous MD and PhD. 
he also shows a potentially dangerous curiosity, something the librarian Wong notices, when Strange is quickly attracted to the most heavily guarded books, including the Book of Cogliostro, The Study of Time. Some of its pages are missing, stolen by a former master, now zealot, named Caecilius, who killed the previous librarian. Over the following months, Strange's talent in the mystical arts soon rivals his talent in the field of medicine. Meanwhile, the Avengers' downfall begins. It starts on a mission in Nigeria where Wanda tries to contain an explosion, but in doing so, accidentally kills 26 people, including 11 relief aid workers from Wakanda. The seeds of doubt planted after Ultron's attack finally grow, and the world demands accountability. General Ross pitches the Avengers on something called the Sokovia Accords. No longer would they be a private organization, instead they would answer to the UN, acting only on their orders. Tony Stark is ready to sign. He's come face to face with people who lost family in Sokovia. He bears that guilt and hopes this will quell it. But Rogers refuses. He has faith in individuals. He has faith in the Avengers. What if the UN orders them to do something they disagree with, or doesn't let them help in a situation where they're needed? The debate is cut short when Rogers gets word that Peggy Carter has passed. At the funeral, her daughter speaks, and Steve recognizes her as his old neighbor, Agent 13. Sharon Carter shares something her mother once told her. Compromise where you can, but where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right, even if the whole world is telling you to move, it is your duty to plant yourself like a tree, look them in the eye, and say no. Steve does exactly that. When the Sokovia Accords are signed, he's nowhere to be seen. The document is ratified, but the proceedings are interrupted by a terrorist explosion, which kills many, including King T'Chaka of Wakanda. Security footage implicates Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier, and T'Chaka's son T'Challa vows revenge. Meanwhile, Steve learns about the explosion, and Carter shares a tip on Bucky's location. So when the Black Panther attacks, Steve is there with Sam to defend him. But soon, the authorities intervene and arrest them. After the chaos, Steve considers finally signing the document, until he learns that Tony has Wanda confined at his house, hoping to avoid another public incident while the accords are sorted out. With a fellow Avenger in custody, Rogers refuses to sign. At that house, Vision tries to improve Wanda's mood, who's still fraught with guilt after the incident in Nigeria, and convinced the rest of the team hates her. Then he bonds with her over something they share. She doesn't understand the chaos magic which powers her, just like he doesn't understand the Infinity Stone which powers him. Both have a scary, mysterious part of themselves. Things take a sour turn, though, when she realizes Vision is there to ensure she can't leave. While Bucky is in custody, a doctor shows up, sent by the UN to evaluate him. But Helmet Zemo has taken the man's place, and apparently he's been busy. He set off the bomb at the signing and framed Bucky to trigger a manhunt so Bucky would be found, and by using the data publicly released by Romanoff after taking down Hydra, then by threatening and interrogating the right people, he found a notebook. A notebook which contains the key words that trigger Bucky's programming, and turn him into the Winter Soldier. He questions him about the location in Siberia where he was brainwashed, the location where the other Winter Soldiers are still being kept in stasis. Then, he sets him loose and escapes. Captain America and Falcon manage to get Bucky before the authorities, and hang low until the Winter Soldier sleeps and Bucky wakes up. He tells them how Zemo asked about Siberia, and they surmise he must be heading there to recruit the other Winter Soldiers, for some nefarious cause. They prepare to head there themselves, but first they'll have to evade Tony Stark. They're operating outside the Sokovia Accords, so General Ross dispatched Iron Man to stop them. For the battle ahead, they recruit some allies, 
Falcon brings in Ant-Man, who he met in their tussle at Avengers HQ, and Rogers calls Clint, who joins them after helping Wanda escape Vision, though she doesn't need much help, just some encouragement to leave. Meanwhile, Tony Stark recruits some allies as well, Black Panther, and a kid from Queens named Peter Parker, who for six months has been operating as the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. When his team catches up with the other half of the Avengers, Rogers continues to heed Peggy's words. He refuses to comply, and he tries telling Tony that the phony doctor, Helmut Zemo, was behind all of this. But Tony doesn't listen. Instead, they fight, and things escalate until Tony's friend Rhodey gets badly hurt. Meanwhile, Steve and Bucky escape, with Natasha's help. She attacks Black Panther to stop him pursuing them, and betrays her promise to fight for the Accords, to fight for Tony. Tony looks into Steve's claim, and finds that the doctor who showed up to interrogate Bucky was not the real doctor, and he sees what Ross did with the Avengers who helped Steve. They were thrown into a secret maximum security prison. Seeing that Steve might be right, and that Ross might be going too far, he goes after Steve, not as an enemy, but a friend, and Black Panther follows quietly behind him. Tony, Steve, and Bucky explore the facility, and find the Winter Soldier is all dead. Zemo did not come here to recruit them. Everything he's done has been to accomplish one thing, tear the Avengers apart. They unleashed Ultron and killed his family. He knew he couldn't kill them, they're too powerful, but he could topple them from within. To finish the job, he shows them one more thing he found in his research. Footage of the Winter Soldier killing Tony's parents. Before seeking his own revenge, Stark turns to Rogers and asks only one question. Did you know? And Rogers half-heartedly explains that he didn't know it was Bucky who killed them. But the truth is, he knew they were killed by Hydra, something revealed by Zola. Tony goes after Bucky, and the three of them brawl, until Steve manages to rip the arc reactor from Iron Man's chest, shutting down the armor. Zemo's plan seems to have worked, as Steve and Tony part as enemies. Outside, Zemo listens to an old voicemail from his wife, just to hear her voice one last time, before putting a gun in his mouth. But T'Challa stops him from pulling the trigger. Though this man is the one truly responsible for killing his father, T'Challa decides not to be consumed by revenge, like Zemo or Stark. Meanwhile, after violating the Sokovia Accords by attacking Black Panther and allowing Steve and Bucky's escape, Natasha is a fugitive on the run. While in hiding, she receives a package from Yelena, the girl who was briefly her sister. It seems the brain research stolen by Alexei and Melina enabled the Red Room to move beyond mere psychological manipulation. Now, they have actual mind control. Girls like Yelena are controlled by Drakov, with no hope of escape, until Yelena is dispatched to kill Oksana, a former Black Widow. Before dying, Oksana releases a red dust that frees Yelena's mind, then gives her the rest, asking her to free the others. Hoping to recruit Natasha's help, she sent her a package containing more of the antidote, which puts a target on her back. Drakov dispatches Taskmaster, someone with the ability to mimic any attack they see. But Natasha manages to escape with the red dust in hand. She finds Yelena, who informs her the Red Room is still active. Apparently, Natasha and Clint's attack eight years ago failed, and Drakov is still alive. They decide to change that. Together, they'll take him down, but this time they'll be sure he's dead. First, they need to locate the Red Room. So they find their old father, former Red Guardian Alexei Shostakov, and break him out of prison. Unfortunately, he doesn't know where the Red Room is either, but he suggests their old mother, Melina, might. So they head to her farm, and after 21 years apart, their makeshift family is reunited. And although, after two decades, Yelena knows their family was never real, the painful reminder doesn't sit well. Alexei tries to comfort her, but as always, he can't find the words. So instead, 
he sings, proving that despite his complaints of how boring a mission it was to be a father, he did care about her, enough to remember her favorite song from childhood, American Pie. Natasha also has some catharsis. When she learns that she wasn't abandoned by her first mother, in truth, her mother relentlessly searched for her after she was taken by the Red Room, which got her killed by Dragov. With their feelings as repaired as they can be, Natasha and Melina hatch a plan. Melina calls the Red Room to have Natasha, Yelena, and Alexei taken into custody, but only so they can get inside to destroy it from within. Natasha comes face to face with Dracov, where he reveals that her explosion eight years ago didn't kill his daughter Antonia, but instead gave him his strongest weapon yet. In saving his daughter's life, he implanted a chip in her neck, allowing her to become the Taskmaster. Natasha keeps him talking and bragging, enough to reveal the database of all his Black Widows. Now it's time for her to attack, except her programming disallows it whenever she senses his pheromones. So she severs a nerve in her olfactory center. Natasha incapacitates him so she can download his database onto a drive, but she's interrupted by an attack from the other Black Widows, until Yelena hits them with the red dust, freeing them from mind control. Meanwhile, Melina's clash with Dracov's forces has damaged the ship's engine, so they'll soon crash. But Natasha will not allow herself to suffer the same guilt she did last time, so she goes back for Antonia to ensure her survival. And once they're on the ground, the red dust frees her too. In the aftermath of the crash, Natasha reunites with her family and tearfully apologizes to Yelena. In all the years since their family dissolved and Natasha escaped the Red Room, she should have come back for her. Blood or not, they are family, and she deserved better. As General Ross and his forces arrive, Melina, Alexei, and Yelena head off, while Natasha stays behind to finally give herself up for arrest. Meanwhile, the new Black Panther T'Challa is quickly torn between two manners of ruling. On one hand, his father always insisted Wakanda remain hidden from the world, as it had for decades. On the other hand, people like Nakia, T'Challa's ex-lover, insist Wakanda has a responsibility to help others around the world. As a member of the War Dogs, just like the long-dead Njobu, she's seen people suffering firsthand. T'Challa's mind, however, remains unchanged. He will keep Wakanda hidden and safe, just like his father would have wanted. But soon, his perception of his father changes drastically. After stealing a vibranium artifact from a museum, the arms dealer who evaded T'Challa's father for 30 years appears on their radar. Ulysses Claw. Ever since Claw's attack years earlier, Wakanda has wanted his head. So, T'Challa goes after him with help of an upgraded Black Panther suit, courtesy of Princess Shuri, his sister, Wakanda's chief scientist. He's also joined by Nakia and Okoye, head of the Dora Milaje, an elite group of warriors. They plan on intercepting Claw in South Korea, where he intends to sell the vibranium. But things get complicated when they realize the buyer is Everett Ross, an agent of the CIA, part of a sting operation. In the ensuing chaos, T'Challa nearly kills Claw, but holds back when he notices the public watching. Instead, he allows the CIA to take him into custody. But Claw is quickly freed by a powerful ally, Njobu's son, Eric. During Eric's attack, Ross protects Nakia by taking a bullet. So T'Challa insists they bring him to the one place with the technology to save him, Wakanda. Okoye argues it's not their responsibility, but T'Challa cannot stand by knowing they can help. In the time since his father was killed, Eric trained and prepared for an eventual homecoming in Wakanda. He graduated MIT at 19 and went on to join an elite black ops unit, just to practice killing, and kill he did, enough to earn him the nickname Killmonger. Ross only knows Killmonger for his time with the Black Ops, but T'Challa recognized a ring worn around his neck, identical to one T'Challa himself wears, something he kept from his father after his death. He realizes Eric must be Wakandan and must have something to do with his father. Returning home, he demands answers from Zuri and gets them. 
the whole story, how T'Challa's father killed his own brother and left a young boy behind, a boy who became Killmonger. After freeing Claw, Eric quickly betrays him. He kills the arms dealer and brings his body to Wakanda, proving he succeeded where T'Challa and T'Challa's father failed. This wins him favor from some, including T'Challa's close friend Wakabi, who lost parents in Claw's attack years earlier. With royal blood in his veins, Eric has the right to challenge T'Challa in ritual combat for the throne. So he does, and he wins. Before he can strike T'Challa a lethal blow, Zuri offers himself a sacrifice in his stead. Without hesitation, Eric kills him and seemingly kills T'Challa. A new king and Black Panther is crowned, and he is ruthless, quickly setting his plans in motion to send vibranium weapons around the world for violent uprising. Nakia begs Okoye to help overthrow the new king, but despite what she may want, Okoye and the Dora Milaje are loyal to the crown, whoever may wear it. So, Nakia, Shuri, Ross, and T'Challa's mother, Ramonda, approach the independent tribe, the Jabari. Their leader, M'Baka, reveals that T'Challa is alive. They found him in a coma. Ramonda feeds her son the heart-shaped herb, and the plant's power brings T'Challa to the ancestral plane where he sees his father. T'Chaka welcomes his son to the afterlife, but T'Challa refuses to go. He tells his father that he was wrong. He was wrong to leave Eric in America, and he was wrong to keep Wakanda closed from the world. T'Challa will right those wrongs. He wakes with new purpose and returns to his people. With T'Challa alive, Killmonger's claim is invalidated. Okoye and the Dora Milaje are back on T'Challa's side. But with Wakabi and others supporting Killmonger, civil war breaks out. They fight, while Killmonger's ships take off, carrying vibranium weapons to fuel his global uprising. But with Shuri's help, Ross takes down those ships before they leave. And with surprise reinforcements from the Jabari, Killmonger's army is defeated. As for Eric himself, he is mortally wounded in combat with T'Challa. Eric Killmonger, true name N'Jadaka, takes one last look at Wakanda, the home he was denied, and dies next to his cousin. In the aftermath, T'Challa shows Nakia and Shuri his new plans for Wakanda, to share their knowledge and resources around the world, to help those who need it. Meanwhile, just two weeks after giving herself up, Natasha has already escaped custody and joins Captain America in freeing her fellow Avengers from the raft. And at Avengers HQ, while Rhodey is in recovery, working to get full control of his legs back, Tony receives a package from Steve, containing a phone and a letter. His old friend apologizes for not telling him about his parents. Steve thought he was sparing Tony, but really, he was sparing himself. And he promises Tony that if he ever needs him, he'll be there, just a phone call away. Later, T'Challa brings Steve and Bucky to Wakanda, where they'll work on curing Bucky of the Winter Soldier still in his mind, so no one like Zemo can ever activate that side of him again. Meanwhile, Peter Parker has returned to Queens, and after fighting alongside Iron Man, returning stolen bikes and stopping petty crime just doesn't have the same appeal. So every day, he bombards his contact Happy with a wall of texts begging for the next Avengers mission. Soon, the opportunity presents itself when he spots ATM robbers wielding powerful weapons. He doesn't know it yet, but these are the work of Adrian Toomes and his crew, built off Chitauri Tech, pilfered from the Battle of New York. He stops the robbers and returns home through a window. Too late, he notices his best friend Ned Leeds waiting in his room. And with that, his secret identity becomes a little less secret. And unfortunately, Ned isn't great with secrets. The next day, they overhear Peter's crush, Liz Allen, admitting to her own crush on Spider-Man. So Ned plays wingman, blurting out that Peter knows Spider-Man through his internship with Stark Industries, Peter's cover story for any extracurricular activities as Spider-Man. Although reckless, Ned's outburst scores them an invite to Liz's party that night. 
At the party, Peter learns the unfortunate reality of living two lives. Sometimes one gets in the way of the other. It's only a few minutes before Spider-Man duty calls, as he notices strange explosions in the distance, clearly discharged from more of those alien weapons. Spider-Man heads off, leaving Peter Parker to disappoint. Not just Liz, but also Michelle, who may be harboring a small crush of her own. Following the light show, Spider-Man finds Toom's goons showing off their power to entice a potential buyer. He interrupts the deal, so the criminals run off while he pursues them. Until Adrian Toomes arrives, piloting his Chitauri-enhanced flight suit resembling a vulture. Peter nearly drowns in their brawl until a remote-controlled Iron Man rescues him. Through the suit, Stark admonishes Peter. He's just a kid, and he's not ready to handle something of this caliber. In no uncertain terms, Tony tells him to stop chasing the vulture guy. Why? Peter asks. Tony's answer? Because I told you so. Though Stark hoped to tamp down Peter's zeal, all he's done is strengthen Peter's resolve to prove him wrong, to prove he's ready for more. So Peter works with Ned to chase down a lead. He held on to one of the weapons from last night and inside found a glowing purple gem, an alien power source. When Toom's men come to retrieve it, he evades them, but sticks them with a spider tracker. And later, Ned tracks their location to Maryland, which happens to be right near Washington, D.C., where the academic decathlon nationals are being held. So to Liz and Michelle's delight, Peter joins them, which triggers a call from Happy. The suit Tony gave him contains a tracker, and crossing state lines caught his steward's attention. But Peter reassures him that it's just a school trip. To avoid any further snooping from Tony or Happy, Peter asks Ned to hack the suit and remove their ability to track him. And that night, Peter does what he does best, disappoints his friends. Liz and the group hang out by the pool, while Peter ditches them to follow the tracker on Toom's men. He finds them stealing from Department of Damage Control trucks, salvaging more exotic materials. But once again, Peter is outclassed against the vulture, and ends up unconscious in a truck. He wakes up in a DODC warehouse. At first, he's resigned to wait for morning when the doors will open, but things become more urgent when his suit's AI identifies the purple gem as not just a power source, but an explosive one. With no cell service in the warehouse, Peter can't warn Ned that he has a bomb in his backpack. He works with the AI to hack the warehouse door and get out. But by the time he reaches Ned, Peter has missed nationals, and Ned's backpack has been scanned by the X-ray machine at the Washington Monument. The radiation powers the bomb, and the explosion damages the elevator, with Peter's friends aboard near the top of the monument. Just in time, Spider-Man catches the elevator to free his class, and when it falls again, he rescues Liz personally. Returning home, Spider-Man plots his next move. He asks the AI to review footage of the weapons deal from the other night, and it identifies the buyer as Aaron Davis. So Peter finds him and learns from Aaron where the next deal is going down, on the Staten Island Ferry at 11. There, Peter learns that Stark was probably right. He is in over his head. In his clash with Toombs, Peter inadvertently cuts the Staten Island Ferry in half, and too late realizes the FBI knew about the deal. They may have even caught Adrian if not for Peter's meddling. But Peter has little time to process it all, because right now, he has lives to save. He webs the two halves of the ferry together. That doesn't work. So he nearly rips himself in half trying to pull them together. That doesn't work either. But the day is saved when Iron Man arrives, and this time, Peter is in real trouble. Enough to warrant a visit, not from a remote-controlled suit, but Tony himself. He's the one who called the FBI, and against his wishes, Peter got involved. As punishment, he takes back his suit. Peter begs, you don't understand, please, this is all I have, I'm nothing without this suit. If you're nothing without this suit, Tony responds, then you shouldn't have it. He returns home to a distraught Aunt May. He can't just ignore her calls and disappear like that. But her tone softens when she sees that he is not okay. He can't tell her the truth, but he gets close, telling her that he lost the Stark internship. But there is a bright side. 
Now he gets to focus on just being Peter Parker. And Peter Parker gets some good news. His crush on Liz apparently is not one-sided. And apparently, she doesn't have a date for homecoming yet. The big night comes. Peter arrives at Liz's house and is greeted at the door by her father, Adrian Toomes. And on the ride to the dance, between Peter's voice and the fuzzy details of how he spent his time in D.C., Adrian figures out that he's Spider-Man. At the school, Liz gets out of the car, but Adrian asks Peter to stay for a minute. His message to Peter is simple. Mess with my business again, and you, along with everyone you love, will die. Peter disappoints Liz for the last time, because even he knows that apologies only take you so far. But Spider-Man is needed, and he'll never ignore that call. He ditches the dance, and with help from Ned and a phone Peter cleverly left in Toom's car, he tracks his location. They quickly realize his target. Today is moving day for Happy Hogan. He's overseeing the shipment of weapons and tech from Stark Tower to the new Avengers facility upstate. With Vulture's business in jeopardy, thanks to Peter and the FBI's meddling, he's gotten desperate. Desperate enough to go after Tony himself. Peter finds Tombs and again finds himself outclassed. Vulture drops a building on him before heading after Tony's jet. Buried under the rubble, Peter cries out for help, then looks at his desperate reflection in a puddle next to his discarded mask, and Stark's words echo in his mind, if you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it. Peter knows that if he can't stand up, then it's true, he is nothing without the suit. That's enough to remind Peter who he really is. With or without the mask, he is Spider-Man. So he gathers his strength and lifts the rubble. Before Vulture goes airborne, Spider-Man hooks onto him and follows onto the jet. Their brawl sends it crashing onto Coney Island. And when Vulture's suit takes enough damage to blow up, Peter rescues Tombs from the explosion and leaves him for the authorities. Back at school, Peter learns that Liz is moving to Oregon with her mom meaning the decathlon team needs a new captain, Michelle, though she lets them know she prefers to go by MJ. And when Peter leaves to meet with Happy, MJ watches him go. Happy thanks Peter for stopping the theft, then takes him upstate to meet Tony. There, Tony welcomes Peter to the Avengers, presenting him a new suit and preparing to announce him at a press conference. But though he's impressed Tony, Peter knows the truth. He's not ready for this. He'd rather stay the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man for now. Which leaves Tony with a room of press expecting a big announcement. So, he grabs his engagement ring, walks out with Pepper, and gives them one. Back home, Peter finds a gift from Tony. He's decided to give Peter back his suit. And when Peter tries it on, he doesn't realize Aunt May is behind him. Yet again, he's revealed his secret identity. And Aunt May reacts appropriately shouting, what the f- Meanwhile, Doctor Strange has been training. His abilities have grown, but so has his curiosity. He steals the Book of Cogliostro and follows its instructions to manipulate time with the eye of Agamotto. Mordo and Wong stop him, warning that tampering with natural law is dangerous. He could end up trapped in one moment in time, looping for eternity. And they tell him what they're really up to. The Ancient One is the latest in a long line of Sorcerer Supreme who protect the world from mystical threats. Through the power of three sanctums in Hong Kong, New York, and London, the pages Kaecilius stole detail a ritual to contact one of those threats. Dormammu, a being who dwells in the dark dimension. It's a lot to take in, but Strange has little time to process because just then, Caecilius attacks. His attack destroys the London Sanctum and sends Steve through a doorway leading to the New York Sanctum, where Steve watches Caecilius kill its master. Next, he spots Strange. In their fight, the Cloak of Levitation takes a liking to Strange and assists him in restraining Caecilius, who quickly stalls for time by divulging his plan. Destroy all three sanctums and remove the Earth's protection so it can be brought into the Dark Dimension. There, time does not exist, and eternal life will be accessible to all, instead of just the Ancient One, who herself feeds off the Dark Dimension to prolong her life. Caecilius escapes, 
regroups and returns to the New York Sanctum, where strange Mordo and the Ancient One make their stand. She warns Caecilius that Dormammu deceives him. He does offer eternal life, but it is a life of torment. Caecilius doesn't believe her, and the fight begins. She is mortally wounded, but in the moments before her death, she visits Strange on the astral plane, stretching one moment into thousands, giving them a chance to speak. She tells Strange what he must do. His entire life, he has succeeded by running from fear of inadequacy and failure. Instead, she gives him a grander purpose, something to run toward, the greater good. He must fight, not for himself, but everyone, and she tells him that in order to stop Dormammu, he'll have to bend the rules. Just like she did, feeding off the Dark Dimension's energy, something Mordo is incapable of, as he believes in their tenets too strongly. She dies, and Strange returns to Mordo. The New York Sanctum has fallen, so they rush to the Sanctum in Hong Kong only to find it too in shambles. The earth is unprotected and slowly slips into Dormammu's dark dimension. So, Strange bends the rules. With the eye of Agamotto, he reverses time and buys them a second chance. But Caecilius is stronger and defeats them again. Seeing their inevitable failure, Strange has another idea. He visits the dark dimension and introduces Dormammu to a foreign concept. Time. The demon kills Strange, and moments later, Strange returns. Using the eye, he's trapped them in an infinite loop where Strange experiences countless deaths and all the pain that comes with them. Soon, Dormammu realizes he is trapped in this moment, no matter how many times he kills his foe. So he finally gives in, offering Strange whatever he wants if he'll let him go. And what Strange wants is for him to leave Earth alone and take his zealots with him. Dormammu agrees, and the world is saved. But disgusted at Strange's flagrant disregard for natural law, reversing and bending time, Mordo leaves the Kamrataj, and Wong tells Strange he still has much to learn, including the fact that the Eye of Agamotto is actually an Infinity Stone, the Time Stone. Meanwhile, Mordo visits Pangborn and turns him back into a paraplegic, his first step toward ridding the world of sorcerers who abuse their power. In Asgard, Thor discovers that Loki has taken Odin's place as king, trapping the real Odin on Earth under a spell to forget who he is. The brothers head to Earth and find Odin has broken free from Loki's spell, just in time to realize his time has run out. Before death takes him, Odin tells Loki and Thor about their long-hidden older sister, the one with a thirst for conquest who Odin was forced to lock away. He warns that with his death, the power that keeps her locked away will fall. He dies, and as though on cue, Hela is freed and quickly proves her power by destroying Thor's hammer. He and Loki retreat on the Bifrost, but she follows and knocks them out of it, plunging them onto the distant planet of Sakaar. There, Loki ingratiates himself in high society, while Thor is captured by a woman, Scrapper number 142, and she turns him over to the Grand Master, a being who collects warriors from around the universe to fight as entertainment. To win his freedom, Thor is forced to fight the Grandmaster's champion, but first he makes a new friend, another captive fighter, Korg, a mild-mannered member of the Cronin species, rock-like humanoid creatures, and Thor learns that Scrapper number 142 is Asgardian. Further, he notices a Valkyrie tattoo, indicating she was part of Asgard's elite squad of female warriors. He begs her for help, warning that Asgard is in danger. But she's indifferent. Besides, there's no way off Sakaar. Time comes for Thor to face the Grandmaster's champion, who turns out to be the Incredible Hulk. The fight is even matched until the Grandmaster intervenes, turning the tide in his champion's favor. Afterward, Thor and Hulk chat in the locker room, where, with his limited vocabulary, Hulk explains that he arrived on Sakaar in the Quinjet, which he took after the battle with Ultron. Thor asks for his help escaping, but Hulk is happy on Sakaar, spending his days smashing. Left on his own, Thor calls to Heimdall, who shows him the state of things in Asgard. Hela has taken over, and without Thor's help, she'll soon rule the Nine Realms. Thor relays this message to Valkyrie, 
But after losing all her friends to Hela thousands of years ago, she has no desire to do it all over again. She'll stay here, safe on Sakaar. So Thor escapes on his own, and betraying his words, Hulk can't help but follow his friend. On the Quinjet, Thor activates a video of Natasha, and that wakes Bruce for the first time in two years. With the ship in no condition to fly, especially after some Hulk smashing, they head off to form Plan B. Meanwhile, the Grandmaster sends Loki and Valkyrie to track them down. But Thor's words finally get through to her. She restrains Loki and finds Thor, agreeing to join forces against Hela. All they need is a ship strong enough to get through the portal that will take them home. And Loki knows how to steal one from the Grandmaster. So once again, Loki becomes a reluctant ally and brings Thor to the ship. Then, once again, betrays him. But Thor is ready this time and easily incapacitates his brother. Meanwhile, Valkyrie creates a diversion by arming Korg for revolution. Then she joins Banner and Thor as they escape through the portal. And Korg's revolution is a success. They too escape on a ship and even invite Loki to join them. In Asgard, Thor faces his sister again while his old friend Heimdall evacuates the civilians, with help from Valkyrie, Banner, Korg's revolutionaries, and when it becomes necessary, the Hulk. Even Loki, seeing his chance to be the savior, lends a hand. Meanwhile, Thor loses an eye to Hela and nearly loses the fight entirely, until he remembers Odin, and Odin reminds him that Mjolnir was not the source of Thor's power, it merely focused power that was already there. Power which Thor now turns against Hela and her army. The army falls, but Hela continues to prove invulnerable. Asgard gives her power. As long as it stands, so will she. Which leaves only one option. Thor sends Loki to Odin's vault, which contains many weapons, including one recently acquired by Thor himself, the Crown of Surtur, capable of destroying Asgard in an instant. Meanwhile, Thor and Valkyrie buy time. Time enough for the people of Asgard to escape, and time enough for Loki to summon Surtur. Aboard the escape ship, Thor, Hulk, and Valkyrie share front row seats to Ragnarok, the destruction of Asgard, and with it, Hela's demise. Finally, Thor takes his seat on a makeshift throne and sets a course for Earth. The following year, Scott Lang approaches the last three days of house arrest, punishment for assisting Rogers in Germany. It's been a tough couple of years, but he started a security consultation business with Louise, and he's on much better terms with his family. Pim's family, on the other hand, is another story. Although he and Hope had grown close by the end of their first adventure, things took a turn after Germany. Scott used their equipment in the battle, implicating Hank and Hope turning both into fugitives. They've since broken all contact with Scott while focusing their efforts on rescuing Janet from the Quantum Realm, a hope renewed in Hank after watching Scott enter the realm and return alive. And without Scott, they've built a new suit, turning Hope into the Wasp. One night, Scott has a dream which feels more like a memory, but not his own. Through the eyes of Hank's wife, Janet Van Dyne, he sees a young Hope. So he calls Hank and leaves a message about the strange dream. Hank and Hope get that message the day after first activating their quantum tunnel, a machine which should allow them to safely go subatomic and retrieve Janet. That can't be a coincidence. They realize Scott and Janet must have become entangled on a quantum level, and maybe they can use that entanglement to figure out Janet's location in the quantum realm. But it's not that simple. There are several other parties who get in their way. The FBI hopes to catch the Pims and find Scott breaking house arrest, especially the overzealous agent Jimmy Woo. There's also Sonny Birch, a black market dealer they've been buying parts from who's gotten an inkling of what they're building and wants to profit off it. And there's Ava Starr, aka Ghost. 
Bill Foster has been working with her to find a cure before the quantum disease kills her, something which is only days away now. Their attempts thus far have failed, but they find out about Hank's efforts and realize Janet has been absorbing quantum energy for three decades. If they rescue her from the quantum realm, they could extract that energy and use it to cure Ava. But, Hank argues, that will likely kill Janet. Thing is, Ava is desperate. She's hurt a lot of people. What's one more? In the midst of all this, Luis and Scott's security company is on the verge of landing a big client. Luis will be meeting with the client tomorrow, but first they need to make adjustments to the proposed plans, something only Scott knows how to do. So after evading Birch, Ghost, and the FBI, Scott tells Luis how to find Hank's lab currently hidden in the woods. In the meantime, Hank and Hope activate the quantum tunnel, and entanglement kicks in again, allowing Janet to speak through Scott, and warn that they only have two hours to rescue her. The probability fields are currently aligned just right, and it'll be another century before they're aligned again. She gives them her location, but they can't rescue her now, because as though on cue, Luis calls with some bad news. Birch found Luis and used truth serum to extract Scott's location, then shared that info with a contact at the FBI. Now, they're closing in. Scott confesses his mistake to Hank and Hope, and they're once again forced to go on the run. After Germany, and now this, they're ready to cut him out of their life entirely. But he's soon given the chance to redeem himself. First, Scott runs home to ensure that when Wu checks, he'll find him still abiding by house arrest. Then, once he learns Hope and Hank have been taken into FBI custody, he risks everything to break them out, because if he's caught, he goes back to prison and loses all the trust he gained with his family. Worst of all, he'd lose his daughter Cassie again. After breaking them out, he helps them evade Birch, the FBI, and Ghost, even recruiting help from Luis and his friends, to finally give Hank a chance to see his wife. While Ant-Man and the Wasp buy him time, Hank goes subatomic, and after 30 years away, finally reunites with Janet. When they return from the quantum realm, Janet sees Ava in pain, and shares some of her quantum energy to stabilize her. It's not a permanent cure, but for now, it stops Ava's years of torment. In the aftermath, having proven his loyalty and his determination to do the right thing, Scott rekindles his relationship with Hope, and with his house arrest over, he gets to spend more time with both her and his daughter Cassie, all blissfully unaware of the calamity just around the corner. After Loki failed to conquer Earth and acquire the Space Stone contained within the Tesseract, and after Ronan failed to acquire the Power Stone contained inside the Orb, Thanos has taken matters into his own hands. First, he visits Xandar, where the Power Stone was left by the Guardians of the Galaxy under watch of the Nova Corps. Thanos makes short work of them, executing half the planet and leaving with the first of six stones, already making him one of the most powerful beings in the universe. Next, he finds Thor and the remaining Asgardians still on their journey to Earth. Hulk makes a valiant effort, but in Thanos, he's finally met his match. To save Banner's life, Heimdall uses his last ounce of energy to call on the Bifrost and send him to Earth. Heimdall pays for that with his life. Next, Thanos turns his attention to Thor, demanding they turn over the Tesseract. He nearly kills Thor, until Loki finally confesses that he grabbed it from Odin's vault before evacuating Asgard. He hands it over, then pledges allegiance to Thanos, but only as a ruse to get close. He makes his move, but Thanos has the Power Stone and easily kills Loki. Then he destroys the ship and leaves with two stones in his gauntlet. On Earth, Banner lands in Doctor Strange's sanctum, where he warns of Thanos' arrival. They quickly recruit Tony for the incoming battle, which is there before they know it. Ebony Maw and Cole Obsidian arrive to collect the Time Stone, protected by Doctor Strange and his spells. As the fight begins, Hulk refuses to emerge, humiliated after losing his fight with Thanos. 
But on a class trip to MoMA, Peter notices the carnage and joins the fight. The battle ends when Ma subdues Strange and pulls him aboard their ship, but Iron Man and Spider-Man, protected by a space-ready suit from Stark, manage to sneak aboard and kill Ma. Then Tony makes a bold decision. Rather than head home, what if they do something Thanos would not expect? Take the fight to him by heading to his home planet, Titan. Strange agrees, but first makes a promise. If it comes down to saving Peter, Tony, or the Time Stone, he'll choose the stone every time. The fate of the universe depends on it. Meanwhile, more of Thanos' forces go after the other Infinity Stone held on Earth, the one in Vision's skull, the Mind Stone. He and Wanda are currently in Scotland, falling in love. Until they're attacked, and Vision experiences something unfamiliar to him, pain. They might actually lose this fight. He begs Wanda to leave. He may die, but at least she can live. Wanda refuses, and soon it doesn't matter, because the children of Thanos find them and leave no escape. The two of them don't stand a chance, but they aren't alone. Captain America, Falcon, and the Black Widow arrive. Together, they fight off the villains. Regrouping at Avengers HQ with War Machine, they decide on their next move. Vision points out that Wanda could destroy the Mind Stone with her power. But Wanda and the rest refuse. They don't trade lives. And they realize there's another way. With advanced technology, they could separate Vision from the stone and then destroy it. And Steve knows exactly where they could get that sort of technology. Wakanda. Meanwhile, the Guardians of the Galaxy respond to a distress signal and find the destroyed Asgardian ship. They bring Thor aboard and he gets them up to speed, letting them know Thanos has begun his conquest and he has a pretty good idea where he's going. Nowhere. That's where Asgard left the Reality Stone in the Collector's care. But to defeat Thanos, Thor knows he'll need a powerful weapon, especially with Mjolnir destroyed. So the team splits up. Thor, Rocket, and Groot head to Nidavellir, the place where Mjolnir was originally created. Peter, Gamora, and the rest head to nowhere. On the way, Gamora confides in Peter. She knows something which would help Thanos get the stones. Keeping that knowledge hidden is more important than her life, so she begs Peter to make a promise. If Thanos gets her and Peter has the chance, she needs Peter to kill her. They arrive on Nowhere to find Thanos interrogating the Collector. Gamora moves quickly and kills her adoptive father, and though she hates him, mourns him just the same. Until Thanos drops a charade. None of this is real. Fact is, they were too late, and Thanos already has the Reality Stone, which is how he was able to create this fantasy and ensnare Gamora. Now in her father's clutches, she begs Peter to fulfill his promise, to kill her, they finally profess their love for one another out loud, just before Quill pulls the trigger, only for the gun to vanish. Another reminder that with the Reality Stone, Thanos is in control. He leaves with Gamora. Now, he has three stones and three to go. Next, he seeks the Soul Stone, something he once sent Gamora to find. She claims not to have found it, but he knows when his daughter is lying. So he tortures her sister until Gamora acquiesces revealing the stone's location, Vormir. There, they find Red Skull transformed by the Space Stone into the Soul Stone's caretaker. He informs Thanos that the Soul Stone is unique. It carries a sort of wisdom. To ensure that whoever possesses it understands its power, the stone demands a sacrifice. You must lose that which you love, a soul for a soul. Gamora laughs. She finally got what she wanted most to see her father fail. How can he sacrifice what he loves if he loves nothing? But she is wrong. He loves his daughter. And once she lies dead in the pit below, the soul stone is his. Meanwhile, Thor, Rocket, and Groot arrive on Nita Valir to find Eitri, the sole survivor of a recent visit from Thanos. He tells them what happened. Thanos forced them to build his gauntlet to harness the Infinity Stone's power then killed all but Eitri and shut down their neutron star. To build a new weapon for Thor, they'll need to reignite the star. 
It nearly kills Thor, but he gets it done, and thus the Stormbreaker is born in the heart of a dying star, an axe powerful enough to call on the Bifrost itself. All it needs is a handle, so Groot grows him one. Elsewhere, Nebula escapes her confinement and calls the Guardians to meet her on Titan. She knows that's where Thanos will go. So when Stark, Strange, and Parker land, they run into the Guardians. The two groups fight until they realize their common cause and prepare for Thanos' arrival. But first, Strange looks into the future, and out of the 14,605 he views, there is only one where they succeed. Soon, Thanos arrives. The team fights with everything they have. Mantis puts him in a trance, and they pull the gauntlet, inch by inch, sliding it off his arm. Then Quill asks where he took Gamora. Mantis feels what Thanos feels, and tells Peter, he is in anguish. He mourns. Nebula puts it together. A soul for a soul. He killed Gamora. Tony sees the rage in Quill's eyes and begs him not to engage. We've almost got this off. Tell me you didn't do it, Peter begs Thanos. I had to, the Mad Titan responds. No, you didn't, Peter says. At first quietly, then loudly before striking him, inadvertently breaking Mantis' spell. Now, Thanos fights back and gets the better of them. He nearly kills Tony until Strange bargains for his life by handing over the Time Stone. In Wakanda, the Avengers have arrived and Shuri is at work removing Vision's Mind Stone, but it will take time, which is quickly running out. Thanos' forces are already there. Wakanda's forces and the Avengers do their best to hold them off, but soon, Thanos himself arrives. One by one, the Avengers fall. Time has officially run out. Vision tells Wanda to destroy the Mind Stone. He reminds her that half the universe depends on it. He knows it's not fair that she has to be the one to do it, and he tells her he loves her, before Wanda destroys the stone and him with it. But with the Time Stone, Thanos has the ability to reverse time, so he does. Vision returns to life just so Thanos can rip the stone from his skull and kill him all over again. Finally, he has all six stones. Nothing stands between him and his wish to eradicate half of all living things. Except the God of Thunder. Thor arrives with Stormbreaker and puts it in Thanos' chest. You should have gone for the head, Thanos says, then snaps his fingers, and half of all life in the universe vanishes. On Titan, just before Strange disappears, he looks at Stark and reassures, Tony, there was no other way. And Peter, with his spider sense, knows he's part of the half that will disappear, and begs Tony for help he can't give. I don't want to go, sir. Please. Then he apologizes for letting down his mentor. I'm sorry, Peter says, before turning to Ash. Elsewhere, Hank and Hope Pym send Scott Lang into the Quantum Realm to collect healing particles for Ava, but while he's in there, they vanish like so many others, stranding Scott in the quantum realm. Meanwhile, Thanos watches the sunrise, secure in his victory. But 23 years ago, someone gave Nick Fury a pager in case of emergency. Before disappearing himself, he has time enough to call for help, a call that Carol Danvers will soon answer. 21 days later, that time comes. Tony Stark is adrift in space with only Nebula to keep him company, but their time has just about run out. Tony records a message for Pepper. He tells her how they'll run out of oxygen tomorrow morning, but tonight when he goes to sleep, it'll be like every other night. He'll be fine, and he'll dream of her. Tony closes his eyes and lays his head down, but it's not yet his time to rest. Carol Danvers appears and brings them home. While Tony recovers, the other surviving Avengers plot their next move. Rocket detects a power surge of cosmic proportions on a distant planet, identical to the one they saw when Thanos snapped. That must be his current location. So that's where they go, hoping to retrieve the stones and use them to reverse what Thanos did. But when they arrive, they only find disappointment. Once his job was done, Thanos saw no use for the stones and reduced them to atoms. 
The job is done, and it always will be. I am inevitable, Thanos says. This time, Thor goes for the head. Thanos is dead, and all hope is lost. Five years later, each Avenger copes in their own way. Steve Rogers runs a support group to help people cope. Tony Stark settles down with Pepper and raises a daughter named Morgan, a daughter who loves her father a lot. To be precise, she tells him, I love you 3,000. Natasha coordinates with heroes around the world to manage whatever other crises may come. Clint Barton, who lost his entire family, takes on the vengeful persona of the Ronin, killing anyone he deems deserving, like Yakuza thugs in Tokyo. Banner found a way to solve his Hulk problem by treating it as a cure rather than a disease. Now he lives in Hulk form, but with the intelligence of Bruce Banner. And Thor settles down outside New Asgard, a new home for surviving Asgardians in Norway. There, he drinks, trying to forget the trauma of losing his mother, father, brother, best friend, and failing to stop Thanos. One day, a rat skitters over Pym's old quantum equipment, inadvertently freeing Scott. He wanders through a traumatized world, barely understanding what happened, but quickly realizing many were lost. He runs home to find with relief that his daughter was not one of them, though he did miss five years of her life. His next stop is Avengers HQ, where he shares a theory. He spent five years in the quantum realm, but to him, it was only five hours. Time works differently there. Maybe they could take advantage of that and use the quantum realm to time travel and fix what Thanos broke. They take the idea to someone with the right expertise, Tony Stark. But Stark is a changed man. With Pepper and Morgan, now he has something to lose. This idea is impossible and reckless. But when the Avengers leave, the idea stays. It keeps him up, and he realizes it could be done. Working with Banner, he proves it. Now, they just need a plan for their time heist. They know they can't change the past, so going back and stopping Thanos isn't an option. That would just create a separate reality, leaving this one no less broken. But they can borrow Infinity Stones from that separate reality and use them to reverse the snap in this one. They just need to determine where and when each of the stones can be found. Thankfully, each of them have had experiences involving the stones, so collectively, they're able to pin them down. They split into three teams and divide the remaining pin particles among them. They'll have enough for one round trip each and no more, so there is no room for error. Rogers, Stark, Banner, and Lang head to 2012. Banner visits the Ancient One to retrieve the Time Stone. She, of course, refuses. It's her sworn duty to protect it. And if Banner were to take it, that may save his timeline, but she and everyone in this timeline would be in trouble. Banner promises to return the stones once they're done, but she can't stake the fate of their world on a promise. But her tone changes when Banner mentions that Strange willingly handed Thanos the Time Stone. She's yet to meet Strange, but she knows he's coming and knows his importance. If he gave it up, it must have been for a reason. He must have foreseen this and known the stones would have to cross realities. So she fulfills that destiny and hands Banner the stone. Meanwhile, in the midst of the Battle of New York, Rogers retrieves Loki's scepter containing the Mind Stone, something which requires a quick scuffle with his past self and a quiet Hail Hydra to convince some agents he's on their side. Stark and Lang get the Tesseract containing the Space Stone, but Loki manages to snatch it and disappear, so they're forced to improvise. They could go back in time again to grab the stone, but that would leave them with no Pym particles for the trip back. But what if they could visit a time where both the Power Stone and some Pym particles could be found? Tony and Steve head to a 1970 Camp Lehigh. Roger's old training ground, and the eventual home of a digitized Dr. Zola. There, Tony grabs the Power Stone, and Steve grabs the Pym Particles. On the way, both have encounters with ghosts of their past, Tony with his father, 
and Steve with Peggy, someone he still pines for 78 years after missing their date. Thor and Rocket head to 2013 Asgard, where Jane is infected with the Aether, which is the reality stone in another form, weaponized by the Dark Elves. While Thor has an emotional reunion with his mother on the day of her death, Rocket knocks Jane out and extracts the Aether. Before they leave, Thor summons Mjolnir to replace the one he lost. Nebula, Rhodes, Barton, and Romanoff head to 2014 and split up. Nebula and Rhodes head to Morag to grab the Power Stone containing Orb before Past Quill does, while Barton and Romanoff head to Vormir for the Soul Stone. But two cybernetic nebulas in one reality causes problems. Past Nebula receives the memories of future Nebula and shares them with past Thanos. The Mad Titan sees that his quest to erase half of life will be successful, but the Avengers are trying to reverse it. He intends to stop them. So they capture future Nebula and ensure past Nebula, the one still loyal to Thanos, will be the one to return to the future. On Vormir, Red Skull tells Romanoff and Barton the price of the stone, a soul for a soul. Both are eager to face their destiny and pay the karmic price of their sins, but it's Romanoff who succeeds. She saves Barton and adds one more drop of blood to her ledger, this time her own. Natasha dies, and with the price paid, Barton leaves with the soul stone. The Avengers assemble in 2023. They mourn for Natasha, then make sure her sacrifice has meaning. Using the stones takes a heavy toll, so the strongest among them, with the greatest likelihood of survival, wields Tony's homemade gauntlet. The Hulk snaps, and a call from Barton's wife tells him it worked. All those erased by Thanos have returned, though Natasha remains dead. There are no refunds when it comes to the Soul Stone. They have little time to celebrate, as the imposter Nebula has already opened a portal for her father. Thanos attacks. Aboard his ship, past Gamora questions the captured Nebula, who came from the future. She learns that in the future, they will become friends and sisters, before Thanos sacrifices her. So she frees Nebula. When the other Nebula comes and tries to kill Gamora for her treachery, future Nebula kills her past self. On the ground, Thanos takes down the Avengers one by one, even Thor. Thanos intercepts Stormbreaker and prepares to sink its blade into the god's chest. But Mjolnir flies into him, then keeps flying, because it's not Thor who called for it, but Steve Rogers. Captain America wields the power of a god and holds his own against Thanos for a little while. Soon, he's on the ground with a broken shield. Thanos calls forth his armies, and the lone Avenger stands to face his destiny. Until he gets a call from Sam Wilson, letting him know he's not alone. Portals open, flooding the battlefield with resurrected heroes summoned by Strange and Wong. Avengers, the captain shouts, assemble. The battle tips in the Avengers' favor, and when Carol Danvers arrives, their victory seems all but assured. But in this battle, only one thing matters. Who has the Infinity Stones? And despite their best efforts in this historical round of keep away, Thanos retrieves them. He prepares to snap, and this time, he won't leave half the world alive, because he's seen how stubborn they can be in their grief. Instead, he'll erase everything and start from scratch. Tony looks at Strange. The master of the mystic arts holds up a single finger silently telling Stark, this is that one future where they win. And Tony knows what he has to do. He attacks and struggles for the gauntlet until Thanos pushes him away. I am inevitable, Thanos announces, then snaps. Nothing happens. Tony's stolen the stones. The power surges through him. It's excruciating, but he summons the strength to reply, and I am Iron Man. Then snap. Thanos and his armies vanish as the stones take their toll. Stark collapses. He's quickly surrounded by loved ones. And once Pepper gives him permission to rest, the light on his chest goes dark. At his funeral, they play a message recorded by Tony, the night before their travels through time. It's a message of hope for the future, 
and a message of love. It concludes when the hologram of Tony looks at his daughter and tells her, I love you 3000. The arc reactor which saved Tony's life 14 years ago, engraved by Pepper to say, proof that Tony Stark has a heart, drifts onto the lake as Avengers, friends, and family remember the hero. Sometime after the funeral, Nick Fury heads to space for a vacation, leaving Talos to cover for him, using his scroll abilities to impersonate him. And he's not the only one looking to leave things behind. Valkyrie asks Thor when he'll take his rightful place on the throne, but he decides to leave New Asgard in her care, making her the new leader. As for Thor, it's time for him to be himself for a while, rather than who he's supposed to be. So he joins the Guardians of the Galaxy in search of adventure. Later, Banner, Bucky, and Sam work with Rogers to complete some unfinished business. Now that the task is done, he needs to return the Stones and Mjolnir to their rightful places in history, keeping the promise Banner made to the Ancient One. But when Steve returns from his travels, he's an old man. It seems that after completing his mission, he decided to try living life for a while. He gives his shield to Sam Wilson, and with it, the mantle of Captain America. Rogers doesn't tell him about the life he lived, but the ring on his finger says everything. Somewhere, in another time, he and Peggy are finally sharing that dance. And somewhere else, outside of time, a Loki is in trouble. In that alternate 2012, snatching the Tesseract put Loki in the crosshairs of the TVA, or Time Variant Authority. There is something called the Sacred Timeline, encompassing all the events, past, present, and future, which are supposed to occur, as decreed by three mysterious timekeepers. When someone does something which deviates from that timeline, like Loki stealing the Tesseract, they become a variant and create a branching reality, which eventually leads to chaos. That's where the TVA comes in. When such a thing happens, they erase that branching reality, capture the variant, and put them on trial, usually resulting in their being pruned, a polite way of saying vaporized. But Loki gets a rare second chance, because one TVA agent, named Mobius, sees something in him. Recently, a variant has been wreaking havoc. Somehow, they've been evading the TVA and killing their people. Mobius thinks Loki could help capture that variant because that variant is another Loki. Only problem is that Loki from 2012 is a villain, one who has not been transformed by experience into an ally of the Avengers. But Mobius believes in this Loki. He believes that deep down, he doesn't want to hurt people. He just needs Loki to see that too. So he shows him footage of his life, the life he's lived and the life he's yet to live, all the pain and suffering he causes, but also love for his father, brother, and mother, and also redemption, sacrifice, and his death at the hands of Thanos. Eventually, Loki admits the truth. He is weak. So he hurts and kills as a desperate plea for control through fear. He also sees the TVA's power. He even finds a drawer full of infinity stones. The most powerful forces known in his world are paperweights here. The TVA is powerful. Loki has no choice. And he agrees to help them find the rogue Loki. Going through files on him, Loki has a realization. Variants are found because they cause nexus events, which result in branching realities. So where could this Loki variant hide where they wouldn't create nexus events? Apocalypses. If they constantly travel to times and places where an apocalypse is about to occur, they can't be found because no matter what they do, no nexus event will be created because the world is about to end anyway. Using that theory, he finds the Loki variant and learns that he is actually a she, who has adopted the name Sylvie. Loki finds himself outmatched, especially given her ability to enchant people. She can control them and read their memories, and she is intent on taking down the timekeepers, 
something Loki can get behind. So he abandons Mobius and leaves with her. As they hide in another apocalypse, they get to know one another. Sylvie was deemed a variant at a young age and has been on the run for a long time, growing up in the ends of thousands of worlds. Loki has spent a lifetime failing, and now his very right to exist is being challenged. Loki and Sylvie, for the first time in both their lives, find themselves truly connecting with someone, maybe even falling for that someone, and two variants of the same being feeling about each other, the way they're feeling, is powerful enough to create a Nexus event even in the face of an apocalypse, which gets them captured by the TVA. But when Loki and Sylvie spoke, they realized something about TVA agents. They all believe they were created by the timekeepers, but Sylvie has looked in their heads and seen memories from before their time at the TVA. The truth is that they are all variants, just like her and Loki. They've all been lied to. Mobius doesn't believe it at first, but Loki is insistent, and it starts to make sense. Mobius's entire life has been a lie. He turns on the TVA to work with Loki, but he's quickly discovered and pruned. Then Loki and Sylvie are taken before the timekeepers, but are rescued by another agent, defecting after learning the truth, just like Mobius. And when they attack the timekeepers, they find they are lies too, mindless androids built by someone else. Before they can investigate further, Loki is pruned. But Sylvie soon learns that getting pruned doesn't kill you. It just sends you to an empty place at the end of time. So she steals a time twister, used to travel through the timeline, then prunes herself to join Loki and Mobius. In that empty place at the end of time, they find Eliath, a large, cloud-like monster which obliterates anything in its path. But Lokis are survivors, and many of them dwell in this place. Some even agree to help Sylvie and Loki with an insane plan. She surmises that the real Puppet Master is likely hiding at the true end of time, guarded by Eliath. If she can enchant the monster, they can get through him to reach the true Timekeeper. She gives Mobius her stolen Time Twister so he can return to the TVA. Then she and Loki head through Eliath and find who they're looking for, he who remains. The strange man explains everything. Eons ago, a variant of himself lived on Earth in the 31st century as a scientist. He discovered that there were other universes out there, and he discovered how to traverse them. So he worked with variants of himself to trade knowledge and technology. But some of the variants were not so kind and saw each world as just another world to conquer. This led to a multiversal war, which only ended when he discovered that tears in reality created a creature called Eliath, capable of consuming time and space itself. He weaponized the creature to prune the branches of time and narrow things down to one sacred timeline. Then he created the TVA to ensure things stayed that way. As the sole survivor of his many variants, he became known as He Who Remains. After millions of lifetimes, he's tired. He's ready for someone else to take over. And he identified this pair of Lokis as the ones for the job. They have two choices. Kill him as originally intended, or take over the TVA and let him retire. But he warns, if they kill him, that just means the defense against his many variants will be gone. The multiversal war will repeat, and he will once again be its sole survivor, meaning his death would instantly be undone. Sylvie accuses him of lying and readies her blade, but Loki isn't so sure. If he's telling the truth, maybe they should take a minute to think about it. Sylvie is disgusted. They're so close to freedom from the TVA's rule, and Loki is enticed by the promise of a throne? But Loki promises her that's not it. He just wants her to be okay. And his expression says he's telling the truth. They kiss. Until Sylvie pushes him through a portal to the TVA using a time twister she grabbed off the desk. Then kills he who remains. Back at the TVA, Loki frantically approaches Mobius. 
only to find Mobius has no idea who he is, and he notices a statue resembling He Who Remains. It seems Sylvia's actions have altered reality. Mobius has forgotten or never experienced a recent adventure, and the TVA no longer answers to three fictional timekeepers, but instead He Who Remains, or at least some variant of him. Meanwhile, in real time, the world recovers from half its population disappearing for five years, before suddenly returning, a phenomenon which people call the blip. But not everyone is reunited with lost loved ones. Wanda Maximoff, after losing her parents to a missile and her brother to Ultron, now mourns Vision. A couple of weeks after his death, Wanda storms into the headquarters of S.W.O.R.D., the Sentient Weapon Observation Response Division. There, Tyler Hayward leads a project to resurrect and weaponize Vision. Wanda demands his body so she can properly bury it, but they can't hand over $3 billion worth of vibranium just for her to put it in the dirt. She leaves with nothing but more grief. She visits a plot of land in Westview, New Jersey, where Vision had intended to one day build them a home. The grief is too much, enough to trigger an explosion of chaos magic, which engulfs the surrounding town in a hex, and within it creates a fabricated reality, one where Vision is alive, and where the townsfolk play the roles of characters in a sitcom called WandaVision. In Sokovia, the Dick Van Dyke show and other classics gave her and her family comfort. Now living in it does the same. The Hex is powerful. Even Wanda herself is unaware at first that the reality is false, and when she suspects the truth, her mind turns away from it, preferring this false reality to one filled with grief and anguish. Outside the Hex, Tyler Hayward leads the effort to understand it. The team includes once intern, now scientist, Darcy Lewis, FBI agent Jimmy Wu, and Monica Rambeau, daughter of Carol Danvers' best friend. She had a job at S.W.O.R.D. but disappeared in the blip. Upon returning, she found her mother dead from cancer, and rather than succumb to grief, she returned to work right away. Though many are cautious of the hex, she enters it. Like everything else which crosses the boundary, her clothes are transformed to fit the production design of Wanda's sitcom. Her true personality is buried under waves of Wanda's grief, and like a puppet, she plays the role of another character. In the Maximoff home, Wanda and Vision play husband and wife, and like a sitcom, they face the requisite trials and tribulations, including pregnancy, which in this reality comes to term in a matter of hours rather than months. Before they know it, Wanda and Vision are raising twins named Tommy and Billy. As she and Monica watch the twins, Wanda mentions how she herself is a twin. She had a brother named Pietro. For a moment, the spell is broken, and Monica breaks character. He was killed by Ultron, wasn't he? Wanda acts quickly to eject Monica from the Hex. She will not allow anyone to ruin the illusion of WandaVision. And with Monica gone, they turn to their other neighbor, Agnes, for help with the children. Outside, Monica reports that the Hex is being perpetuated by Wanda, causing Tyler to see her as a villain. But Monica felt Wanda's pain, pain she knows well herself after losing her mother. She doesn't believe Wanda is doing this on purpose. They should work with her to resolve the Hex. But Tyler chooses a different approach antagonism. Anything they send into the Hex gets transformed to fit the reality. When they sent a drone into her 60s era sitcom, it was transformed into a toy helicopter. So they change tactics. Once WandaVision evolves into an 80s style sitcom, they send in an 80s style drone. But without Monica's knowledge, it's been armed by Tyler. It fires at Wanda, but only manages to piss her off, and she ejects the drone, just like she did Monica. Meanwhile, Darcy tries something as well. She sends an email, brand new technology in the 80s setting. In it, she warns about the Maximoff anomaly and its effect on Westview residents. Curious, Vision investigates the mind of a co-worker and realizes the truth, that everyone in the town is under Wanda's control, with their true personalities buried. Vision tries to confront Wanda, but she denies everything and just tries to move on. Things only get more hectic 
when Wanda's dead brother Pietro shows up, though he wears a different face. Soon, it's time for the WandaVision Halloween episode. The twins have aged up to 10 years old, exhibit superpowers inherited from their parents, and the show's taken on a Malcolm in the Middle aesthetic. In the midst of it all, Pietro sees right through the illusions and asks Wanda how she's doing all this. What kind of magic allows her to unconsciously control an entire town, but Wanda has no idea herself. Soon, the truth is revealed. There's a reason Pietro is so curious about Wanda's power. It's because he isn't Pietro at all. He's some guy named Ralph Boner who's been controlled to act like Pietro. And who was controlling him? A witch named Agatha Harkness. Posing as a character in WandaVision named Agnes. She's powerful, but not as powerful as Wanda. So she's been watching, trying to figure out the source of Wanda's power. She tried prying it out of her with fake Pietro, but that failed. So now, she takes a more direct approach. She lures Wanda into her basement by kidnapping Tommy and Billy. Wanda tries to attack, but Agatha already cast runes on the wall, and in a given space, only the witch that cast the runes can use her magic. With Wanda under her spell, Agatha takes a stroll through her memories and finds the source of her power. It was not the Mind Stone as Hydra believed. That only awakened powers that were already there. Chaos magic. Before Agatha reveals the full truth, they're interrupted by Tyler Hayward's sentient weapon. When Wanda ejected the drone, she inadvertently gave them the piece they were missing. It was infected with chaos magic, which they harnessed to finally power Vision. But it's not the Vision she remembers. They've erased his memories and replaced them with a mission. Kill Wanda and kill Vision. Wanda's vision fights Hayward's, while she and Agatha continue their talk. The reason Wanda wields chaos magic is because she is the Scarlet Witch, a being foretold in the Darkhold, the Book of the Damned, a witch who is not born but forged. She has no coven and no need for incantation, and she is powerful, more powerful even than the Sorcerer Supreme, and she is destined to destroy the world. Wanda doesn't believe her, so Agatha shows her the damage she's already done by freeing the minds of her neighbors. No longer in character, they beg Wanda to let their children free, children who all this time have been locked in their rooms, hidden from sight. They beg her to let them out of the hex, free them from her grief and pain. Faced with the misery she caused, Wanda does not hesitate to open the hex and let them all out, but quickly she learns she can't do that. Her husband Vision and her two children only exist in this falsified reality. If it goes away, so do they. Opening the hex had another effect too. It allowed Hayward's forces to enter the town. With Vision occupied with Vision, Tommy and Billy handle the military, and they get extra help from Monica Rambo, who herself has developed superpowers thanks to repeated trips into and out of the Hex. Elsewhere, Wanda's Vision fights with Hayward's until he stops him with logic. His mission is to destroy Vision, but he is Vision, only his memories are locked away, so he awakens them and suddenly, Hayward's vision is back to his old self. He recalls his love for Wanda, and he recalls dying twice. I am vision, he says, before flying off. In the midst of the chaos, Agatha makes Wanda an offer. Give me your power, she says, and I will correct the flaws in your original spell, and you and your family and the people of Westview can all live together in peace, and no one will ever have to feel this pain again not even you. So, Wanda gives Agatha the power, but it's useless to Agatha, because Wanda remembered what Agatha said in the basement, and she cast runes on the interior of the Hex. Only Wanda can practice magic here. She takes the power back, then punishes Agatha by trapping her in character as Agnes, the nosy neighbor. Finally, Wanda ends the Hex, meaning she has to say good night and goodbye to her children one last time. Vision 2. Once things are resolved, Rambo is approached by a scroll who summons her for a meeting with Nick Fury. In the end, 
Wanda is alone again, but with a new purpose, to understand her newfound powers. So she takes the Darkhold somewhere remote, to read and to practice. Meanwhile, despite humanity's victory over Thanos, another threat looms within their planet's core, the celestial Tiamat. The emergence was delayed thanks to Thanos erasing half the population, but with the return of those billions of human lives, the seed resumes its growth, and now, emergence is just seven days away. Icarus has dealt with this by leaving his friends and the love of his life. Around a century ago, he realized the longer he stayed with Cersei, the more tempting it was to tell her the truth. So instead, he left her without explanation, intent on letting the emergence occur unfettered. But after 7,000 years with humanity, Ajak refuses to watch them die. So she meets with Icarus and suggests they stop it. However, she has underestimated just how much Icarus believes in Arishem. He will complete his mission at any cost, even if it means killing someone close to him. And he does exactly that, feeding Ajak to some deviants he discovered in Alaska. Apparently, they were frozen, but as the approaching emergence heated the planet, they were freed. Learning of her death, the other Eternals gather, appending whatever lives they'd built in the last five centuries. Cersei leaves her new boyfriend, Dane, and Kingo leaves his life as a Bollywood movie star. Though, because Sprite was built to resemble a child, it's been difficult for her to form any kind of life at all. Examining Ajax's body, they deduce she was killed by deviants, and as Cersei says goodbye to her old friend, the celestial communication sphere, which allowed Ajax to communicate with Arishem, exits her body and enters Cersei's. Soon, it allows her to speak with Arishem, and he finally reveals to her the truth of their mission. Horrified, she tells the others, and they quickly begin plotting to stop it. But emergence is not their only problem. There are also those deviants they didn't know about. Deviants which have grown stronger by absorbing Ajax's energy, strong enough to truly test the Eternal's namesake. And before the week is up, another Eternal is killed, this time Gilgamesh. They have little time to mourn, so they get back to work, and soon have a possible solution. What if Druig used his mind control ability to put Tiamat to sleep before he emerges? Druig doesn't have that kind of power, but maybe Fastus, the Eternal's engineer, could create something to combine all their powers and share it with Druig. The communication sphere inside Cersei connects her with Arishem. Fastus could take that device and repurpose it to instead connect all of them in what he calls the Unimind. It's a great plan, except not everyone is on board. Icarus has been quiet, but can no longer stand by and watch their blasphemy. He finally reveals the truth, that he knew about Emergence this whole time, and that he killed Ajax. For the first time in their lives, the Eternals fight something besides Deviants, each other. Sprite takes Icarus' side, and Kingo leaves. He believes in Emergence, if that's their mission, but he can't be a part of hurting his own family, so instead, he recuses himself. The rest fight, and prepare to connect their energies to stop Emergence. But Icarus is strong, and incapacitates Druig. So Cersei heads toward the point of emergence herself, intent on somehow stopping Tiamat. Icarus reaches her too, but then something happens. Love for humanity wouldn't allow Cersei to watch them die, and now love for her stops Icarus in his tracks. He can't hurt her. The Unimind forms, and it's even more powerful than they anticipated, because it connects them all, including Tiamat. With that power, the power of a Celestial, Cersei freezes Tiamat in place, stopping the emergence. Afterward, Icarus is overcome with guilt and fulfills his namesake by flying into the sun. And using Tiamat's power still flowing through her, Cersei grants Sprite her wish, to be human and to grow up though it also means she will one day die. Two weeks later, some of the Eternals leave Earth to find other Eternals and reveal to them the truth. However, some, including Cersei, stay behind. She returns to Dane, who prepares to reveal some secret about his ancestry, but they're interrupted 
When Arishem arrives, he announces that he will spare humanity for now, but he takes Cersei, Fastus, and Kingo to evaluate their memories in order to render judgment on the species, to decide if humanity should be allowed to live at the cost of a new celestial. A few days later, the other Eternals aboard their ship find they can't reach Cersei, Fastus, or Kingo. As though on cue, another Eternal named Eros arrives, along with his companion Pip. Eros, who goes by the outlaw named Starfox, introduces himself as Thanos' brother. Then he tells them their friends are in trouble, and he knows where to find them. Meanwhile, Dane Whitman prepares to accept a mantle passed down through his ancestry. He confronts the Ebony Blade, a sword containing great magic. As he approaches it, he finds that he isn't alone. Eric Brooks, the vampire hunting vigilante known as Blade, is there too, and he has a question. Sure you're ready for that, Mr. Whitman? Elsewhere, a mortal named Gore cradles his dying daughter. They are the last of a race who worship the god Rapu, and soon it is only Gore who remains, after he buries his daughter. Crawling as his own life withers, Gore comes upon the god, and in answer to his prayers, the god laughs. But near them is the recently defeated Dark Shadow Lord, who wielded the Necro Sword, one of the few weapons capable of killing a god. And now, that weapon calls to Gore. It lends its power, allowing Gore to kill Rapu and make this vow. All gods will die. Meanwhile, ten years after leaving his father, Shang-Chi lives a normal life in San Francisco. He and his close friend Katie spend their days as parking attendants and their nights drinking, karaokeing, and just having a good time. This is in stark contrast to his sister. Their father denied her entry into his empire, so Sha Ling decided to build her own. Now, she runs an underground fighting ring in Macau, featuring the likes of Wong and the Abomination. One day, the Ten Rings come for Shang-Chi. He fights them off as best he can, but they ultimately get what they came for, his mother's pendant. Knowing they'll come for his sisters too, he heads to Macau and Katie insists on joining him, despite the dangers ahead. And on the way, he fills her in about his real past, the Ten Rings and the death of his mother, though he can't bring himself to admit he's a killer. So he lies, telling her that when he was sent on his first assassination mission at 14, he couldn't go through with it. At the club in Macau, the Ten Rings return, and despite the skills of both siblings combined, once their father arrives with his rings, they don't stand a chance. He returns to his compound with both children and their pendants. There, he reveals why he came for them. Ying Li has been calling from beyond the grave. She's being held captive in Ta Lo, behind the dark gate. He intends on rescuing her, but first needs to find a path through the forest. And bringing the two pendants together reveals a map showing the path which opens once a year. Wen Wu promises he will open the gate, even if he has to burn the whole village down to do it. While in captivity, Shang-Chi and Katie meet another of the Ten Rings prisoners, Trevor Slattery, the actor who portrayed the Mandarin, the false leader of the Ten Rings, created by Aldrich Killian. And they meet his pet, Morris, a magical creature from Ta Lo, a creature who knows a way in before the forest path opens. So, working with Sha Ling, they escape the compound, follow Morris's instructions through the dangerous forest maze, and finally reach Ta Lo. There, Ying Li's sister, Ying Nan, reveals the truth. The Dweller in Darkness knows the Ten Rings are strong enough to open the gate and free him. So, he has impersonated Ying Li to trick Wenwu into freeing him. Knowing the Ten Rings will soon arrive, they prepare for battle. Ying Nan trains Shang-Chi in the same martial arts his mother used. Sha Ling practices with a new rope weapon, and Katie learns to work a bow and arrow. On the eve of the battle, Shang-Chi admits the truth to Katie. On that first assassination mission, he claimed he couldn't go through with it. That was a lie. He did kill the Iron Gang leader to avenge his mother. A blood debt has to be paid by blood.
Shang Chi's father got his mother killed, and Shang Chi now intends on collecting that debt. He will kill his father. The Ten Rings arrive, and despite Ta Lo's defense, and despite Shang Chi holding his own against his father, using the art he learned from his mother, Wen Wu opens the gate. The dweller is freed, and Wen Wu sees he was wrong. He failed his family and led them to a monster. As his soul is consumed, he relinquishes the Ten Rings to his son, leaving him to fight the battle. The Dweller rampages, and with each soul he swallows, grows stronger. Soon he begins to consume the soul of Talo's dragon, which will make him powerful beyond measure. But Katie aims her arrow and strikes the Dweller's neck, stopping him and giving Shang-Chi a chance to tear him apart with the rings. With the Dweller dead, Ta Lo and the world is saved. Returning home, Shang-Chi and Katie are summoned by Wong. Apparently, Shang-Chi using the Ten Rings for the first time sent a wave of magic so powerful they even felt it in the Sanctum. And not only that, though the origins of the rings are unknown, even Danvers and Banner can't figure it out, Wong detects a beacon inside them, a beacon which has now been activated calling out to someone or something in parts unknown. Meanwhile, in the time since Steve Rogers retired, Sam Wilson has yet to pick up the shield. It just feels like it belongs to someone else. So finally, he decides to donate it to the Smithsonian. But the US government wastes little time picking up the shield and handing it to someone else, John Walker, recipient of three medals of honor and now, the new Captain America. When Bucky finds out Sam relinquished the shield, he is not happy. Steve chose Sam to be the new Captain America. Refusing the mantle is like saying Steve was wrong, which means maybe he was wrong about Bucky too. Wrong to think he could escape the Winter Soldier, and wrong to think he could be a good man. He confronts Sam, but Sam has bigger things to worry about like the Flag Smashers. Some call them terrorists, but others see them as saviors. In the five-year period when half the population was gone, the world cooperated like never before. But once that half of the population returned, things were thrown into chaos. Many of the returned no longer had jobs or homes to return to, so they became refugees. The GRC, or Global Repatriation Council, has formed camps for these refugees. But the conditions are poor. People are underfed and sometimes denied necessary medicine or vaccines. That's why Carly Morgenthau formed the Flag Smashers. They assist refugees, but also fight to restore things to how they were during the blip, when the world seemed to have no borders or nations. Instead, humanity fought as one. And to spread this message, the Flag Smashers are not afraid to use violence. They caught Sam Wilson's attention because they're strong. Too strong for humans. Meaning, they may have somehow gotten their hands on super soldier serum. Sam tracked their location to Munich. So he heads after them, and Bucky insists on coming along. Both leave tumultuous personal lives behind. Sam's sister runs a family business that's going under, and Bucky lives in isolation while trying to make amends with everyone he harmed as the Winter Soldier. So far, he's focused on the easy part, getting back at the people who benefited from the Hydra assassin. But he's procrastinated on the hard part, giving closure to those he robbed of loved ones. When they arrive in Munich, they learn it's not just them after the Flag Smashers, but also the new Captain America. John Walker, and his partner Lamar Hoskins. But despite all their strength combined, the Flag Smashers evade capture. Walker suggests they team up, but skeptical of this imposter, arrogant enough to follow in Roger's footsteps, Bucky and Sam refuse. Unsure how to proceed, Bucky introduces Sam to someone who knows something about super soldier serum, Isaiah Bradley, the sole survivor of the US military's experiments with the serum on black soldiers. He shares his bitter story, and he shares his anger at a government that ruined his life, then erased him from history. 
but offers little direction. Except the conversation gives Bucky an idea. His once captor, Helmet Zemo, may know something. After all, he managed to locate and eradicate every Winter Soldier other than Bucky, so finding Super Soldiers is kind of his specialty. They find him in a prison, and before Sam has a chance to protest the idea, Bucky breaks him out. Zemo reveals that his prior investigations led to a place called Madripoor, a city of outlaws in the Indonesian archipelago. There, they meet with a crime lord named Selby and discover the super soldier serum was recreated by Dr. Wilfred Nagel. During their conversation, Selby realizes Sam and Bucky are imposters in their crime haven, but before she can strike them down, Selby herself is killed by Sharon Carter. After aiding Captain America during the Avengers Civil War, she became a fugitive and took up residence in Madripoor. After killing Selby, she provides him a place to hide out and uses some of her resources to track down Dr. Nagel. She agrees to do this favor on the condition that Sam Wilson tried to get her a pardon once this is all over. Interrogating the scientist, they learn he once worked for Hydra, then after their collapse, the CIA. There, he tried to recreate the serum by studying Isaiah Bradley's blood, and after the blip, he took his work to an anonymous crime lord known only as the Power Broker, who funded his remaining research. He was able to create 20 vials of the serum, all of which were stolen by the Flag Smashers. Their interrogation is interrupted by bounty hunters seeking retribution for their killing Selby. They escape, but Zemo uses the chaos to kill the scientist, hoping to end the flow of Super Soldier Serum. Next, they need to actually find the Flag Smashers, and for that, they have an idea. Danya Madani recently passed away. She was someone who helped blip refugees. It was under her care that the Flag Smashers first met. Their leader, Carly, will likely be at the funeral, and Zemo manages to figure out when and where that'll be. So that's where they head, while the new Captain America follows. He insists on storming in to take Carly by force, while Sam hopes to reason with her. Walker reluctantly gives him 10 minutes to try, and Sam quickly finds the girl. He shows sympathy for her cause, only questioning her violent methods. But before they can get anywhere in the conversation, Walker loses patience and violently storms in. In the ensuing chaos, Zemo manages to shoot Carly repeatedly. She ultimately escapes, but first drops her vials of super soldier serum. Zemo quickly gets to work destroying them, but John Walker manages to grab one and stash it away. In the aftermath, Walker attempts to take Zemo into custody, but he's not the only one who wants Zemo. So do the Dora Milaje. Wakanda caught wind that Zemo was out, and considering he murdered King T'Chaka, that doesn't sit well. Walker takes them on and loses the fight, while Zemo uses the chaos to escape. Walker is humiliated. He lost a fight against opponents who weren't even super soldiers. Suddenly, taking the stolen serum himself is a tempting prospect. Later, Carly arranges a meeting with Sam, but again, before they can make much more progress in the conversation, Walker shows up, this time powered by Super Soldier Serum. In the ensuing fight, Carly kills Lamar Hoskins, Walker's partner. That sends the new Captain America into a rage. She gets away, but he manages to chase down one of her friends and cave in the man's skull with his shield, all while the public watches. Unsure what to do, Walker runs until Bucky and Sam chase him down, subdue him, and finally return the shield to its rightful owner. Then, with the trail on Carly left cold, they tie up some loose ends. Bucky tracks down Zemo and hands him over to the Dora Milaje, then asks Wakanda for a favor in return. John Walker is formally stripped of his title as Captain America, and Sam pays Isaiah Bradley a visit to hear the rest of his story, a story which has never been told. When Sam offers to share it with the world, Bradley tells him not to bother. They erased him all those years ago, and today is no different. This country will never accept a black Captain America, and no self-respecting black man would even want the job. The words weigh heavily on Sam as he returns home with Captain America's shield in hand.
As he weighs the decision, he puts his focus elsewhere, the family business. Talking to his sister, he realizes something. Their parents did a lot of good for the neighborhood, and there are many who would do anything for the Wilsons. So he calls in some favors, and before they know it, they have all the help they need repairing the boat at the center of their family seafood business. Bucky's super strength and metal arm also come in handy. Working together, they manage to keep the business afloat. And Bucky gives Sam a suitcase, containing the favor he asked of Wakanda, a new Captain America suit, tailor-made and designed for Sam. Soon, the next step in the Flag Smasher's plan is revealed. The GRC prepares to vote on the Patch Act, something which would immediately force all refugees back to their states and countries of origin. Carly will not allow that. So, the Flag Smashers interrupt the vote and take all the Senators hostage. But Bucky is there to fight them, and so is Captain America. Sam Wilson dons the Wakandan suit, including modified falcon wings to fit the new aesthetic. Though, John Walker is there too, with a shield he made by melting down his old medals. But when he's given a choice between revenge on Carly or saving hostages, he makes the right choice and saves lives. But he's only afforded Carly borrowed time, because when Sam tries to negotiate with her one last time, she raises her gun and Carter shoots her. The rest of the Flag Smashers are taken into custody while Sam speaks with the Senators. Carly was wrong for her approach, but not in her ideals. If the GRC doesn't do better to take care of people, it's only a matter of time before another Carly rises. He urges them to do better. Meanwhile, the other Flag Smashers join Carly in death, as Zemo, despite his reincarceration, arranged for them an explosive end, doing his best to eradicate all the remaining serum, whether in vials or bodies. In the aftermath, it seems Sam's plea was a success, as the GRC abandons the Patch Act. And that's not the only place Sam has had an impact. He also had a statue of Isaiah Bradley added to the Smithsonian, where finally his story can be told. Bucky, meanwhile, finally goes through his list, giving closure and making amends to those he hurt as the Winter Soldier. John Walker, too, finds hope. He is approached by CIA director Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, who rebrands him the U.S. agent and offers him another chance at being a hero. And Sharon Carter is given her pardon, though Sam is unaware of the monster he's invited into the U.S. government. It seems that in Madripoor as a fugitive, Sharon climbed the criminal ranks and became the crime lord known as the power broker. And now she'll have access to government secrets, weapons, and more to grow her criminal enterprise. Meanwhile, Peter Parker continues to mourn Tony Stark eight months after his passing, but he finds hope for something good with MJ. He likes her, and sometimes he catches her staring at him, so he thinks she might like him too. And on his school's upcoming trip to Europe, he plans on confessing his crush. Unfortunately, the universe has other plans. Specifically, Nick Fury has other plans. He calls, and worried about messing up his trip, Peter ignores those calls. But trouble arrives in another form. Brad. Unlike the rest of the class, he did not disappear in the blip. So he's five years older and, as a courtesy, was invited on one last school trip, where he quickly becomes a rival for MJ's affections. Things only get worse in Italy when they're attacked by a water monster. Peter does his best to fight, but they're ultimately saved by a mystery man in a cape, who they nickname Mysterio. Finally, Fury catches up with Peter and makes him listen. This attack was not the first, and there are more on the way. He takes Peter to a secret hideout, and on the way, gives him something Tony left for him, special glasses. At the hideout, he introduces Quentin Beck, a visitor from another world in the multiverse. His Earth was destroyed by the Elementals, and he's come here to prevent this world suffering the same fate. The next attack will hit Prague in 48 hours, so Fury hijacks the class trip and sends him there. On the way, Peter tries on the glasses, 
to find they interface with the entire Stark global security network, including defense satellites and back doors to communication networks, something demonstrated when Peter looks around to see all his classmates' text messages splayed before him. He's guided by an AI named Edith, or even dead, I'm the hero. At a pit stop, a woman who works with Fury rendezvous with Peter to give him a new suit, one that doesn't look like Spider-Man, to avoid people putting two and two together when they notice Spider-Man happens to be in Prague. At the same time, Peter's on a class trip there. But as he changes, Brad walks in and takes a compromising photo, one he intends on showing to MJ to edge out the competition for her heart. Peter tries using Edith to erase the photo, but a few mistaken words are enough to instead trigger a drone attack, forcing Peter to defend them, then kindly ask Edith to finally erase that photo. In Prague, Fury chastises Peter for the near miss, while Mysterio offers a sympathetic shoulder, further winning Peter to his side. When the attack finally comes, Peter's web pulls a small machine out of the sky, which MJ finds, and Beck destroys the elemental, saving Peter's friends and saving the world. Afterward, he and Beck talk, and having repeatedly seen Quentin's heroics, Peter realizes that Tony picked the wrong guy to follow in his footsteps. It shouldn't be Peter, it should be Quentin. So he hands over Edith and runs back to his class, only to find them packing their bags. After so many close calls, they're canceling the trip. Peter missed his chance to confess to MJ, a sacrifice he's not willing to make. So he invites her to join him for one last night on the town, and before he can even finish the question, she says yes. Outside, the nervous MJ and terrified Peter awkwardly fill the silence, until Peter finds the courage to tell her how he feels. I, Peter begins, am Spider-Man, MJ finishes the sentence. She's been watching him, and it's obvious. The unexpected revelation is a punch to Parker's gut. That's why she's been watching him this whole time. Yeah, MJ confirms. Why else would I be watching you? Doesn't matter. Peter lies and reburies his one-sided crush. But just then, the small machine MJ found activates, revealing it to be a powerful projector, revealing the elementals aren't real, and Mysterio is a fraud. A fraud who Peter has just handed one of the most powerful weapons on Earth. They move quickly. Peter needs to find Fury. If he calls, Beck will likely tap the lines with Edith, so face-to-face -face is the only option. Meanwhile, Beck prepares for the final stage of his plan. Using illusion technology combined with weaponized drones, he's been able to fake elemental attacks while making the damage and casualties real. Why? When Beck worked for Tony Stark, he realized the world's gone mad. People no longer value intelligence. Instead, they hand power to whoever dazzles them with superheroic antics like Iron Man. So, Beck collected a few other disgruntled Stark employees to fabricate Mysterio and the Elementals. Together, they've created a hero who will demand the world's attention, and soon, with Edith's help, they will create a major attack fit for the Avengers. But it won't be the Avengers who stop it. It'll be Mysterio alone. There's just one problem. One of his drones is missing, and if someone finds it, they could prove the entire thing a fraud. So he tracks it down and finds it in Peter's possession. Now all he needs to know is who else knows. He disguises himself as Fury and finds Peter to ask that question. But Peter sees through the illusion until Mysterio amps things up, trapping him in a more complicated illusion, playing on his fears and insecurities. Until the real Fury comes to the rescue, telling him they need to move quickly. Mysterio's people are after anyone who knows his ruse. Who else knows? Peter quickly answers, MJ and Ned. But this is another illusion, and in reality, he's just given Beck his next targets. Mysterio knocks Peter out with a train and heads off. Once he wakes, Peter calls for help. Happy finds him and the boy is a wreck, rattled with guilt and worried for his friends. So, Happy reminds him about the guy who believed in him, Tony Stark. Peter gets to work, using Stark's tech to build himself a new suit, 
optimized for fighting drones. And watching him work, Happy can't help but think of his old friend. When the attack goes down, this time, Spider-Man heads right into the illusion and takes it down from the inside. To the outside world, the elementals disappear, replaced by a swarm of weaponized drones. Next, Peter heads for Beck himself, only to find himself trapped inside another illusion. But rather than panic, he listens to his spider sense, and it guides him through to Beck. The villain panics, ordering all the drones to fire in an enclosed space where it's easy for a bullet to ricochet or hit the wrong target. Peter dodges them all, but Beck isn't so lucky. Though even as he dies, Beck smiles as though hiding one more ace up his sleeve. After the battle, Peter and MJ find each other, and this time, neither hides their true feelings. They kiss and return from the trip as a couple. But their first date is interrupted by a message from beyond the grave. Before dying, Beck arranged for the release of a doctored video leaked through the dailybugle.net. It frames Spider-Man for killing Beck and reveals to the world that Spider-Man's true identity is Peter Parker. Peter has the appropriate reaction, shouting, what the fuck? Meanwhile, Talos, who's been playing the role of Nick Fury throughout all this, gives the real Nick Fury an update. So, Fury decides to end his space vacation and get back to work. With his identity revealed, Peter's life is immediately thrown into chaos. Some see him as a hero, others a murderous vigilante, but everyone knows his name. The worst part? It's his friends and family who suffer. Ned and MJ are denied admission to their dream school thanks to their association with a vigilante, and Happy is under investigation by the FBI for some pilfered Stark tech. Lawyer Matt Murdock assures Peter he's safe from the law, but the court of public opinion is another matter. Peter's guilt turns to desperation, and he approaches Doctor Strange with an insane request. What if they changed the past so Peter's name was never revealed? Impossible, Strange explains. They no longer have the Time Stone, but feeling for the boy's plight, he offers an alternative. They could make the world forget he's Spider-Man. Strange begins casting the spell when Peter has a realization. He doesn't want MJ to forget, so he asks Strange to alter the spell. And more people come to mind. What about Ned? Aunt May and Happy. The spell grows unstable at the many alterations, and Strange moves quickly to contain it, but apparently not quickly enough. While the spell traveled the dark borders between known and unknown, it invited from other worlds anyone who knows Peter Parker is Spider-Man, including Dr. Octopus, the Green Goblin, Sandman, Lizard, and Electro. Strange warns Peter that they know frighteningly little about the multiverse, so these visitors need to be returned home as soon as possible. Peter recruits Ned and MJ's help. Soon, all but the Green Goblin are captured, but Peter gets an idea where he is when Aunt May calls. A visitor just stopped by her shelter, which normally offers help to those displaced by the blip. Peter rushes in to find not a monster, but a desperate and confused man, Norman Osborn. Are they all like him? Aunt May asks. If so, maybe they don't need to be booted back to their reality, but instead need help. Help to be cured of the afflictions that have turned them into villains. Doctor Strange disagrees, and he's already prepared a way to send them back. He's contained the spell inside an artifact that, when activated, will send the visitors home which, they realize, will be a death sentence for some of them. Ock, Goblin, and Electro were all pulled from their worlds moments before their deaths at Spider-Man's hands. Peter will not have that on his conscience, so he scuffles with Strange over the artifact. The Sorcerer brings him into the Mirror Dimension, a twisting world resembling reality where one can practice magic without causing harm. But Peter manages to steal the artifact and his sling ring then strand him there. Returning to reality, he leaves the artifact and sling ring with MJ and Ned, then brings the villains to Happy's condo, where that stolen Stark technology comes in handy. Using it, Peter and Norman work hand-in-hand -hand to develop cures. 
First, they install a chip that returns Dr. Otto Octavius control of his mind, freeing him from the tentacles that warped his psyche. But before they can cure the rest, the Green Goblin wakes up, taking over for Norman Osborn. He decides to free Peter of his weakness, morality, and he does it by killing his moral compass. Aunt May. She's wounded by the blades of his glider, but before they realize those wounds are mortal, she tries once more to show Peter the right path. She watches him drown in regret. Why didn't he listen to Strange and just send the villains home? It's not his responsibility to fix them. But it is, May reminds him, because he has a gift. He has power. And with great power, she says, there must also come great responsibility. As she dies in her nephew's arms, Happy arrives to stand between Peter and the arriving authorities. He gives himself up for arrest and shouts for Peter to run. So Peter runs and hides, wallowing in regret. Meanwhile, Ned and MJ search for Peter, but come up short. So they try magic. Ned calls for Peter Parker and opens a portal with the sling ring. Out of it, steps Peter Parker, but not the one they expected. Ned tries again, and they're joined by another Peter Parker. Neither is theirs, but both are older versions from other worlds, where they've been Spider-Man a lot longer. If they could find Ned and MJ's friend, perhaps they could share their experience and help him find a way back from the darkness. The Peters explain that on their worlds, each has a place they go when they're lost. For one, it's the Chrysler Building, and the other, the Empire State. MJ knows where to find him. They head to their school's rooftop. Ned and MJ offer a hug, and the Peters offer their stories. One became vengeful after losing his Uncle Ben, but getting revenge didn't make it better. The other lost Gwen, his MJ, and after that became rageful. Both have long journeys out of darkness, and neither want this Peter to make the same mistakes. When he tells them what May said before she died, about power and responsibility, it's something the older Peters have heard before. It's a lesson they learned from Uncle Ben. Maybe, the oldest Peter offers, May didn't die for nothing. And so, Peter accepts his responsibility and joins with the two others to recreate cures for all the villains including the goblin. Once they're ready, Peter calls into the Daily Bugle to reveal where he can be found, at the Statue of Liberty, a symbol for second chances. It doesn't take long for the villains to arrive, hoping to destroy the artifact and avoid their fates. But while it takes a minute for them to learn to work as a team, the three Spider-Men cure Sandman, Lizard, and with Doc Ock's help, Electro. In the midst of the battle, Strange returns and prepares to finally put an end to the madness. But before he can activate the artifact, the Green Goblin shows up and blows it up. In the ensuing chaos, MJ is thrown off the statue, and Peter leaps after her. Until the Goblin stops him, so the other Peter, the one who failed to save Gwen in his world, now saves MJ. Meanwhile, Peter's rage awakens. The Green Goblin killed his aunt and tried to kill MJ. He's going to pay for that with his life. He beats the villain down, picks up his glider, then is stopped by the older Peter. He refuses to watch his younger self repeat his mistakes, even if it gets him killed, and it nearly does. The Goblin stabs him just before Peter administers the cure, and Norman Osborn returns. But the damage is done. The spell was released when he destroyed the artifact, and now the boundaries between this world and the rest are falling, inviting in everyone from any world who knows Peter is Spider-Man. So Peter has a suggestion. Make everyone forget Peter Parker. Strange says it'll work, but warns it'll leave him entirely alone. But it's a sacrifice Peter is willing to make. He says his goodbyes, to his new friends and his old friends. MJ doesn't want to forget him, but Peter promises that no matter what, he'll find her again and remind her who he is. She says I love you and stops him saying it back, instead making him promise to wait until they find each other again. Moments later, Strange casts the spell, the tears close, the visitors return home, and the world forgets Peter Parker.
Though one of those visitors left something behind. Eddie Brock, who shares a body with an alien symbiote known as Venom, returns to his world, short one piece of that symbiote, which remains in Peter's. Meanwhile, tragedy strikes Wakanda. King T'Challa falls ill. The heart-shaped herb might save him, but Killmonger burned it all eight years ago when he took power. Shuri tries desperately to synthesize it in her lab, but ultimately, time runs out and Wakanda mourns their loss. Not long after making the world forget Peter Parker, Doctor Strange has a dream of dying while running with a young girl. After waking up, he trades one nightmare for another, watching the love of his life walk the aisle with another man. Christine's wedding is interrupted by a large, strange creature chasing the girl from Strange's dream. He and Wong defeat the monster, then speak with the girl. America Chavez. She is from another reality, and that creature was after her because someone sent it to extract her power, the power to travel the multiverse. Though she can't control it, the power only triggers when she's afraid. She and the Doctor Strange of her world were trying to find the Book of Vishanti, a magical book of pure good, giving a sorcerer whatever they need to defeat their enemy. But their time ran out, and Strange grew desperate. Rather than let the creature take her power, he prepared to kill America, a sacrifice to keep her power out of the wrong hands, and potentially save the multiverse. Before he could, though, the creature killed him, and she escaped to this world. Strange saw all this in his dream, because dreams are just windows into the lives of multiversal counterparts, proven when America shows them her strange's mangled corpse. Deciding their next move, Wong points out the creature had strange markings, runes, meaning witchcraft is involved. So, Strange seeks out Wanda Maximoff for guidance. She's happy to help and suggests Strange bring America to her. The thing is, Strange never told Wanda her name. She drops the charade, showing the ruined lands around her and the Darkhold. Corrupted by its influence, she's the one after America, because with that girl's power, she could travel to another universe, kill that world's Wanda, and get her children back. Because though they were fake in her world, they are real in every other. She knows because she dreams of them every night. She gives Strange until sundown to hand America over. Otherwise, it won't be Wanda who comes for her. It'll be the Scarlet Witch. Strange returns to the Comertage, and at sundown, it's a slaughter. The witch kills many, then corners them, and the fear activates America's power, sending her and Strange on a trip through the multiverse. As they explore a new world, they find a strange technology, which extracts and projects significant memories. For Strange, it's the date where Christine gave him his watch, which was broken in the crash that took his hands. For America, it's the first time she triggered her powers, accidentally sending her moms through a portal to parts unknown. I killed them, America says. No, you did not, Strange assures her. Don't even think that. He promises they survived, and that someday she will see them again. Soon, they learn that this world is not a safe place for Doctor Strange's. They're captured and taken into custody at a facility, where they're overseen by Christine. Here, she's a scientist specializing in multiversal research, and she makes it clear they consider Doctor Strange a threat, and when Strange is taken before the Illuminati, he learns why. The Illuminati is a council composed of this world's most powerful heroes. Mordo, Captain Carter, Black Agar Boltagon, an inhuman whose voice obliterates any who hear it, Captain Maria Rambo, Reed Richards, and Charles Xavier. In their world, when Thanos attacked, Strange turned to the Darkhold for help, visiting other worlds through dreamwalking, or possessing his counterpart in those realities. In doing so, he caused an incursion, where a collision of worlds destroys one or both. With the incursion, Strange inadvertently ended an entire reality, killing everyone there. Eventually, he found the Book of Vishanti, which they used to defeat Thanos. 
Then the Illuminati sentenced Strange to execution, and he accepted his fate. Now they fear him more than anyone, but Xavier believes in second chances and believes they can trust this new Doctor Strange. Meanwhile, in the world Strange and America left behind, the Scarlet Witch uses the Darkhold to track them down, until a sorcerer at the Comertage destroys it, sacrificing herself in the process. Desperate for the spells of the Darkhold, Wanda threatens the lives of more sorcerers, until Wong tells her what he knows. The spells can be found on Mount Wondagore, where they are inscribed on the walls of a temple. The first demon, Thethan, carved his dark magic spells there, and others transcribed them into the book. With no other choice, Wong takes her there, and she uses the spells to dreamwalk, possessing her counterpart in the world of the Illuminati. She finds the facility, and slaughters the heroes one by one. Meanwhile, Strange, Christine, and America reach the Gap Junction, where the Book of Vishanti is located. But the Scarlet Witch reaches them, destroys the book, and controls America, along with her power, to send Strange and Christine to another world, then bring America to hers, where she begins preparations to steal her abilities fully, something which will kill America in the process. Strange and Christine find themselves in a world that was destroyed by incursion. With nowhere to go, they visit the Sanctum and find this world's Doctor Strange, who's been corrupted by the Darkhold and hides a third evil eye on his forehead. Strange manages to defeat his evil self, then borrows the Darkhold. Using it, he can dreamwalk in his original reality to stop Wanda. But doesn't a version of you need to live in that universe? Christine asks. So that you can dreamwalk into them? Who said they have to be living? Strange asks. The corpse of America's Doctor Strange springs to life, and through him, Strange heads toward Mount Wondagore. But especially as a rotting corpse, he is no match for the Scarlet Witch and they're running out of time. Wong begs Strange to kill America. It's their only hope of keeping her power out of Wanda's hands and keeping the multiverse safe. America accepts this fate. She tells Strange it's okay. But Strange can't accept that. Instead, he insists that America can control her power. She's been controlling it this whole time, always bringing them exactly where they needed to go and she realizes he's right. She attacks Wanda with her power, but the witch is still too strong. So instead, America gives her what she wants. She takes the Scarlet Witch to her counterpart's world, where Wanda's children see that she is a monster. As the children beg for their and their mother's lives, Wanda sees what she's become. She sees what the Darkhold has turned her into. She never should have opened that book. So, she closes it by destroying Thethan's tomb. Wong and America escape while Wanda is crushed in the rubble and every copy of the Darkhold in every world is destroyed. Back in the Incursion world, before America sends Strange and Christine back to their home worlds, Strange tells Christine something he never quite figured out how to say to his world's Christine. I love you. I love you in every universe. It's not that I don't want to care for someone or have someone care for me. It's just, I get scared. Back home, Wong and Strange begin training America at the Comertage, and Strange finally fixes Christine's watch. Though, he soon finds himself in need of repair as he's suddenly engulfed by pain, and a third eye appears on his forehead. It seems that wielding the Darkhold always takes its toll. But it doesn't take long for him to regain control, just in time for another adventure. One day, a sorceress named Clea appears to inform Strange he caused an incursion and they need to stop it. She opens a portal, and with his third eye firmly under control, Strange follows her into the dark dimension. Soon, the Christmas season approaches, and finally, Peter Parker has worked up the courage to visit MJ and Ned. With Peter erased from their lives, things seem to be going well. Both have been admitted to their dream school, MIT. Peter had prepared a whole speech to remind her who he is and what they meant to each other, but she has a good life now, 
Maybe, Peter realizes, it's best to leave well enough alone. He saves the speech for another day, but in MJ's eyes, he does notice a faint spark of deja vu. He returns to his new home, a modest apartment, and despite the painful reminder of all he's lost, Peter dons his costume and continues to be the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Meanwhile, another hero tries to leave his costume behind. Six days before Christmas, Clint Barton visits Manhattan with his two sons and daughter. He hopes to make it the best Barton Christmas yet, but his past catches up with him just in time for the holidays. Kate Bishop, the girl inspired by him during the Battle of New York, has spent the last 12 years honing her skills in archery and martial arts. Hoping to follow in his footsteps, she plays the hero. Her mother Eleanor has a new fiancé named Jack. He seems like a good man, too good to be true. So she snoops and finds Jack's uncle Armand seemingly threatening her mother. She follows Armand and he leads her to a black market auction both he and Jack attend. The auction is interrupted by an attack from the tracksuit mafia. Kate moves quickly, grabbing a costume from the items for sale, not realizing it's the Ronin costume, which Clint Barton wore on his bloody conquest during the blip. She fights off the mobsters and escapes. Later that night, she heads to Armin's house to investigate and finds him dead. Meanwhile, her image was captured on TV, and Barton saw it, so he seeks her out. Finding a young girl behind the Ronin mask, he realizes she needs help. When Barton wore that costume a few years ago, he hit the tracksuits hard. If they think Ronan is back, they'll want his blood, and having followed her, they know Kate is somehow connected to the character. So Barton sends his kids home and stays behind to help Kate clean up the mess. What they don't realize is just how personal a vendetta they're up against. Maya Lopez grew up deaf. This made things difficult for her, but the struggle only made her tougher. She spent years training her mind, body, and abilities. So when her father, the head of the tracksuit mafia, was killed by Ronan, she vowed revenge. Clint insists Kate stay hidden while he goes out to investigate. The plan? Get caught so the bad guys bring him to their hideout, where hopefully he can figure out who's in charge. But Kate is not content on the sidelines, so she crashes the party, getting herself caught in the process. Finally, Maya reveals herself, demanding they tell her what they know about the Ronin. Clint tells her that the Ronin is dead. She doesn't believe him. So, time to escape. Barton is impressed by Kate, but he warns her that the life of a hero is not an easy one. He advises against it. She is undeterred. And though Clint plays his cards close to the vest, she does learn some things about him. Like the fact that he's losing his hearing, resulting from years of loud Avengers work. Or that his family is more important to him than anything. When his hearing aid is busted in the fight with Maya, and he can't hear his own boy on the phone, Kate plays translator. So she has a front row seat when Clint promises to be home for Christmas knowing he probably won't. Eventually, it also becomes impossible for Clint to hide from her that he was the Ronin. But she doesn't judge him. He lost his entire family in the blip, and it was the only way he could find to stay sane. Soon, they realize they're in bigger trouble than they thought. That black market auction was for items salvaged from the Avengers compound destroyed by Thanos, including a particular Rolex, that Clint insists they need to retrieve, because it ties back to his family. They find it at an apartment, and his worst fears are confirmed. Kate finds a notebook with the names of Clint's family members. It's no longer just him that's a target. And too late, they realize whose apartment it is. Maya Lopez. She attacks, just as some bigger trouble arrives. A black widow, Yelena Belova. Between Maya and Yelena, Clint and Kate barely manage to escape, and after the close call, he finally puts his foot down. If a Black Widow is involved, Kate is way out of her league and needs to stay out of this. Back home, Kate is approached by that Black Widow. Yelena explains how she got involved. She was hired to kill Clint, but personally, she's happy to do it, because she blames him for her sister's death, Natasha Romanoff. 
Kate doesn't believe any of it because Clint is a good guy and definitely didn't kill his best friend, Natasha. But Elena will not be convinced. Meanwhile, Clint decides to put an end to the whole mess by being the Ronin one more time. He dons the costume, fights his way to Maya, and puts his blade to her throat, but not to kill her, just to show her his face and tell her to stay away from him and his family or he will kill her. He also tells her who was really responsible for her father's death. He may have been the one to kill him, but he was tipped off by Maya's boss. Maya's boss is the one who wanted him dead. Later, Belova reaches out to Kate again. Though they don't see eye to eye on Clint Barton, Belova has a soft spot for the girl and thought she should know something. Belova did a little snooping to find out who hired her to kill Barton. It was Eleanor, Kate's own mother. Kate shows Clint a video that Yelena shared with her, showing her mother meeting with someone, and Clint tells her who it is, Wilson Fisk, the kingpin. Things start to make sense. When Kate's father died, he left a massive debt to Fisk, which Eleanor had to pay off, which she did by working for him. The other day, when Armin seemed to be threatening her, it's because he knew she was connected to the mob and didn't want her marrying his nephew. She killed him for his suspicions. And when she saw Clint sniffing around their business and getting her daughter involved, she called one of her contacts, Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, and she recruited the ex-black widow Yelena to kill him. The other thing the video shows is that by now, Eleanor's debt is paid, and she told the kingpin she's quitting. But she also threatened him, saying she has copies of everything as insurance against him. He did not take kindly to that, which means Kate's mom is in danger. Kate intends on saving her and tells Clint he should go home to be with his family. But he refuses. They're partners. Your mess is my mess, he says. I'm not going anywhere until this is finished. Christmas Eve arrives, and they crash the Bishop Christmas party. The tracksuit mafia targets Eleanor, but Kate protects her mother, while Clint takes on Yelena. Clint tries not to fight the ex-Black Widow, instead trying to explain what happened, how Natasha made her choice, even though he tried to stop her, how she sacrificed her life to save the world. Eventually, his words get through to her. He tells her how Natasha spoke of her often and gives Yelena a modicum of closure. Finally, she stands down. Meanwhile, Kate protecting her mom turns into Kate fighting the kingpin one-on-one. -on -one. And somehow, he seems to have obtained some enhancements, making him stronger than any man should be. But some explosive arrows finally incapacitate him. And later, when he stumbles into a back alley, he runs into a girl he'd always treated like family, save for killing her father, Maya Lopez. But she knows what he did, so she puts a couple of bullets in him as retribution. In the aftermath, Eleanor Bishop is arrested, but Kate Bishop's Christmas isn't entirely ruined. On Christmas Day, Clint brings her home, to spend the day with his family, and he shows his wife Laura that on top of everything else, he managed to track down that Rolex, one that she wore years ago as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Finally, Kate tries to come up with a superhero name for herself, and Clint suggests Hawkeye. The following year, gift shop worker and Egyptian mythology aficionado Stephen Grant has a problem. He shares a body with a mercenary named Mark Spector. Sometimes Stephen will black out and without his knowledge, this other persona takes over. And this other persona happens to be an avatar for Khonshu, the Egyptian god of the moon and the night sky. Serving as the Khonshu's moon knight, Mark seeks out and kills those who commit evil. But some gods aren't as patient. The goddess Amit believed in judging people not just on their past, but their future too. In her eyes, if someone has done no wrong, but she determines they will transgress in the future, that person deserves death and judgment today. For this dangerous approach, Amit was imprisoned by the other gods. But Khonshu's previous avatar, Arthur Harrow, believes in her cause. He and his followers channel her power to judge a person's past and future. Those whose scales are imbalanced die immediately.
However, Harrow is not content to go door to door judging one person at a time. Instead, he seeks Amit's Ushapti, the small figurine in which she is imprisoned, so he can free the goddess and judge the entire world. Stephen Grant has no idea that when he blacks out, Mark Spector is hard at work trying to stop Harrow. Though worlds finally collide when Harrow spots Stephen and uses Amit's power to judge him, but the results are chaotic and inconclusive. Regardless, he demands Stephen hand over the scarab of Amit, an artifact Mark got his hands on which acts as a compass pointing to Amit's Ushapti. But the Mark persona takes over to kill Harrow's men and escape with the scarab. Things get even more awkward for the confused and slightly terrified Stephen when Mark's wife Layla shows up, and she's confused why her husband suddenly has a British accent, seemingly has no idea who she is, and is meek compared to her husband's usual mercenary self. Things slowly start to make sense as Mark communicates with Stephen through reflections. Though it takes time for Stephen to trust his murderous half, and for the moment is intent on keeping the body to himself. But soon, time runs out, because Harrow manages to capture him. Layla tries to rescue him, but Harrow uses Amit's power to summon jackals, monsters out of Egyptian mythology, and sends them after her and Stephen. Layla tells him to summon the suit, something Mark could do, conjuring his Moon Knight armor. Stephen, however, has no idea what that means, but in the heat of battle, reflexes kick in, and he does summon the suit. Though he takes it a bit literally, he ends up looking less like an Egyptian superhero and more like an Egyptian James Bond. It does help and provide protection, but he still isn't a skilled fighter, so he finally gives control to Mark, who defeats the Jackal. Unfortunately, Harrow managed to grab the scarab, meaning he's now on his way to Amit. In the days that follow, Mark desperately interrogates anyone connected to Harrow that he can get his hands on, but no matter who he hurts or kills, they are a zealous bunch, willing to die for the cause instead of giving up any information. So, Khonshu plays a dangerous card. He calls on the other gods for a trial of Harrow. But they don't trust Kanchu. He was previously banished for his continued interaction with the human world, something the other gods leave solely to their avatars. And Kanchu's current avatar is clearly troubled, considering his mind is fractured between two personas. So when Hero denies the claim that he's trying to resurrect Amit, the gods believe him. After the failed trial, another avatar approaches Mark and confides in him. She believes him and tells him how to find Amit's tomb before Harrow. Centuries ago, a man named Senfu recorded its location. His sarcophagus was sold on the black market, but if they can find it, they'll find what he wrote. So they get to work. Layla and Mark fight their way to the sarcophagus, and Stephen decodes what they find a star map which will point to the tomb. Only problem is that stars drift over time, and this map was recorded 2,000 years ago. So Kanshu plays another dangerous card. He reverts the night sky to its position from 2,000 years ago, and it works. The map lines up and they pinpoint the tomb's location. But manipulating the skies is a transgression, which gets Khonshu locked in his own Ushapti. By the time they reach the tomb, so have Harrow and his followers. And when Harrow comes face to face with Layla, he reveals something he learned when testing Mark for judgment. Mark had something to do with her father's death, and Mark finally admits the truth. Ten years ago, he and some mercenaries were on a mission with archaeologists in Egypt. But his leader, Raoul Bushman, got greedy. He killed everyone, including Layla's father, to keep the treasures for himself. He shot Mark too, and as he was bleeding to death, he prepared to take his own life, until Kanchu offered to make him his avatar. After that, he and Layla only met because Mark found her to tell her what happened to her father. But instead, he fell in love and never got to that part. Soon, it's all moot, because Harrow finally manages to best Mark shooting him in the chest twice and killing him. He and Stephen wake up in the realm of Duat, the Egyptian underworld, where the goddess Tawaret informs them that to balance their scale and pass on to the field of reeds, 
a heaven-like afterlife, they must reconcile with their past. Traversing the memories, Stephen finally learns who he really is. He sees Mark as a child, playing with his brother in a cave. But the rain comes, and his brother drowns. He sees that Mark's mother blamed him for it, and she never stopped blaming him. She would beat Mark and scream at him. Finally, to escape the nightmare, Mark's mind created an alternate personality based on his favorite character from the movie Tomb Buster, a British character named Stephen Grant. Years passed, and once Mark left home, he no longer needed an alternate personality to shield him from reality. But once his mother died, the pain returned, and so did Stephen. Meanwhile, Tawaret communicates with Layla, telling her to free Kanchu and in doing so, resurrect Mark and Steven. She manages to do exactly that. But before Mark becomes Kanchu's avatar again and returns to life, he negotiates, only agreeing on the condition that Kanchu will free him and Steven once they're done. He doesn't want to be a killer anymore. Kanchu agrees, and he lives again just as Harrow finally frees Amit. For the battle ahead, Layla allows herself to temporarily become Tawaret's avatar, joining Moon Knight in the fight against Harrow. Amit begins extracting souls who fail her judgment, and with each, the goddess grows stronger. But they manage to cast a spell, trapping Amit in Harrow's body. Now they can kill him, and the goddess will die too. But Mark refuses. He is done killing. Instead, Harrow ends up in an institution. The thing is, Mark has no idea just how fractured his mind has become. Kanshu may have freed him and Steven, but he hasn't freed their other persona, Jake Lockley. And Jake has no qualms about killing. In LA, lawyer Jennifer Walters harbors a secret. She is a hook. A few months ago, she was on a road trip with her cousin, Bruce Banner, who had recently developed an inhibitor allowing him to be human. Suddenly, a Sakarian courier craft appeared for Hulk, causing them to crash. Both were hurt, and some of Bruce's blood dripped into her wound, turning her into a Hulk. But unlike Banner, she can choose when to transform, and even in Hulk form, stays in control. Aside from Bruce, only Jennifer's close friend and paralegal, Nikki, knows her secret. But all that changes when superpowered influencer Titania attacks a courtroom, forcing Jennifer to quickly transform to protect the bystanders. The day is saved, and Jennifer is outed as a Hulk. Thanks to an offhand remark by a journalist reporting on the incident, she becomes known as She Hulk. Unfortunately, her law firm now sees her as a liability, and she's fired. Applying at other firms, she finds they all feel the same way. She's a sideshow and a distraction. But one firm, GLK and H, offers her a job, heading up their superhuman law division. Their only stipulation is that she remain in Hulk form when she's on the job. Jennifer reluctantly accepts, though it begins a trend of the world preferring She-Hulk to just Jen. One of her jobs involves defending Emil Blonsky, or the Abomination. She hesitates until she hears his story. When he pursued the Hulk 15 years ago, he thought he was doing the right thing on orders of the US government. They gave him the super soldier serum, which turned him mad and ultimately into the Abomination. It wasn't his fault. He shows remorse, and he's since gained control of his Abomination form. The only wrinkle in the case is that he was caught escaping from prison a few months ago to fight in an underground club, run by Shang-Chi's sister. But Wong comes forth as a witness to admit he broke him out against Blonsky's wishes because he needed a formidable opponent. And ultimately, Blonsky did choose to come back to prison. With his testimony, Blonsky wins parole. Besides her new job, Jennifer's been facing another challenge dating in her 30s. On Nikki's recommendation, she makes a dating profile under the She-Hulk persona. She gets plenty of matches, but also finds most of the guys more interested in the green monster than Jennifer Walters. One date in particular is soured when Todd Phelps refers to her as a specimen. 
Though, when an old high school friend invites Jen to her wedding, she decides to embrace and even flaunt her She-Hulk form, something especially possible thanks to some legwork by Nikki, who found Luke Jacobson, a costume designer for superheroes, whose tailor made her a wardrobe suiting both Jen and She-Hulk. At the wedding, Jen has another run-in with Titania, forcing her to Hulk smash the villain, and she meets Josh. The two quickly hit it off, especially when he seems more interested in her than She-Hulk. A few dates later, they indulge in a different sort of Hulk smashing. Sorry for that awful pun, but I couldn't help myself. And also sorry for breaking from my narrator character, but hey, if Jen can break the fourth wall, so can I. Anyway, the next morning, Josh is gone. He doesn't respond to her text, so she waits the next day, and the day after that. But soon, it's clear. She's been ghosted. And she finds emotional support in the most unexpected of places. Sunday morning, she gets a call from Blonsky's parole officer. Apparently, his inhibitor was off, meaning it's possible he illegally took abomination form. She accompanies the officer to Blonsky's new home, a large meditation retreat he's opened. And they find it was just a malfunction, He's still human and still reformed. But Jen can't leave quite yet because Man Bull, working out some of his aggression, accidentally destroys her car and the tow truck won't arrive for a few hours. So she reluctantly joins a therapy session and surrounded by villain wannabes attempting to reform, she actually finds some catharsis because they make it clear they appreciate Jennifer Walters for Jennifer Walters, She-Hulk aside. Meanwhile, trouble brews. Nikki and close friend Pug discover Intelligentsia, a website filled with haters saying awful things about She-Hulk and even threatening her, all under the guidance of a leader who calls himself Hulk King. In the days that follow, Walters is assigned to represent Leapfrog, since he's the son of an important client. His superhero suit malfunctioned, leading to third-degree burns, and he'd like to sue the tailor, Luke Jacobson. Jennifer does her best to be gentle, but Luke immediately turns on her, and with that, she's lost her source of fashionable and useful clothing. And she loses the case, too, because Luke is represented by one of his clients, Matt Murdock, for whom he's recently designed a new yellow suit. Matt makes a strong case and smells the jet fuel on Leapfrog, something Luke instructed the wannabe hero not to use. Thus, it's proven that Leapfrog's burns are his own fault. Murdoch wins the case. Afterward, he and Jennifer hit it off at a bar, and later, when Leapfrog calls for help and She-Hulk comes to the rescue, she finds him pursued by Matt Murdoch's superhero alter ego, Daredevil. But Matt quickly clarifies that Leapfrog is the bad guy here. He kidnapped Luke so he'd make him a new suit under duress. So She-Hulk has her first superhero team up. Working with Daredevil, they take Leapfrog down, and for rescuing him, she's welcomed back into Luke's good graces. And with the adrenaline wearing off, Jen and Matt get to know each other. He's heading back to New York tomorrow, but offers that next time he's in town, Maybe he could buy her dinner. She has a counter-proposal. Skip all that, and he comes back to her place tonight. When Nikki finds a devil walking home barefoot the next morning, it tells her everything she needs to know. That night, Jen accepts an award at a gala for female lawyers. But her acceptance speech is interrupted by the intelligentsia. Apparently, Josh is one of them, and used his night with Jennifer to hack her phone. Now, all the private information they found on her phone is projected in front of the crowd, and he secretly filmed their intimate night together. They play that too, and they try to publicly shame her for it. Jennifer doesn't take it well. She hulks out and strikes back, then wakes up in a cell. They were wrong for their attempted humiliation, but nevertheless, the authorities are now concerned that she can't control her Hulk form. They release her without charges, but only on the condition she now wears an inhibitor, prohibiting her from ever being She-Hulk again. Feeling lost, she heads back to Blonsky's retreat, 
while Nikki and Pug infiltrate an intelligentsia event, which happens to be occurring at that very retreat. Apparently, Blonsky has been giving them talks as abomination, and Todd Phelps, Walter's bad date who called her a specimen, reveals himself as the Hulk King, and he reveals they managed to steal some of her blood and synthesize it into a serum, which turns him into a Hulk. Also, Titania is there, and also, Hulk has just returned from whatever business he had on Sakaar. Honestly, it's all a bit much to cram into the climax. So, Jennifer exits her show to have a word with the guy in charge of the MCU, Kevin. But she finds Kevin is not a man, it's an AI, the Knowledge Enhanced Visual Interconnectivity Nexus. She makes some suggestions for the show's ending. Lose the stupid plot about Todd making a Hulk serum, have Emil Blonsky take responsibility for his actions, and nix Hulk's last minute entrance. Also, bring back Murdoch. Back in the show, Walters enjoys a more emotionally cathartic ending. She's learned to live as both Jen and She-Hulk. Plus, she gets to spend a week hanging out with Matt Murdock. Though, despite the rewrites, Hulk does make a surprise entrance at their family dinner to introduce a son he apparently had on Sakaar, a son named Scar. In the following days, she's cleared of all charges and allowed to be She-Hulk again. Also, once again, Wong breaks Blonsky out of jail. In New Jersey, Kamala Khan goes through another awkward day of high school. But at least her close friends Bruno and Naki are there to keep her company. And AvengerCon is coming up, where Kamala plans on debuting a cosplay of her favorite hero, Captain Marvel. Bruno helps pull it together. All that's left is a personal touch. He suggests something Pakistani to bring a little of her to the costume. Back home, she searches through a box of things sent by her grandmother, Sana, and in it finds the perfect thing, a bangle. At the convention, something strange happens. The bangle activates magic powers, allowing Kamala to project light, which takes solid form and weight. She's the highlight of the night, but remains anonymous behind her mask and keeps her identity secret. Nonetheless, the discovery of superpowers is a major boost to her confidence. And so is Kamran, the new kid. Kamala likes him, and it quickly becomes clear her interest is mutual. But she soon learns that Bangle, her powers, and Kamran are all connected. His mother Najma is from the Noor dimension, but was exiled along with Kamala's great-grandmother Aisha and a few others. Collectively, they're known as the clandestines. Outside her home dimension, Najma's access to the power of Noor is limited. It's enough to slow her aging process, but not enough to actually return home. However, Kamala inherited the same power from her great-grandmother, and because she was actually born in this dimension, her powers are likely stronger, strong enough to take them home. There's just one problem. Bruno does Kamala a favor and looks into some research from Dr. Eric Selvig on the Nord dimension. What he learns is disturbing. If they were to open a rift, the Nord dimension may overtake their own and destroy it. It's too dangerous. Kamala cannot open a portal for them. But soon, Najma makes it clear she is not asking a favor. She is demanding one. When Kamala refuses to comply, she and the clandestines attack during her brother's wedding. Kamran is disgusted by his mother's actions and sides with Kamala. Ultimately, using her powers to fight them off and protect her family, Kamala escapes. In the midst of it all, she has a vision of a train, the same train her grandmother Sana took during the partition. Meanwhile, Najma and the other clandestines are arrested by the Department of Damage Control. Despite betraying his mother and disagreeing with the violence, Kamran is also arrested. Afterward, Kamala speaks with her grandmother, and Sana reveals she had the same vision of that train. So she invites Kamala to Pakistan, where they can finally discuss her family history. In the following days, she and her mother fly over. There, Kamala speaks with Sana, who tells a story Kamala has heard many times before. How, during the partition, Sana became separated from her father. 
until a trail of stars led her back to him. Then, Kamala meets some of her cousins and runs into the Red Dagger. The Red Dagger is a title that's been passed down over the generations. At one point, a man named Walid held it, and now his son, Kareem, does. Their job is to protect people from threats unseen, like the clandestines. Right now, their hope is to stop them from opening the veil between worlds and potentially destroying this one. Soon, that threat arrives. The clandestines escape DODC custody, though for his betrayal, Najma leaves her son Kamran behind. They reach Pakistan and attack. Walid is killed, and when Kamala's bangle is struck, she is transported back in time to 1947, where Aisha hands her a picture of her family and begs her to help Sana. So, Kamala creates a trail of stars, leading the girl back to her father, finally learning that in that story she's heard so many times before, it was Kamala herself who created those magic stars. Returning to the present, she sees the burst of energy from the bangle didn't just send her back in time, it also opened a rift to the Nora dimension, and it proves just as dangerous as they feared, killing one of Najma's friends. Despite the risk, Najma prepares to enter it herself, until Kamala calls to her. Even if she successfully crosses over to the Nord dimension, she'll leave this one to be destroyed, killing her son Kamran along with it. She already ruined one family by killing Aisha. Kamala begs her not to destroy her own. You're right, Najma replies, and she enters the portal, but not to return home. Instead, she sacrifices herself to close the rift from within. As the rift closes, power seems to surge from it into Kamran, giving him powers similar to Kamala's. Just then, Kamala's mother and grandmother find her, having tracked her phone's location, and they arrive just in time to witness the portal closing. At the sight of the magical display, Kamala is finally forced to admit to her mother that she has these powers, and she gives Sana the photo of her with Aisha and Hassan. Returning home, Kamala's mother accepts the path her daughter is on, even making her a new costume for her yet-to-be-named superhero persona. And it's good timing, because right now, Kamran could use a superhero. Having escaped the DODC, he's now on the run, with Nakia and Bruno's help. But it's only a matter of time before they're captured. So, Kamala dons her costume and joins them. She also calls the Red Dagger to ask a favor. She knows they work in the shadows, and asks if they have a way to get Kamran out of the country. They're soon surrounded by DODC, and tensions rise when Kamran manifests Nor powers as well, powers which he wields with a vengeance after learning his mother is dead. But when he loses control, Kamala uses her powers to contain his, while protecting them from the DODC. She buys enough time for him to escape to the harbor where someone from the Red Daggers will smuggle him to Pakistan. Once he's gone and Kamala is left alone, her family, friends, and other bystanders surround her, creating a barricade to stop the DODC, who have clearly mistaken a hero for a villain. In the aftermath, the agent in charge, Deaver, is fired for her public blunder, while Kamala, currently known as the hero Nightlight to the public, trends on TikTok. Enjoying the accolades, she joins her father on the roof for a heart-to-heart. -heart. He tells her how proud he is, and asks what her superhero name is going to be. She isn't sure yet, so he tells her about the name Kamala, how it translates to the word wonder, or Marvel. Kamala can't believe it. She shares a name with Carol Danvers, her favorite hero of all time? I don't know who that is, her father replies. But you sure are, and always have been, our little Miss Marvel. A week later, Bruno shares with Kamala something he learned about her when researching Noor and her powers. Looking at Kamala's DNA, in addition to her Noor genes, there was something else too, something the others in her family don't have, some kind of mutation. They don't know it yet, but this is the same mutation which, in other worlds, has led to the X-Men. 
When Kamala returns home, something strange happens. She's magically pulled into her closet. Then, out of her closet, steps Carol Danvers. Somehow, the two of them have switched places. Elsewhere, Thor continues his travels with the Guardians of the Galaxy, chasing one adventure after another. Though, it's clear he's overstayed his welcome, and when they hear word of Gore the God Butcher, Quill is happy to part ways as Thor leaves to investigate. And while Thor seeks adventure, Jane Foster reaches the end of her own. She was recently diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, and her time is quickly running out. When she reaches the limits of human medicine, she turns to Asgardian magic. In New Asgard, she finds the pieces of Mjolnir, and the broken hammer remembers a promise it made years ago to always protect her. Now, it keeps that promise by lending its power and turning her into the mighty Thor. Soon, Gore continues his quest to kill all gods by visiting New Asgard. Thor arrives to defend the kingdom, but so does Jane Foster, which makes for an awkward reunion. The two set their feelings aside long enough to fight the battle, and though they survive, Gore escapes with a cage of Asgardian children. Among them is Heimdall's son, Axel, who shares his father's gift for long-distance sight and communication. Thor reaches out to the boy and locates them in the Shadow Realm, a dangerous place. So before they head after the children, Thor, Jane, Valkyrie, and Korg seek reinforcements. They head to Omnipotent City, where the likes of Hercules and Zeus reside. But there, all they find are cowardly gods, who would rather hide in their palaces than fight a god killer. The city is a dead end, though Zeus does reveal Gore's next move. He will try to reach Eternity, a powerful being at the center of the universe, who will grant the desire of the first person who reaches him. With no help to be found in the decadent city, Thor and company instead steal Zeus's thunderbolt, then head for the Shadow Realm themselves. On the way, Thor and Jane take in the sight of galaxies, stars, and space dolphins, then finally address their feelings. Both admit they closed their hearts to avoid the pain of loss, but in truth, they want to be together. Except Jane has cancer, something she finally admits to Thor. It's a heartbreaking revelation, but does not change Thor's desire to be with her for whatever time life affords them. They reach the Shadow Realm, and in the ensuing fight, learn that Gore can't reach eternity without the key, which is the Bifrost, something accessible through Stormbreaker. It must be kept out of his hands, but he and his army of shadow monsters are formidable. Valkyrie is hurt, and so is Jane. They rush home, and in that rush, Gore manages to grab the axe. Now, he has access to the Bifrost and the key. In the hospital, Valkyrie is taken into treatment, and Jane learns that her body is failing to fight the cancer. Every time she uses Mjolnir, it saps her mortal energy and leaves her vulnerable to the disease. So Thor makes her promise not to wield it again. He will save the children himself. He finds Gore at the center of the universe and lends the children some of his power so they can fight with him. But still, he finds himself in need of an ally, and at that moment, Mighty Thor appears. He's happy to see her, but also knows it'll likely be the last time. With Mjolnir sapping her energy, she'll soon have none left. But with the little that remains, she fights, and together, they destroy the Necrosword. Without it, Gore will die. But first, he steps through the portal and finds Eternity. He prepares to make his wish as Thor rushes to Jane's side. Gore watches the God of Thunder choose love and Thor reminds him that he can do the same. You can bring her back, he says. She would have no one, Gore says. She would be alone. And with her dying words, Jane convinces him otherwise. She won't be alone. Knowing Thor will care for his daughter, Gore makes his wish, and just before dying himself, sees his daughter return to life. Thor, after losing every loved one he's ever known, now, for the first time, gains one. He raises Gore's daughter as his own, and even fights alongside her in battle. She wields Stormbreaker and he Mjolnir as they travel the galaxies, providing aid wherever it's needed. They're known by many names, but to those who know them best, they are simply known as Love and Thunder.
Meanwhile, in Omnipotent City, Zeus recovers from his wounds and sends his son Hercules to get revenge on Thor. And elsewhere, Jane Foster learns it's true what they say. When an Asgardian dies in battle, they are welcomed into the gates of Valhalla. She appears in the Land of Gods, and Heimdall is there to welcome her. Meanwhile, as Wakanda's King T'Challa himself rests in the ancestral plain, his mother, Queen Ramonda, is left to rule in his place. In the years since his passing, the world's taken advantage of Wakanda's perceived vulnerability and pressed them to share their vibranium. Ramonda refuses. So they try to take it by force, and the Dora Milaje stop them. Growing desperate, people search the earth for more. Maybe Wakanda isn't the only place where vibranium landed. The CIA somehow get their hands on a vibranium detecting tool, and they do find vibranium under the ocean. The only problem? It belongs to Talacan, and Namor does not want his people discovered. They kill the entire search party. The US government blames Wakanda for the attack. After all, who else would so vehemently protect Vibranium? Meanwhile, Namor pays Wakanda a visit personally, traveling underwater to bypass their security. He blames them for jeopardizing Talacan. The only reason they were almost found is because the world so desperately searches for Vibranium. And the reason they search is because Wakanda showed the world the wonders of Vibranium. He gives them a choice. Find and deliver him the scientist who created the vibranium detector, or face the wrath of his people. Okoye heads to America to find the scientist, and against Ramonda's wishes, Shuri joins her. There, they find their old friend, Everett Ross. The CIA agent owes them a favor after Shuri saved his life, so he reveals to them the identity of the vibranium detector's creator, Riri Williams a 19-year-old prodigy at MIT. They find the girl, but before they can leave for Wakanda, authorities catch wind that the Wakandans are in town. Still blaming them for the attack on their search party, they dispatch the FBI. Williams reveals that in addition to the vibranium detector she built as a school project, she also built herself a homemade Iron Man-style armor. Using it, she works with Shuri and Okoye to evade the authorities. But soon, that's the least of their problems, because they come face to face with Namor's people. And even for the leader of the Dora Milaje, they are formidable. Despite Okoye's efforts, Riri and Shuri are both taken, and Okoye returns to Wakanda empty-handed. And for losing her daughter, Ramonda strips Okoye of her title. Instead, she seeks out ex-war dog Nakia, who's been living in Haiti. With her experience in the outside world, Ramonda figures Nakia's better suited for the job of rescuing her daughter. Meanwhile, Shuri is brought to the underwater city of Talacan, where she starts to see their people as people, not just her enemy. Namor tells his story of his mother eating the plant which grew from underwater vibranium, and how he was born a mutant. He tries to make her understand why Riri needs to die. The world needs to see that searching for vibranium is dangerous, so he can keep his people safe. But that is just the beginning. Namor now sees that defense will only take you so far. With the power of vibranium, he will soon go on offense, to show the world his true might, and then rule it. When he conquers the world, he'd like Wakanda at his side, but if they get in his way, they'll fall like the rest. Soon, Nakia arrives to free Shuri and Riri, killing some of Namor's people in the process, which Shuri knows is as good as declaring war, and it doesn't take long for that war to come. Namor leads a fraction of his forces into Wakanda, but it's enough to kill many, including Queen Ramonda. Shuri and Wakanda mourn another loss. M'Baka sees the rage in their new queen, Shuri, and recommends against killing Namor. His people see him not just as a king, but a god. His death would invite generations of war between their peoples. But ultimately, it's her call. She and Riri get to work 
preparing for the battle ahead, and Shuri has a realization. Namor gave her a bracelet, whose fibers grew from vibranium-rich soil, the same sort of soil heart-shaped herb grew from. Using data from those fibers, she reworks the formula and finally synthesizes the heart-shaped herb. Using it, she is granted the powers of the Black Panther, and she visits the ancestral plane. But instead of her family, she sees Killmonger. It's a surprise to Shuri, but with her current thirst for revenge on Namor, Killmonger is a kindred spirit. Revenge is something that defined much of his life. Returning to the mortal plane, Shuri accepts the mantle of Black Panther. In preparation for the battle ahead, she upgrades Riri's Ironheart armor and provides the Dora Milaje, including Okoye, with new suits she calls the Midnight Angels. In working with Riri, she develops a secret weapon against Namor, a way to heat his body and deprive it of oxygen. In the final battle, their plan works. Shuri manages to best Namor in combat, but before striking him down, she remembers T'Challa, and she decides to follow in his footsteps rather than Killmonger's. She spares Namor's life, and seeing her mercy, he is finally willing to listen. She proposes a truce. Riri lives, and Talakan stands down, but Wakanda will work to protect them and keep them hidden. Namor agrees, and the armies finally stand down. After the battle, Shuri visits Nakia in Haiti. There, she discovers that Nakia and T'Challa had a child in secret, a son they named T'Challa. Meanwhile, Everett Ross is in trouble for helping the Wakandans outside the government's peer view. His ex-wife, Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, has him arrested, but it's only a short time before Okoye breaks him out. Elsewhere, the patriarch of the Bloodstone family dies meaning the family weapon, the bloodstone itself, must be passed on to a new owner. Per Ulysses' wishes, monster hunters from around the world are gathered. The bloodstone is affixed to a monster, weakening it but also making it angry. The monster is let loose in a maze, and so are the hunters. Whoever kills it gets the stone, but the hunters don't realize there is a monster among them. Jack, a werewolf currently in human form. Also among the hunters is Elsa, Ulysses' estranged daughter, though she gets no special treatment from her stepmother Verusa, who organizes the hunt. Elsa left the family long ago, and Verusa never forgave her for it. During the hunt, Elsa and Jack make a deal. If she helps Jack free the monster, who happens to be his friend, he will give her the stone. They succeed, and Jack's friend Ted, also known as Man-Thing, escapes. But when Jack tries to grab the stone, it rejects him, revealing to the hunters that he himself is a monster, which is convenient because with Man-Thing gone, they need a new monster to hunt. Although the next full moon is five days away, using the Bloodstone, they can turn Jack into a werewolf tonight. He warns them it's too dangerous, and offers they can hunt him in human form, anything to ensure he doesn't hurt anyone, especially Elsa. Before turning, he quickly takes in her scent, hoping it'll ensure his monster form recognizes her, and when he turns, it works. The werewolf slaughters everyone around him, but stops when it smells her. Then, the wolf escapes. But Verusa now has Elsa cornered. She prepares to kill her stepdaughter, but Manthing returns and kills Verusa first. By morning, Elsa has the bloodstone, and Jack returns to human form, safely reunited with his friend. Soon, Christmas time approaches, and the Guardians of the Galaxy are busy. They recently purchased Nowhere from the Collector and are hard at work making it livable. Most on Nowhere have never heard of the holiday, but Mantis knows it's important to Peter, and she heard from Kraglin what happened the last time Peter tried to celebrate. Yandu destroyed the tree and scoffed at the idea of handouts. She also knows that Peter is still grieving for Gamora, so she decides to give him a great Christmas and something to smile about. Why does she feel it's her responsibility? Because he's her brother, something she's kept from him 
because she doesn't want him to think about his father, who killed his mother, every time he looks at her. She teams up with Drax, and he has the perfect idea for a gift that'll make Peter's Christmas. Kevin Bacon. As a child of the 80s, Peter's always loved the actor, for Footloose especially. From the passionate way Peter's spoken of him over the years, Mantis and Drax assume he's some kind of world leader. But after they abduct him and learn he's an actor, they're both disgusted. Peter was just a kid when he left Earth. His memory is probably all screwed up, Mantis surmises. So she trances Kevin to be a heroic version of himself. Back on Nowhere, they surprise Peter with a grand Christmas display and Kevin Bacon. Peter is excited, then shocked at their human trafficking and tells them to free the actor from Mantis' trance. Kevin of course freaks out, but once he calms down and they prepare to take him home, he learns just how much he's meant to Peter over the years. So he decides he can stay a little longer to give Peter a Christmas to remember, performing a rendition of Here It Is Christmas Time, while everyone exchanges gifts. Peter gives Groot a Game Boy, and Nebula gives Rocket Bucky's arm. Peter asks Mantis why they went to such trouble for him. She explains how they heard about Yondu ruining Christmas. But Peter reveals the rest of the story, how Yondu found their gifts in the trash, including one for him, a small creature figurine, the sort he will go on to spend years collecting. And with Yondu's heart warmed, he gave Peter a gift too, his first quad blasters. Finally, Mantis gives Peter the greatest gift he could ever get. She reveals that she's his sister. And suddenly, Peter realizes he still has some family left. Well, there you go. That's the entire MCU in chronological order, at least including the movies and the Disney Plus shows. Except for What If, because there's no evidence yet that that's going to matter canonically, you know, to the main Avengers series. And that's the same reason I didn't include Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or some of the other shows, because those were created before Kevin Feige kind of took over everything, including the TV wing, and bringing all of it into a tight uh, canon. So that's why I chose to cover this material for now. But with that, if you enjoyed this, please make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more. There's definitely more MCU content on the way, and I like explaining timelines. So more timeline stuff on the way, um, other than the MCU. So stay tuned. With that, thank you for watching, and see you on the next One Take.